General Motors and their dealer organization throughout Southern Africa proudly bring you the drama, the danger, the thrills, and the facts when the long arm of the law travels in squad cars. The story you're about to hear is true. Details are supplied from the official case files by the South African police. Only names and places have been changed to protect innocent people involved. Johannesburg, December the 3rd, 7.15 a.m. On the platform of the old park station, where the new station now stands, Warrant Officer Johann von Dierwitter and Sergeant Oliver Franklin are waiting for the arrival of the Durban train. It seems it's late. Much? Ticket collector says two or three minutes. What does this Belo character look like? On the small side? Black wavy hair, olive complexion. Good looking. Bit of a ladies man, isn't he? <laughs> a bit. <laughs> it's funny how they go for characters like that, eh? Yes. Must be the Latin temperament. He was in a beachfront flat when they caught him, wasn't he? That's right. With a woman, as usual. Now he's downfall. Anybody foolish enough to embark on a career of crime should rule out getting involved with women. They get in the way. Was it a woman with the record? I don't know. I don't know anything about that. She can't be up to much if she associates with the likes of Bilo. I mean, he may be good-looking and young, but he's still a dangerous thug. I saw what he did to the manager of that bank they robbed in Isanda. Yeah, beat him up badly, didn't he? Yes, and for no reason. It wasn't as if the man was offering any resistance. Nah, Bilo's a hoodlum. The reef will be a happier place once he's under lock and key. Lieutenant Gardner must be glad it's all over. Bilo certainly caused him some headaches. Any risk involved in traveling handcuffed to a man like Bilo? Oh, don't worry. Lieutenant can handle Bilo any day of the week. The news of Bilo's capture must have put the wind up his two accomplices. That's for sure. Tell me, will Bilo talk? Oh, I shouldn't think so. For him to squeal will be out of character. Hey, uh, isn't that a train coming now? Yeah, that must be it. Well, once we've got Bilo and the lieutenant in the car, uh, where are we going to take them? Divisional headquarters. The brigadier wants to talk to Bilo himself. They've got a compartment to themselves next to the dining car. I wonder what they talked about during the journey. You could bet it wasn't banks and bank robbers. I shouldn't think Bilo could talk about anything else but girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant will be tired out. Why? You don't sleep with a man like Bilo chained to your wrist. Yeah, that's true. Even though there's a constable on relief. There they are. Come on. Morning, sir. Morning. This is Sergeant Franklin, sir. Morning, sir. Sergeant. How's the prisoner? Very tired. The lieutenant to keep me talking all night. <laughs> Never mind, Bilo. We're going to give you a nice, cozy little cell. You can sleep as much as you like, then. Did you have a good trip, sir? Well, as you can see, very rewarding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we've got a car up the road, sir. Good. Did you manage to get something to eat? Oh, only a bite or two. You need two hands for bacon and eggs. <laughs> this way, sir. 7.27 a.m. Lieutenant Gardiner and his prisoner, flanked by Warrant Officer von Dierfenter and Sergeant Franklin, emerge into the bright summer sunlight at street level. Car's over here, sir. Ah, good. What the devil is that? Like a Delta! The guy has got a gun. Delta? Get Take down! Don't shoot! It's me, Mr. Ah! 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 Mr. What's going on there? Keep your head up, take cover. He may shoot him. Anybody hit? Only Bilo, sir. That was Victor Peralta in that car. I'd know him anywhere. Look, I can't move Bilo like this. 
You take the sergeant and get after Peralta. Yes, sir. You'd better send a car and an ambulance for us. Right, sir. I'll do that right away, sir. For goodness sake, be careful. Peralta's as dangerous as Velo was. He'd shoot you as soon as look at you. Did you get the car number? Yes, sir, I did. Come on, sergeant. 7.32 a.m. The two police officers sprint to their patrol car. The sergeant guns the engine into life, and the warrant officer takes the microphone off the radio. Number 23. Number 23. Number 23 to control. Come in. Over. Control to car 23. Come in. Over. This is warrant officer von Dierwinter. Sergeant Franklin and I met Lieutenant Gardner and his prisoner at Park Station. We were just coming out when a car pulled up. A red fleet wing. TJ5670. Last year's model. And we were fired upon. We didn't even get a chance to return the fire. We were out in the open. We had to lie on the ground. The prisoner's been badly wounded. Will you send an ambulance and a car to take care of them? Over. Message received and understood. Over. In the meantime, we are giving chase. The car has pulled out of the station into Wondra Street. At the moment, it looks as though they are heading north, towards Hospital Hill. These men are armed and dangerous. Over. Car number five. Control to car number five. Come in. Over. Number five to control. I'm receiving you. Over. State your position. Over. Just passing the old cemetery in Smith Street. Over. Converge on the Hospital Hill area and be on the lookout for a red fleet wing. DJ 5670. Its occupants are to be stopped and detained. They are armed and dangerous. Over. You're on the way, Control. Over and out. Control to car number 12. Come in. Over. Car 12 receiving you. Over. State your position, number 12. Over. We're patrolling to Lotus Street in Sydney. Over. Get into Louis Porter Avenue. Make for town. Be on the lookout for a red fleet wing. DJ 5670. Its occupants are to be detained in connection with the shooting outside Park Station. Now be careful. These men are armed. Over. Received and understood. Over and out. Can you see him, Sergeant? Not at the moment. He's gone round there up Hospital Street. Uh, just hope and pray that he keeps going north. Why? Because we've got no traffic against us. Ah, oh, I see, I see. All the rush hour stuff. That's it. He'll have a clear run out along Louis Botha. Well, let's hope he doesn't turn off and then number 12 can intercept him. There he is. Blast it. Lights checked. All clear this side. I'm going through. This is an emergency. Lost him again. He's over the brow of the hill. Don't worry. I'm onto him. I've never seen anything so brazen in all my life. As good as you please in broad daylight. Do you think they were after Bilo or the lieutenant? Probably both. But why? Peralta must be scared that Bilo will talk. Tell us where we can find him. He shoots Bilo and the officer in charge of the case, thinking that will make things easier for himself. But how did he know that Bilo was being brought to Joba? We've probably got the woman Bilo was with in Durban to thank for that. Ah, what a crew. Now what? Left, right or straight on? Take a chance, straight on. We'll see when we get round the corner. Right, there they are. They must be making for Oxford Road. Hang on a second. Number 23. Number 23. Number 23 to control. Come in. Over. Control to 23. Receiving you. Over. That red fleet wing has gone into Queen's Road, Parktown. It seems likely he's heading for Oxford Road. Over. Control to car number 5. Did you receive that number 5? Over. Received it. Packed in accordingly. Over. Control to car 12. Did you receive that too? Over. We're on our way, Control. Over and out. He's turned left at the bottom there. He's going like the devil. You're not doing so badly yourself. Hold tight. Turn right at the bottom, right again, and you're in Oxford Road. So is Peralta, I hope. Oh. And another one. Nice driving. Now you've got a clear run down Oxford Road. Step on it. I'm hoping he'll go racing out into the country. It'll make things easier for us. I don't fancy any shooting among all that traffic headed for town. I'm gaining on him. Good. Car 12 to control. Over. Go ahead, car 12. Receiving you. Over. Where's the red fleet wing? Over. If you cut down Glenhove Road through to Oxford Road, you've got a good chance of getting onto him. Just be careful in the traffic. I want to get him out of town. 
There's less likelihood of anybody getting hurt that way. Over. Right, sir. Received and understood. Over and out. He's driving well. You've got to hand it to him. He'll wish he was jet propelled by the time we're through with him. Car 23 to control. Come in. Over. Control to 23. Receiving you. Over. Tell car 12 to forget about intercepting Peralta. I think it's better if he continues right out at speed. And once he's out of town, just past Barris Brothers in Alovo, he's to set up a roadblock. Over. Car 12 to control. I received the message from car 23. We're on our way. Over and out. Now all we need is for Peralto to keep going straight ahead. I think it's very wise of you to arrange the roadblock out of town, sir. There's too much traffic about it this time of day. There's a chance that innocent people would get hurt. Can't you get this thing to go any faster? I'm maintaining the distance between Peralta and us. He's not getting away. If I didn't think he's getting on us, there's less likely we'll be turning off somewhere. Good thinking. Right. Just let him pull away from you. Just a bit. Just enough to make him feel cocky. 7.51 a.m. The driver of car 12 and his crew arrive at the junction of Fricker and Rudd Roads. The car is set across the road so as to obstruct the way of any vehicle coming from the direction of Oxford Road. They stand and wait behind the car, their revolvers drawn tense. They won't be able to go round us to the right because of the traffic going towards town. What about the grass verge? He'll never make it between the wall and that tree. You'll have to stop. You stay here. I'm going out into the road. As soon as I see him, I flag him down. Indicate that he must stop. For Pete's sake, be careful, man. Here then you don't. Don't worry, I'll watch it. If he does, there'll be time to get out of the way. And that's when you start shooting. Right. He's got four alternatives. He'll either stop, swerve to the right and risk a collision with a car coming the other way, take a chance on the grass verge, or ram the car. It depends how desperate it is. Here he comes. Right. I'm going out to meet him. Just be careful. Just remember what I told you. Stop! Stop! Police! He's coming straight through! Get out of the way! Shoot! Northern Suburbs, 7.53 a.m. The red fleet wing roars into view. The driver of car number 12 goes down the road to intercept it. He puts up his hand, indicating that the car should stop. He shouts. His actions are disregarded by the two men in the red fleet wing. The car bears down on the squad car driver, and he's forced to jump out of its way for fear of his life. The crew member of squad car number 12 opens fire at the speeding vehicle. One of his shots stars the windscreen of the red car. There's a violent skidding sound as the car's brakes are applied. It swings crazily out of control for a fraction of a second, and then its driver fighting the steering wheel. It straightens up, heads for the grass verge, bounces off the road, and heads for the narrow gap between the high garden wall of the house and a tree on the grass verge. He's stuck! you never make it! Shoot! Fantastic. I've never seen anything like it. He was stuck there between the tree and the wall. Just for a moment. And when they changed drivers, well, the fastest thing I ever saw. Why did they do that, I wonder? I think the driver was wounded. Better get the car out of the way. Warrant officer Van David will be along here soon. Here he comes now. What happened? He managed to get the car between the wall and the tree there. Don't ask me how. Why didn't you shoot him? We did. Did you hit him? I think we got the driver. So why didn't he stop? Well, the other man pulled the driver out of the way, took his place at the wheel. Well, I'll be... Oh, just don't stand there. Get the car out of the way. Right, sir. And follow us. I wouldn't have thought it possible. The car must be badly damaged, sir. There was a line of red paint off the car all along the wall. Yes, and the tree was damaged, too. This Peralta's a real desperado. He won't get far. I wonder which one was shot. You won't know that until we catch up with them. Come on, man, put your foot down. 8.11 a.m., some miles further down the road in Morningside. On a bridge across a small river, Warrant Officer Van Deerfunter and Sergeant Franklin see the Red Fleet Wing. Looks as though they've ditched it. It may be a trap. Maybe. Just be careful. Come on. driver's 
door's open. I'll take that side. You go around to the door on the near side. Watch me, and when I nod, get that door open fast. Right. Just don't get so excited that you shoot me. I'll watch it, sir. All right, you two. Let's have you out. There's only one, sir. This side. He's hurt bad. Where's the other one? He can't talk, sir. He's shot in the throat. No, it's his head. Where's the other man? It's no good, sir. Plenty of blood about. I wonder if the other one's hit, too. Have a look around. Right. Peralta's the one who's got away. He must have driven from back there by the school. That means... He must have got out on this side. In which case, if he was hit, there'd be... Yes, here we are. Look. Spots of blood. We crossed the road here, sir. I crossed the verge on the other side. Uh, what happened, sir? Peralta's escaped. Ah. He went this way, sir. Down here through the grass. The spur is quite easy to follow. Right, Gustavo. You go with the sergeant. You too. Right, sir. I'm just going to report in. I'll join you just now. 8.25 a.m. Warrant officer von Dierpenter informs control of what has transpired. At the same time, he learns that Lieutenant Gardner's prisoner, the bank robber called Bilo, has died in hospital. So now the man called Victor Peralta is wanted on a murder charge. 8.31 a.m. Warrant officer von Dierpenter joins in the chase. The trail of blood leads northeast along the riverbank. The spots of blood in the grass grow smaller and further apart. He must have managed to staunch the bleeding. Yes, he's lost a lot of blood there. Must have weakened him considerably. Hang on a moment, sir. That's it. Trail stops. And where's the last blood? Right here. About a yard from the water's edge. He's taken to the river. He's down there, in the mud. There's a footprint's. Must be. And down there, sir, in the riverbed, in the sand. Yes, he must have jumped in. And there are more footprints in the sand further down the river. Come on. You stay up there on the bank. Don't only concentrate on the river. He might have left the river further down already. Keep a lookout on either hillside. Right, sir. You want me to go back and radio for a dog, sir? Let's see how we go. It may not be necessary. If he sticks to the river, the dog would lose the scent anyway. Just as we've lost the trail. I beg your pardon, sir? The sandy bottom's finished. It's given way to rock. Hang on. What's that, sir? Water splashed on the rocks. He must have gone down there. That pool looks pretty deep. If he went in there, he must be wet through. Well, I'm not going swimming. <clears throat> Give me your hand. Here. <laughs> Here you come, sir. <sighs> Thanks. Now, just a moment, let me think. If I were Peralto... I think I'd want some transport. He's a town boy, this Peralta. He's got friends in Joburg. So that means he must make for a road. And he can't go back the way he's come or a house. Where there's a house, there's a car. That's usually the case. The grass is wet over here, sir. This is where he must have climbed out. Good man. See any blood? Uh, yes, sir. Just a couple of spots. Which way is he headed? That way, sir. Up the hill. Towards that house. That's a riding school, sir. Plenty of transport there. I shouldn't think he's in any condition to ride a horse, sir. No, 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 no. The cars, pupils, owners. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Let's get up there as fast as we can. Right, sir. Not you, Constable. You go back for one of the cars. Thanks, sir. Drive it round to the riding school here. Just watch your step. Very good, sir. 9.07 a.m. The Cavalier School of Equitation. The trail of blood has led the warrant officer and his men to the boundary of the riding school. Peralta has obviously climbed the fence and made his way to a group of outbuildings beside which is parked a two-ton truck. See anything? No, sir. It wouldn't surprise me if Mr. Peralta was already in that truck fiddling with the ignition wires. Wouldn't you if you were Peralta? I think so, sir. Let's take a look. Watch it, Constable. You've already had a demonstration of how desperate this man is. I'll watch it, sir. Oh, and one more thing. Yes, sir. Follow the fence and come out round the other side. Right, sir. We don't have to worry about the road because Constable, uh, what's his name? Uh, MacDonald, sir. Constable MacDonald is coming up that way in the car. But he won't know how to intercept a two-ton truck. That's true. Well, 
Just let's hope he uses his head. Come on. If we see him, I'll challenge him. Give him a chance to give himself up. I don't think he will. The young hoodlum desperate enough to try and shoot it up with us. He can't have a great deal of ammunition with him. If I remember rightly, three shots were fired at the station. If he's got a revolver, he's got three shots left. If it's a pistol... No, I think it was a revolver. I think. It all happened so quickly. He might have more ammunition with him, sir. Possibly. See anything? No, sir. Move your eyes across the scene. Like you do out in the bush when you're looking for game. A movement will betray his whereabouts. Get down! Do you see where that came from? No, sir. Blast! Uh, yes, sir. Come on, cast over. We must wriggle closer. It's up there somewhere. He's either in that truck or near it. Keep your head down, Constable. Aye, sir. Keep away! Leave me alone! I'll kill you! Don't be a fool, Peralta. There are too many of us. Ah, there are only two of you. You didn't see Sergeant Franklin go around the fence? No, sir. There is no cover for you there. I'll shoot you like dogs. Give yourself up, Peralta. It's hopeless. That's six. Six what, huh? Shots. Oh. You're hurt, Peralta. Come on out with your hands up, and we'll see that you get the medical attention you require. <laughs> you want me to show myself? I look such a fool. Can you see him? No, sir. Best if I can either. Come on, let's make a move. See if it draws any fire. Right, sir. Seven. Come any closer and you're a dead man. Then it'll be a murder charge. Ah, it is dead already. I shot Pillow. And they can only hang you once, eh? That's right. What makes you think he's dead? Because I shoot straight. I shoot him in the chest. You're a fool, Peralta. You can't get away. There are too many of us. I'm leaving in the truck. Not if we can help it. Now listen to me, Constable. Yes, sir. When I tell you I want you to make a move as though you were going to outflank him on the left. Yes, sir. Don't go far. And just make enough movement to draw his fire. I'll watch pretty carefully for the smoke. Right, sir. All right, Constable. Off you go. He didn't shoot. Don't try any funny business. Stay where you are. I wonder. I could have been mistaken. It might be a pistol. In which case, yes, yes, I think it's worth a gamble. I wonder what Sergeant Frank is doing. Are you all right, Constable? A bit uncomfortable, sir. I'm lying on an ant heap. Well, wriggle off it, man. Here, I say, what are you doing in my truck? That must be the writing school, man. Get back to the house. You'll get yourself shot. What, sir? Get under cover. Oh, right here. Nimble enough for a man of his age. So Peralta's in the truck. Must be having trouble with the wiring. There's a sergeant, sir. Creeping along in the shelter of that wall. He's seen him. Sergeant! The sergeant's down, sir. So I see. All right, Mr. Peralta, let's see what you're made of and whether I was right or not. I'm coming to get you, Peralta. You do and I'll kill you the way I killed your friend just now. I'm coming to get you. And I'm not coming on my belly either. Get down, sir, he'll kill you. I don't think so. I'm coming, Peralta. I'm waiting for you. You're bluffing. Come and see. I think all your ammunition's gone. Ha, 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 ha. count on it. I don't think you bargained for needing more than eight shots on your little outing to shoot Bilo and the lieutenant. You must be crazy. Stay where you are. No, Peralta. I'm coming in for you. Another step and you're dead. Go on then. Shoot me. Why don't you? I am opening the truck door, Peralta. Now. Warrant officer from Deerfonta, at the risk of his life, wrenched open the door of the truck to reveal Peralta lying across the seats. The policeman found a pistol leveled at his head. He looked into the black muzzle. 
he saw the effort it cost Peralta to squeeze the trigger. The mechanism worked, but the flash and explosion, which Warrant Officer Van Dieperta expected, was not forthcoming. Peralta's ammunition was spent. He was badly wounded in the hip. Sergeant Franklin was not dead, as his colleagues had feared. He, too, was badly wounded. Peralta stood trial for killing Bilo, and he was ultimately sentenced to death. He was hanged at Pretoria Central Prison. They prowl the empty streets at night, waiting, in fast cars, on foot, living with crime and violence. These men are on duty 24 hours out of every 24. They face dangers at every turn, expecting nothing less. They protect the people of South Africa. These are the men of Squad Cars. Listen again next Friday evening to another authentic story in our dramatic South African police series, Squad Cars. Brought to you by General Motors, makers of the biggest and most exciting range of cars, trucks and commercial vehicles in the world. Cadillac, Buick, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, Beaumont, Chevrolet, Opel, Holden, Vauxhall, Bedford, GMC and Ranger. South Africa's own car. carrying an even smaller boy up a hill. Someone stopped him and asked whether the burden was not too much for him. This isn't a burden, he replied. It's my brother. That was the sort of reply that Patrick Staunton might have given had anyone ever asked whether the weight of his brother's responsibilities was not sometimes too heavy for him to bear. The love that Patrick Staunton bore his younger brother Louis was something quite out of the ordinary, and it involved them both in a case that was also quite out of the ordinary. I want to tell you about it today. Few people can find anything good to say about a murderer. And yet most criminals have some virtue. It's just that it can't be seen for surrounding vices. For instance, there was a charm about Neville Heath. There was gentleness in Dr. Crippen. There was a sense of humor in Charlie Peace. There was a great deal of brotherly love in Patrick and Louis Staunton. It was the one quality which was constant in their approach to any person or any problem. It remained constant throughout their dealings in one of the most horrifying cases of the last century, the case of the brothers Staunton. It all happened in Kent around the year 1876. Yes, the lovely old village of Cadham in Kent was for a short time spotlighted in the blaze of publicity surrounding the two brothers who lived there. Now, although Patrick Staunton was two years older than his brother Louis, he had nothing but admiration for him, while Louis, in his turn, regarded his older brother with something very near to hero worship. Both extremely good-looking lads, they'd been inseparable throughout their school days. The fact that Patrick became an artist, while Louis preferred the life of an auctioneer's clerk, did nothing to separate these two. Nor did their bonds of affection slacken in the slightest when Patrick, now 26, decided to get married to a girl named Elizabeth Rhodes. You know, Louis, 
I've always thought that one of the nicest things about my going around with Elizabeth was that you were going around with her sister. Yes, Pat, we make a good foursome. Two brothers in love with two sisters. I'll never be able to thank you enough for introducing me to Alice. You are in love with her, aren't you? Well, I certainly like her a great deal. I wouldn't say that I was head over heels in love, as you are with Liz. Then I haven't such a fiery temperament, have I? <laughs> Otherwise, I might have been a painter as well. Louis, I'm going to marry Liz. Pat, why didn't you say so immediately? <laughs> Congratulations, my dear old boy. Where is she? This is something to celebrate. Now, just a minute, Louis. There's something I'd like to talk to you about first. I know what it is. This house, eh? Well, of course you must have it, Pat. There certainly isn't room here for the three of us. I tell you what, Pat. What do you think of this for an idea? I'll go and live in Cherry Cottage. Then I'll only be a hundred yards away from you. That's a grand idea. Wait a bit, though. We've got enough money. They're asking quite a lot for it, you know. Well, we have between us. Would you lend me a bit just for the time being? Well, I need you ask. Of course I will. Now, what about this celebration? Uh, no, it wasn't about the house I want to speak to you. You see, I was thinking about you and Alice. Well, what about us, old man? Well, I'm marrying Liz. And I was hoping that you might want to marry her sister. I mean, we, we four get on so well together, don't we? I know what you mean, Pat. It would be a grand arrangement. But at present, I, I have other ideas about a wife. Well, I rather felt that Alice was expecting a proposal for you any day now. Now, look here, Pat, Owen. Alice would be the last woman in the world to marry me in my present financial position. She made it quite plain to me that the only way I can hope to keep her with me is to earn, or acquire, enough money to make her very comfortable. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I suppose that means you have to wait some time. I'm not so sure. I've been working on the problem. And I hope that within a fortnight, I'll be able to announce to you my engagement. You don't quite follow all this. You just said that Alice... Forget Alice. The name of the young lady I hope to make Mrs. Staunton is Harriet. What? Not Harriet Richardson. The very same. Twenty-two years of age, good background, plain as a pudding. Agreed. As plain as a pudding. But a very rich pudding. She has four thousand pounds in the bank. I see. Are you in love with her? Madly. And if she hadn't any money, who knows? Perhaps I wouldn't have noticed her charms. <laughs> I always think you turn into a first-rate scoundrel. Well, no one knows me better than you do, Pat. <laughs> Patrick Staunton's wedding went ahead without a hitch. But young Louis' engagement did not go quite so smoothly. The young lady in question, Harriet Richardson, was indeed extremely plain. Nor did she make up for her physical deficiencies with any outstanding mental qualities. No one knew this better than her mother, Mrs. Richardson, and she was naturally suspicious when the dashing young Louis Staunton came to ask her for her daughter's hand. I find it rather difficult to believe, Mr. Staunton, that after such a short acquaintance with my daughter that you should be so infatuated. Your daughter, madam, is to my mind the most desirable of companions. I'm happy to think that she returns my affection. Oh, yes. I, I know Harriet is madly in love with you. But then, frankly, there have not been many young men who have paid her the attention that you have. I cannot for the life of me think why not, Mrs. Richardson. Come now, Mr. Staunton. Let us come out into the open. We are both aware that Harriet is, well, not pretty. Physical attraction has never meant very much to me. Mama. I wouldn't say that Harriet was particularly bright, either. There, I would venture to disagree. In fact, the only real attraction she would seem to offer a good-looking young man such as yourself is her money. Money, Mrs. Richardson? You didn't know about her money, I suppose. I believe Harriet did mention a small amount in the bank, but I hope you're not suggesting... I that... am suggesting, Mr. Staunton, and I warn you that I shall do everything in my power to stop you marrying my daughter. Just because I realize her defects doesn't mean that I don't love her, you know. Her welfare is the most important thing in the world to me. If and when she marries... I want her husband to be someone who will love her for her many excellent qualities, not for her bank account. Good day, Mr. Staunton. But in spite of all Mrs. Richardson's efforts to prevent it, the marriage between Harriet and Louis eventually took place. The bride's mother did not attend. So now the two brothers were both married. And although Louis no longer lived in Patrick's house, he was not far away, and the two couples saw much of each other. It was about six months after Louis's wedding that he took to coming to his brother's house almost every evening, without Harriet. And it wasn't entirely coincidence that his former sweetheart, Alice Rhodes, was staying with her sister, Mrs. Patrick Staunton. Ah, oh, come in, Louis. We're expecting you. Harriet, are with you? No, I left her at the cottage. 
Phew, this field must be all of six inches of snow on the ground. Now, go in by the fire. I'll hang your coat up. Oh, there's someone inside who'd be glad to see you. It's the best part of the day when I can come over here and see you all. <laughs> well, listen, I don't fool ourselves, but it's us you come to visit. Does Harriet know about you and Alice? Well, I, I told her that I knew, knew her before I married. What are you doing out there, Pat? Bring Willie in here by the fire. He must be frozen. Coming, my dear. Good evening, Liz. Hello, Alice. Hello, Louis. Come over here by the fire, Louis. Unless you'd like to sit there with Alice. Yes, thanks. I, I think I'll sit here. Harriet stayed back at the cottage, I suppose. Yes, she had a bit of a headache. She wanted to be left alone and to tell you the truth. I, I was quite happy to leave her. She's rather trying when she's not well. Poor Louis. I shouldn't think she's the most considerate of wives. Oh, I wish I'd never married her. You didn't exactly help for companionship from her, did you, Louis? <sighs> of course I didn't. I never realized she'd be as maddening as this. Poor Louis. You should have married me, after all. I think we ought to leave these two together, don't you, Pat? Yes, perhaps it would be a good idea. I want to turn in early. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow, Louis. Look, I, I don't want to disturb you like this. Nonsense. You haven't much chance of seeing Alice nowadays. And I know she'd like a good talk with you. Good night, both of you. Come in, Pat. Right on, my dear. I'm glad they've left us alone, Louis. Alice, I wish we could be together more often. It's so stupid. All I married Harriet for was the money that could make you happy. And now we can't be together to share it. Oh, I nearly forgot. I bought this for you. It's a gold watch. Oh, Louis, you darling. Oh, what a beautiful thing it is. With my name on the back as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Alice, I'm going over to Bromley tomorrow for the day. Harriet won't be coming. Will you come with me? Louis, I'd love to. Will you buy me some clothes? I'll buy you whatever you want. What else is money for? There were many little expeditions to Brumley and other places in the weeks to come. Alice Rhodes' name came to be linked with that of Louis Taunton whenever the village gossips met. And inevitably the rumors came to the ears of Mrs. Richardson, who didn't know where her daughter was and naturally was extremely worried. You see, Harriet had made it clear when she left her mother that she never wished to see her again, and for months there had been no word of the girl. But now, hearing of the behavior of her son-in-law, Mrs. Richardson made a personal visit to his brother Patrick, whom she knew to be living in the village of Cullum. She was not, however, prepared for the reception that Patrick gave her. Yes? Mr. Patrick Staunton. That's right. What is it you want, please? I'm out in the middle of a painting. I don't like being disturbed. I wanted to have a talk with you about your brother, who is married to my youngest daughter, Harriet. Oh, you are Mrs. Richardson? Yes. Uh, could you tell me something about them? I've had no word for over seven months. I, I don't even know where they live. Why should you want to know about them after the way you treated them at the time of the marriage? Perhaps I was a bit hasty. Nevertheless, I'm very concerned yes, about Harriet. very concerned indeed. When all you've done is to try to cause her misery... Let me tell you, madam, that your daughter has made a very good marriage. My brother Louis has made her far happier than she was from living at your home. And while I stand up, you will not be allowed to come between them again. You're being most insolent, Mr. Staunton. I have just assured you that I am anxious only for Harriet's welfare. Surely you can't refuse her mother her address. I surely can, madam. I surely do. Goodbye. But Mrs. Richardson was not to be put off so easily. Thoroughly concerned about her daughter, she renewed her inquiries in the village of Cunham and finally discovered that Harriet and Louis were living in Cherry Cottage, not a hundred yards from the house she had just visited. To Cherry Cottage she went without delay, only to find when the door opened to her knock that Patrick Staunton had preceded her. This time he was even more offensive than before and threatened her with bodily harm if she ever dared to interfere again. Mrs. Richardson, now convinced that some serious mischief was afoot, went to the police. And so, officer, I came straight to you. I'm sure something is going on in that house, and that whatever it is is harming my daughter. Uh, and just uh, what is it you think may have happened, Mrs. Richmond? Uh, Richardson is the name. I don't know what is going on. As I, as I told you, Mr. Patrick Staunton refused to let me either enter his house or his brother's. Why should he do that unless he wanted to hide something from me? Uh, tell me, madam, did you get on very well with your son-in-law? Uh, Louis Staunton? No, I, I did not. Hmm. And I think you said your daughter wrote that she did not want to see you anymore. Yes, she did. But that was some time ago. 
Uh, well, now, uh, uh, what would you say now, Mrs. Robertson? Uh, Richardson. Uh, oh, so sorry, uh, Richardson. Uh, wouldn't you say that in the circumstances it would be quite natural for them to refuse you admittance to their house? Officer, uh, Inspector, whatever you are, my instinct is never wrong about these things. And I know instinctively that my daughter is in trouble. Oh, well, the best I can do then, madam, is to promise to keep an eye on the Staunton family and let you know should evening come up that's out of the usual. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, but that's all I can do. And uh, now, if you'll excuse me... If I'd ever known the police in this village were so inefficient, I should never have bothered you. Good day. Uh, good day, Mrs. Uh, Rich... Uh, uh, Richardson! Yes. Unfortunately, village police are so used to dealing with village gossips that when a sincere person such as Mrs. Richardson comes along with a rather unlikely story, they're apt to treat her and her accusations with scepticism. It will surprise both the police and Mrs. Richardson to know that at the moment when this unsuccessful interview was taking place, Harriet Staunton was a prisoner, a starving prisoner in Cherry Cottage. the relationship between him and Alice Rhodes. In any case, Miss Rhodes was not as careful as she might have been. The more money Louise spent on her, the more her love for him grew. If she was away from the neighborhood for more than a few hours, she would send him long and passionate letters, fervently reminding him of her adoration. Though absence parts us for a while, and distance rolls between, believe whoever may revile, I'm still what I have been. It was thus that she ended one of her letters, the one that Harriet Staunton discovered... Harriet had a turbulent scene with her husband. Now, Louise Taunton did not like scenes. He wanted life to be easy, and at the moment it was far too noisy and complicated. With great confidence, he went to see his brother, Patrick. Pat, it's, it's all got a bit too much. I can't stand the rows that are going on. Can't you suggest any way in which I can be free to see Alice whenever I want to? There's only one way I can suggest, Louis. Leave Harriet. But it's her money that keeps Alice to me, Pat. If I left Harriet, I'd be broke. I can't think of a way out. Harriet won't even allow Alice inside the house now. Louis, why not let Harriet come over and stay with us? It couldn't then be said that you were leaving her. She's always complaining about lack of company, so she ought to be pleased to stay with us for a while. Pat, it, it's, it's a grand idea. I'm sure we could make her come. Then, I, then I'd have more freedom. That's right, and you could come over quite often. But you wouldn't like her here, Pat. She can be the most maddening person. I don't think you'll be able to stand her for long. No, I think we can manage her, Louis. Anyway, the important thing is for you to be happy. You know, I do anything in the world to bring that about. It's grand of you, Pat. Uh, but I insist on paying for her keep, though. No, 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 I wouldn't dream of such a thing. But of course, look, I'll pay you a pound a week to keep her as a lot. <laughs> All right, if you insist, a pound it is. <laughs> So Patrick took in his brother's wife as a lodger for a pound a week. This curious arrangement did not work very well. For one thing, Harriet was continually trying to leave the house to go in search of her husband. Now, Patrick didn't want his brother worried, so he had to keep doors and windows locked in whatever room Harriet was using at the moment. But still, she made a nuisance of herself. Like so many painters, Patrick found it quite impossible to work without complete silence around him. And while Harriet was in the house, he seemed destined to have only noise. Liz, what can I do? It's quite impossible to pay with that screaming din going on. Isn't there any way we can have some peace? I told you to get crazy to have her in the place. Why don't you send her back to Louis? She's his wife, let him take care of her. I can't do that. Louis is much right to be happy as anyone. Really, Pat? You're so soft about that brother of yours. No, Liz. Don't say anything you might regret. All right, all right. Let's do something about Harry. What about the attic? I could have a mattress up there. No, she'd just go on screaming. I've thrashed her three times today and still she goes on. I'll put her in the attic anyway. There's no way of escape from there. So at least we won't have to look around locking the doors and windows all day. And I'll think of a way to keep her quiet. She must be pretty strong to bang and shout like that all the time. Perhaps her lungs wouldn't be quite so lucky if she had her food cut down. Not only was Harriet's food cut down, 
It was cut off altogether. She was kept in a filthy room in the attic with very little air. It was not long before her strength failed completely. She was obviously very near death. None of the local doctors had seen Harriet, and Patrick was worried lest a death certificate should be hard to come by. The last thing he wanted was an inquest. Of course, there would have to be a funeral, but naturally he didn't want Mrs. Richardson to hear about that. In view of all these circumstances, it seemed eminently desirable that Harriet Staunton should die somewhere else than in Patrick's house. But where? It was finally decided that Penge should be the locality. Penge, a little town on the borderlines of the Countess of Sussex and Kent. Louis and his sister-in-law, Liz, went to explore the locality. They found what they thought were ideal lodgings and paved the way for Harriet by having a chat with the landlady, a Mrs. Quist. You see, Mrs. Quist, this lady is not a very healthy person. Oh, bless you. I've taken care of invalids before. I'm glad to hear it. Harriet is indeed an invalid. As relations, we feel very anxious to do all in our power to make her last days as comfortable as possible. And you see, Mrs. Quist, the doctor that's been looking after her hasn't got our full confidence. We've heard that there are some good doctors here in Penn who will know how to treat a paralysis case. Oh, bless you, yes. We have some wonderful doctors here. We'll take care of the poor lady for you. I'm afraid she hasn't long for this world. Oh, and there's one other thing. Her illness sometimes makes her delirious. She says things against the very people who love her most. I thought I ought to warn you... So that you wouldn't pay any attention. Oh, the poor soul. Don't worry, sir. I'll take good care of her. And so Harriet was moved to the lodging house in Penge. Even the landlady, prepared as she had been by Louis's description of the patient, was shocked at Harriet's appearance. Her body was alive with vermin, and her skin resembled more the bark of a tree than human flesh. Patrick Staunton called in a local doctor on the same evening that Harriet came to Penge, but the case was hopeless. Harriet died within 24 hours. It seemed to Patrick and Louis that the burden of this woman's life was now lifted forever from their shoulders. Actually, Harriet Staunton was to prove far more troublesome dead than alive. Where are you taking me now, Pat? I've come across a bit of a difficulty, Louis. We must make some inquiries. Well, what's the trouble? The fool of the doctor has given us a certificate. Did you mean what he put on it? He says Harriet died from cerebral disease and apoplexy. Sounds terrible, doesn't it? The certificate's all right. It's just what we want it. But it has to be handed into a registrar. Well, isn't, isn't there any register in Penge? That's the trouble. There are two. I don't know which to go to. Well, let's toss a coin for you. No, you don't understand, Louis. You see, the lodging house where Harriet died was almost exactly on the borderline between Sussex and Kent. There are two registers in Penge. One for the Sussex side and the other for the Kent side. Now we have to find out which one to go to. I thought we'd ask of the chemist over there. Well, that's no difficulty. Nothing wrong in asking a question. Here we are, then. Do you want to go on the road? No, there's someone in there at the moment. We'd better wait until he comes out. Nonsense. What are you so nervous about? There's no harm in what we're going to ask. Come on. Good evening, sir. Lovely day, isn't it? Uh, what can I do for you? Uh, this other gentleman was before us. Doesn't he want to be served first? No, no, it's quite all right. This gentleman's waiting for a prescription to be made up. Oh, I see. Well, I wanted to ask you about the handling of a death, a death certificate. I don't quite know which register to go to. The lady was staying practically on the borderline of the uh, uh, counties. I see. Well, uh, it should be quite simple. Uh, was she a resident in Penge? No, no, she only came recently from home, in Cobham, Kent. Well, then, I'm pretty sure the right register for you will be uh, Mr. Bain. If... Who knows? Perhaps if the village of Cobham had not been mentioned by Louis, no trouble would have occurred. But by one of those coincidences, it would outrage the reader of a novel, but of which life is full. The customer waiting in the chemist shop happened to know someone who lived in Cudham. In fact, his sister-in-law, Harriet Staunton. Yes, this gentleman had married Mrs. Richardson's elder daughter, and he knew all about the trouble with the Stauntons. His mother-in-law had often expressed her fears for Harriet. And when he heard the name, he pricked up his ears. He went further. He got the name of the doctor who had given the death certificate and went to see him. As a result of his interference, the thing the Stauntons feared most was brought about. There was an inquest. The inspector in charge of investigations, Inspector Thomas, was not quite sure of his ground. He talked it over with his superior. Uh, you see, sir, the doctors haven't found any organic disease sufficient to account for death. There was a small tubercular deposit in one lung, but they say it was of no importance. We've had an expert from London down here, and he states there is no trace of poison in any of the organs. And yet I'm still convinced that she was murdered. But how do you think it was done, Thomas? Well, that's just what I don't know, sir. 
I've never seen a body so emaciated as hers was. If it didn't sound so incredible, I'd say she'd been starved to death. But the maid at Mr. Patrick Staunton's house, where the deceased lived before coming to Penge, says that she was treated as an honoured guest. Did you search the house? Uh, no, sir, I didn't think it was necessary. Hmm, that'd be worthwhile, Thomas. Have a look at the room she was using. She might have left some diary or letters behind and try to find some people in Cadham who saw Harriet Staunton before... Well, before she was brought to Penge. They might have noticed something on the ordinary. Uh, right, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Inspector Thomas didn't find any diary or letters. The Saunders had made quite sure that all Harriet's belongings were burnt. But what he did see made such documents unnecessary. One glance at the attic room in which Harriet had starved made it quite clear that whatever her position in the family, she had not been treated as an honoured guest. A filthy mattress lay on the floor. The window was boarded up and the door had been fitted with a bolt on the outside. These facts carried great weight with the jury at the inquest and a verdict of willful murder was returned against Patrick and Elizabeth Staunton, Louis Staunton and Alice Rhodes, two brothers and two sisters. Such was the popular feeling in the district that the trial was moved to London and took place at the Old Bailey in September 1877. The defending counsel, Mr. Edward Clark, presented his case in a very unemotional manner. Members of the jury, I want you to divorce from your minds for the present any feelings of indignation that the prosecution might have inspired in you. For the task on which I am about to embark is, I say it myself, an extremely difficult and extremely technical one. The defense is that Harriet Staunton died from tubercular meningitis. Now, those of the jury, you've probably never heard of this disease. Indeed, it is one almost unknown to the ordinary member even of the medical profession. But I am going to attempt to present all the known facts about it to you. For I am certain that the death of Harriet Staunton was due not to poison, not to starvation, but to this relatively unknown disease. Now, first of all, I would like to make a few general observations. Mr. Edward Clark's speech to the jury was long, technical and brilliant. It was generally thought that had he been alone with the jury, he'd have succeeded in convincing them. But the judge, Sir Henry Hawkins, gave one of the most deadly summings up ever known in the Old Bailey. Indeed, his speech might better have come from the lips of the prosecuting counsel, and its effects were inevitable. All four prisoners were sentenced to death. It was then that the letters began to pour into the Home Secretary's office. <laughs> October the 12th. Dear sir, regarding the scant attention paid to the expert medical opinions in the trial of the Stauntons, I would wish to state my conjecture. This memorial, signed by 700 medical experts, with Sir William Jenner at their head, to the effect that the facts as stated at the post-mortem point clearly to death having been caused by several... morning that you are to reopen the case of the Stolten. I feel sure that when this brings up... The result of the new inquiry was that the sentences of Louis and Patrick Staunton and Patrick's wife Elizabeth were commuted to penal servitude for life, while Alice Rhodes, who stood to profit most from Harriet's murder, was granted a free pardon and immediately released. It seems that from the purely legal point of view, the paying of a pound a week to Patrick and his wife for the care of Harriet placed them under a special obligation to prevent her from starving. Consequently, their guilt was, in the eyes of the law, greater than Louis or his young lady. And so, the case of the two inseparable brothers came to an end. Callous, yes. Brutal and ruthless, yes. But there remains their outstanding love for each other. Patrick and Louis, who, when the sentence of death was being passed on them, forgot their womenfolk entirely and clasped each other's hands for mutual encouragement, thinking only of the great love which ironically made their savage crime possible. I'll be back again soon to tell you some more of the secrets of Scotland Yard. Meanwhile, this is Ty Brook saying goodbye and pleasant dreams.
Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile division. You get a call from a high school principal. A young boy has caused a near riot in his classroom. Your job? Investigate. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, October 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Stein. My name's Friday. It was 1.47 p.m. when we got to Adams High School. Chemistry class. You the police? Yes, sir. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I'm John Lane. This is my class. What little there is left of it. Have you seen Mr. Barlow? Yes, sir. We talked to him when we came in. I think he's in the clinic now. He said you could give us the stories, all right? It was the Lambert boy. He came into class about five minutes late. Uh-huh. We were just starting the lecture on analysis. I told Douglas to take his seat. He said something I couldn't hear, but he went back to his place, and I went on with the lecture. Mm-hmm. I guess it was about ten minutes later that the commotion started. The first thing I knew about it, Larry McLean started to yell at Lambert, said something about keeping his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Then Lambert said something about McLean minding his own business. I started off the platform to quiet things down. By the time I got to Douglas, he'd hit McLean. Well, after that, it's all a little confused. Flying apparatus, chemicals being thrown all over the place, glass breaking. The whole class seemed to explode. Or were the other members of the class fighting, or was it just the two boys? It seemed like the whole class was fighting. At the time, it seemed like the whole school was in the room, all throwing things. Mm-hmm. Finally, I got the Lambert boy aside, and then the fight seemed to stop. In the meantime, he'd thrown a bottle of sulfuric acid at McLean, burned his face and his chest. The ambulance took him to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and a nurse here gave him first aid. Well, do you have any idea what started the argument here? No, I'm not sure. As I got it later, it seems that Douglas made some remark about a young girl working next to him. I didn't hear it, but I gathered that it was a pretty filthy statement. McLean heard it, and that's when he told Douglas to keep his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Lambert is known as a sort of troublemaker, then, is he? Yes, and it's so hard to understand. Sir? Well, up until just lately, I'd say the last two months or so, he was a model student. He had a straight-A average. I wonder if we could see the boy. I guess so. There isn't anything much I can do here. Oh, terrible. It'll be a couple of weeks before I can hold a class in here again. It's terrible. Yes, sir. The clinic's down here. Have you any idea what might have caused this change in the Lambert boy? Well, I have my own suspicions, but... He's only 15. It's hard to believe. What's that, sir? When he came into class today, I think he was drunk. Oh, why do you say that? I noticed that when he came into the room, he wasn't very steady on his feet. It had to be something like that to make him do this. Then, too, when I grabbed him when they were fighting, mm-hmm. I thought I smelled liquor on him. Oh, we go in here. All right. Here's the boy. Douglas? Yes, sir. These men would like to talk to you. Yes, sir. They're from the police. Mr. Friday, and this is Mr. Smith. Hello? There How are you? you? Sit down, sir. Yes, sir. How's Larry? I don't know. They took him to the hospital. If you don't mind, Mr. Friday, I'll check with the nurse, see how badly Larry was hurt. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Now, son, you want to tell us what this is all about? There's not much to tell. Larry and me got in a fight. Mm-hmm. Well, what started the fight, son? I don't know. He just wanted to cause trouble. Him and me never have gotten along. Always had trouble. You been drinking, Doug? Why do you ask that? Because I want to know. Have you been drinking? How about it, boy? No. 
Where would I get something to drink? Well, now, something's a little wrong here, son, according to what Mr. Lane tells us. Looks like you might have been drunk when the fight started. He tells us that you said something to a young girl in the class. That's what started the whole thing. You know he's lying? Is he? Sure. He's on Larry's side. The two of them are real thick. That's not what he told us, Doug. From what he said, he's pretty fond of you. Said he couldn't figure out what happened to you lately. Well, he's okay, but why does he say I was loaded? That's a stupid thing to say. Yeah, especially if you weren't. I'll tell you what, Doug. Hmm? Let's get a traffic investigation car over here and take a toxometer test, huh, just to be sure. Why? What'll that prove? It'll straighten it out once and for all, whether you're drunk or not. How about it, boy? Shall I call the car? Doug? No, you don't have to do that. I had a couple of drinks. Nothing serious, though. Just a couple of drinks. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Where'd you get the liquor, son? I don't remember. No, this won't work, boy. We'll find out. You know that. Well, I don't see what difference it's going to make where I got it. I've been drinking a couple of years. I know how to handle it. I know what I'm doing. Mr. Friday? Yes, sir? See you a minute. Well, sure. What's going on? Something wrong with Larry? I don't know, son. I thought he was okay when they took him to the hospital. The nurse said she took care of it. They said he was going to be okay. All right, boy. Let's go. Where are you taking me? We want to talk to you downtown. Something has gone wrong, hasn't it? Something's wrong with Larry. He's dead. No, son. Larry's all right. He's burned, but he's going to be all right. You're lying. I know. You want to take me to jail. No, that's not true, son. We just want to find out where you got the liquor. Yeah. Well, I haven't done anything. A couple of drinks, that's all. What's the harm in that? Come on, son. You've got a lot to explain. Okay, take me in. Put me in jail. I don't care what happens. Yeah, you've already proved that. 2.26 p.m. Frank and I talked to Charles Barlow, the vice principal of the school. He told us the same story that we'd gotten from John Lane. He said that until a few months before, Douglas Lambert had been a model student. He was above average in his classwork and took part in all school activities. Suddenly, and without apparent reason, he had become the number one troublemaker in his class. His attendance record became one of the worst, and his attitude toward his teachers was arrogant and discourteous. The principal told us the same attitude was being displayed by other students in the school. We notified Mrs. Lambert that we were taking him to Georgia Street Juvenile for questioning. We filled in Captain Stein on the developments, and then Frank and I questioned the Lambert boy. He was sullen and uncooperative. I don't know what you want with me. A little fight, that's all it was. Why are you guys trying to make something big out of it? You've already done that, Doug. Maybe you don't know what you've really done. Maybe we ought to fill you in on a few things. That might not be such a bad idea. Tell me how I'm a criminal. Tell me I was a bad boy. Go ahead, tell me. Don't get smart, son. What do you want me to do? Sit here and listen to you guys yak at me? You expect me just to sit here and let you guys tie a rap on me that I haven't got coming? You got one thing on me. I had a couple of drinks, that's all. A couple of drinks. No harm in that. I don't feel so good. Why don't you guys leave me alone? I got a headache. Larry McLean's got more than a headache. So the kid shouldn't have started anything he couldn't finish. He wanted to be a big man in front of the class. He was. Now he's hurt and he's trying to blame me. It won't work, cop, and you know it. That's enough of that. I'm a minor. You can't touch me. That's the trouble with you, kid. You think because you're under 18, the laws don't mean you. You can't touch me and you know it. Don't worry, Doug. Nobody's going to touch you, but let me tell you a couple of things. You sit here and figure you're a big man, a real tough kid. You don't have to tell me. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm getting sick and tired of having kids like you waltz around the streets, your minds and hands filthy, bragging about what big men you are. You do what you want. You don't care about what it means to the people around you. How you hurt them doesn't matter. Everything's fine until you do something wrong and we nail you. Right away you start screaming minor that you're a juvenile, just a kid acting normal. You steal a car for a joyride. An officer starts after you. You don't care who gets in front of the car as long as you get away. You don't let anybody stand in your way. Men, women, kids, they're all the same to you. Run them down. Show them that you're just a healthy kid out for some fun. After all, you're just a kid. The laws weren't meant for you. You're different. Well, there's another kid lying in a hospital right now. He's got real trouble. He got in your way. He didn't feel that you had any special rights. Be a big man, Doug. You go tell him that you knew what you were doing when you threw that acid at him. You tell him that you were just having a little carefree fun. Tell him that you know how to handle liquor. Tell him that he's going to spend a long time with a plastic surgeon because you're just a kid. You tell him that his face is going to be like that because you're just a normal, healthy, growing boy. I hope you're real proud of yourself. I hope you feel good. You've burned it right into your brain. There isn't any place you can go to get away from it. All right, boy, let's go. Wait a minute, Mr. Friday. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I acted like that. All right. You want to try to make things right with Larry? You want to help us out on this thing? Yeah, I guess so. Where do I start? Where'd you get the liquor? A place near school. Kids call it Sam's Club. What's the address? I don't know. I'll show you the place. You say it's a club? Well, sort of. You have to know the ropes before you can get in the place. What do you mean, the ropes? Well, they only let kids in. You ring the bell to the house, and then when they answer, you stand there with a $5 bill in your hand. Mm-hmm. That way they know you're okay. Who is this Sam? I don't know his last name. The kids just call him Sam. He run this place all by himself? No, there's his wife, Inez. She's usually around. Just these two around the place, then, huh? 
Yeah, that's all I know about. It always seemed to me that Inez was really the brain. She was always telling Sam what to do. Hmm. How'd you find out about this place, Doug? One of the kids at school told me about it. He took me there one night. Then after he introduced me to Sam and Inez, I started to go there by myself. What's it like inside? they have a bar or anything like that? Oh, yeah. You walk into the living room and there's a big bar along the right wall. All chrome and leopard skin. Real nice. There's a few tables around and a record player. Mm. They sell anything else in this place besides liquor? I don't think I know what you mean. You know what we mean, Doug. Yeah, I guess I do. Well, how about it? Well, yeah, you can buy tea if you want it. Mm -hmm. This $5 routine, what happens to it? Well, drinks are six bits apiece. Sticks are a buck and a half. If you want to give them the five as you come in, you can have as much as you want. Otherwise, you pay for each thing as you get it. You ever smoke marijuana? Well, almost all the kids there do. How about you? If you don't, the other kids call you a coward. Well, you still haven't answered the question. Yeah, I've smoked it a couple of times. Can you give us the names of the other youngsters who go to this place? Well, wait a minute. I'll help all I can, but I'm not going to be a squealer. I don't think it's squealing, Doug. Yeah, well, you don't have to give the names. Why not look at it this way, boy? You got trouble because of this Sam and Inez. Now, the same thing could happen to one of the other kids that go to this place. You want that to happen? No, but... Well, the best way to see that it doesn't is to tell us all you know about the place. Isn't that right? I guess so. I'll give you the names. Do they allow girls in this place, too? Yeah, as long as you know the $5 bill gimmick, anybody can get in. They allow adults? No, if they figure you're over 18, they won't let you in. Especially at the Saturday night parties. What kind of those? Every Saturday night, Sam and Inez throw a party. For five bucks, you get all you want to drink and smoke. Sam told me once it's a good business. Makes for better customer relations. Mm. You ever see any other narcotics on the premises? I've never actually seen any myself. I've heard that if Sam or Inez know you real well, you can get a pop of heroin. But like I said, I've never seen it myself. Most of the kids that I know, the ones from school, just go there for drinks. Anything else you think we ought to know? No, nothing that I can think of. How about these two? Either of them drive a car? Yeah, Sam has a little Nash Rambler, dark green. Once in a while, when we stay over at lunchtime or when we're late getting home, he drives us home or back to school. All right, Doug. Your mother ought to be here by now. If we need your help in getting Sam and Inez, we can count on it, huh? Yeah, I'll help all I can. Okay, son. Let's go. Just say, Sergeant. Yeah? I'm sure sorry about the way I acted. Really made a fool of myself. I hope you'll forgive me. That's all right. But you'd think there'd be an easier way, wouldn't you? What's that, son? To grow up. We checked the names Sam and Inez through R&I and came up with a Sam and Inez Bailey. Both of them had long records for contributing to the delinquency of minors. Both had served time in the county jail. Douglas Lambert was shown mug shots of the couple and identified them as the owners and operators of Sam's Club. We checked with Captain Stein about picking them up, and it was agreed that the best way would be to catch them in the act of selling liquor and narcotics to juveniles. We talked to the Lambert boy, and he told us that it was the custom of the Baileys to hold a party every Saturday night. He told us that most of the youngsters who frequented the place would be there at that time. He put in a call to the house, but there was no answer. 6.15 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the place. It was a small cottage on the back of the lot. The landlord occupied the house in front. We rang the bell to the manager's house. Yeah? Mr. Halsey? Yeah? Police officer, sir. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? I'm Mr. Halsey. Want to come in? Well, it might be better, sir. We'd like to talk to you about the Baileys. Worst tenants I ever had. I knew they'd end up with the police. Why do you say that, sir? Well, I just do, that's all. They got a lease on the house. And if I could figure a way to get them out, I sure would. They're always causing trouble. Mm -hmm. All those kids. Yes, sir. Do you have any idea where they are now? Why, are you going to arrest them? I hope so. Maybe I can break the lease that way. You know where they might be now, sir? No, I don't know. I shoved off this afternoon. They didn't say where they was going. They just left. I wonder if you could let us see their house, sir. Why? Well, we'd like to look it over. Sorry. Well, I don't know. What, what do you want for? We think they're selling liquor to miners. Yes, they do a thing like that. The noise they made. The neighbors on both sides have been screaming. Can you let us into their house? You just bet I can. Wait, I'll get the key. Here's some place. But, uh, put in one of those little key rings. You know the kind with the rabbit's foot? Yes, yeah, sir. Sorry to keep the officers waiting. I know I'm always away. If you want something, you, you can always lay your hand right on it. And then when you're looking for it... Oh, here it is. See, the rabbit foot. Yes, sir. Well, you can go out the back door this way. All right, fine. Well, uh, what are you looking for? What do you figure you'll find back there? We're not sure, sir. Frank. Yeah, Joe. You want to stay out here and let us know if they come back? Yeah, I'll wait in front of the house. All right. 
You know, it's funny about them. What's that, sir? Well, when they first moved in, they said they wanted the locks on the door changed. I told them it'd be okay, but they'd have to give me a key to the place. They had quite a ruckus about it, but I stood in my ground. They wasn't going to buffalo me, no, sir. Here, I'll, I'll get the lock. All right. Okay. Gee, smells like they haven't had a window open in a year, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look what they've done to this room. They built a bar and everything. You sure were right about them. I think I can break the lease on this. I'm pretty sure. It says in the contract that they can't do any building without my permission. I certainly didn't give them any okay on this. Yes, sir. This is the dining room? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Just pull those doors back. What's that smell, Sergeant? I'm not sure, but I think it might be narcotics. Drugs. I knew it. I knew it all along. Oh, just wait till you get back. I'm really going to tell them. I really am. Rather you didn't do that, sir. What? Rather you didn't let them know that we were in here, that you know anything about this. Well, why? You're going to arrest them, aren't you? You're not going to let them get away with this. No, sir, but we understand they've got a party planned here tomorrow night. If we wait until then, we can make a charge stick. Oh, you mean they're going to have a drunken brawl? The kids here smoking marijuana, taking heroin and stuff like that? Well, we're not going to let them go that far, sir. We're going to need your cooperation here, Mr. Halsey. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, sir, we want to install listening equipment in here. We'd like to use your house. You mean you're going to bug the place? Well, yes, sir. We like to put in microphones. Well, will it hurt the property? I mean, would you have to put nails in the walls, you know, stuff like that? No, sir, I don't think so. Oh, well, then, then you can do it. Yes, sir, I want to help, Sergeant. That's the trouble with people nowadays. You know, they don't want to help. You just go right ahead and put your, put your microphones in just as long as you don't have to nail anything in the walls. <sighs> all right, sir. If we could go back to your house, I'd like to use the phone if it's all right. You bet. Closing that so they won't know anybody's been here, huh? Yes, sir. Uh huh. Don't guess if I leave any fingerprints on the door, it'll hurt. No, sir, I don't think it will. No. Can't be too careful, though, you. But then I guess you know all about things like that. Huh? Yes, sir. I'll go around front and get my partner. Yeah, sure thing. You fellas all work in teams like this? Yes, sir, most of the time. Well, I never knew that before. Do you have any idea at all where the Baileys might have gone? Did they give you any indication at all, sir? No. No, I saw them leave this afternoon. Just got in the car and left. Did they take any luggage with them? Suitcases, would you know? Not that I could see, no. Uh-huh. Ah, you find anything? Yeah, the bar's in the living room. Oh, then what the Lambert kid said was true, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Tell them about the dope in the dining room. How you open the door and smell the fumes. I want it? Yeah, it smelled like that. Find it? No, I didn't go over the place too good. I thought if we were going to wire the place, we'd better get on it. Yeah. If we could just use your phone, sir? Oh, yeah, you bet. Come on in. Right there, on the table in the hall. Oh, thank you, sir. Isn't a toll call, is it? No, sir. Well, of course, not to make any difference. Just thought I'd ask. Yes, sir. You think uh, you're still getting one of those detective magazines? Well, I don't know, sir. We've got nothing to do with that. Well, you know, of course, I didn't figure that you did, but if it, if it does, I hope they spell my name right. It's S-E-Y. Uh-huh. Yeah. Some people forget the E, you see. Uh-huh. Spell it with just the Y. 2838, please. Asdale, it's Joe Friday. I want to install a dictograph at 825 North Lucerne. Yeah, 825 North. Mm-hmm. Right away. Yeah, well, you know better than I do. When you see the place, you can figure. Yeah, the house in the front of the lot. What? Oh, maybe 30, 35 yards? Yeah, okay. Right away. Yeah, good. We'll be in the house in front. Yeah, all right, we'll see you then. All set? Yeah, Asdale's coming right out. Good. To say, Sergeant... Yes, sir? I just uh, happened to think of something. Might not mean anything. What's that, sir? The other day, I think it was Monday. Yes, yes, I'm sure it was Monday because I I just come back from the laundry. You know, I always pick up my stuff on Monday. Yes, sir. Well, when I came back, I met Mr. Bailey. He was putting around with the car. I asked him if he was going to take a trip. He said no, but he said he might get out of town for a little bit. I asked him if I knew anything about the roads. What roads, Mr. Halsey? Down to Mexico. <laughs> are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. The men from the crime lab arrived and installed the listening equipment. A stakeout was placed on the house, but the Baileys failed to return that night. At 8.46 a.m. Saturday morning, the men covering the house called to say that the Baileys had just driven in. 
Frank and I got in touch with Douglas Lambert and his parents. With their permission, we laid out the plan for that night. It was agreed that the boy would arrive at the house at about 8.30 p.m. When the other youngsters had been served drinks, he would give us a signal by starting in to cough. When we came into the house, he would try to secure as many of the drinks as possible for evidence. We told him that there would be officers all around the house and that at no time was he to place himself in jeopardy with Sam, Inez, or any of the other youngsters. 7.30 p.m., Frank and I took up our positions in the back bedroom of the owner's house, turned on the dictograph, and waited. The Baileys were discussing the party. Sam was talking about how he watered the whiskey. At 8.27 p.m., four youngsters arrived. They rang the doorbell, and when Sam opened the door, they displayed the required bill. He nodded and ushered them into the living room. They did a good job in there, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Really hear it. Mm-hmm. Lambert boy should be here pretty quick. Yeah. Doesn't sound like they're starting anything in there yet, does it? No. How long do you figure we wait before we go in? As soon as he starts to cough. You check with the other men? Yeah, Turner and Brown are covering the back of the place. Oh. Lindsay and Carter and a couple of police women are parked down the street. You can see the car down there. Yeah. Wait a minute. Huh? Looks like the Lambert kid now coming up the walk. Yeah, it is. Sure hope everything goes all right. All right, let's turn it up a little more, huh? Is that better? Yeah. I'll get it, honey. Change that record, will you? I heard it four times. Yeah. Oh, hi, Doug. Come on in. Thanks, huh? Wasn't sure you'd be here tonight. What made you figure that? You know, I wouldn't miss one of these. I just figured you might have gotten a little bit of trouble with everything. No, no, it's all right now. Yeah, well, take it easy tonight, huh? Sure, Sam. Who is it, honey? Doug Lambert. Hi, Doug. You have any trouble with that McLean kid? No, I was telling Sam the cops talked to me for a while. They didn't have anything on me, so they had to let me go. You didn't tell him anything about this place, did you? Well, of course not. You know I wouldn't do that. He wouldn't, Diane. As I told you, Doug's all right. We can trust him. Ah, yeah, things worry me. The cops get wise to this place, and we really got problems. Oh, honey, I tell you, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's get on with the sociable. What do you have, Doug? Whiskey, I guess. Good deal. Hey, you want a stick? Got some fresh stuff. Then real good. Yeah, sure. That's my boy. You know, Doug, I like you. You're a good kid. Some of the other guys come in here. I guess Inez is right about them. They're jerks, but... Well, I feel I can trust you. Oh, excuse me. Well, you got to fix the other kids up. Okay, let it be. <coughs> <coughs> well, kid, got something in your throat? I don't know. I just started the come call. Come on, Mike. Door's locked. Let's hit it. What's going on? Who are you guys? Police officers. You're under arrest. What for? What are you trying to pull? Pull it, everybody. Right where you are. Did you hear it all, Sergeant? Yeah, Doug, we did. Hear what? You in on this, Doug? I told you not to trust any of them. I told you, but you wouldn't listen. You want to kill the phonograph, Frank? I got Where'd it. you get the marijuana, Doug? Out of that drawer. There in back of the bar. Yeah. There's nothing there. Right here, Doug? It was way in the back. Shut up, you. Yeah. What about these, Sam? I don't know what you're talking about. I never saw those before. All right, mister, let's go. I'll get Turner and Brown. They can take care of the kid. Right. You and your ideas. I told you we shouldn't have come back. I told you. Oh, knock it off. Shut your mouth, will you? I told you last night we should have kept driving, but oh, no, you figure we got a sweet racket here. You don't want to change it. It's good, you said. Yeah. How does it look now? Look, I'm telling you, take it easy. All right, let's go, huh? It's the way it is, Sergeant. Try to make a living for a woman, make things nice. The first time something goes wrong, she starts to squawk. Never failed. You're riding high, everything's fine. Him and his living, always trying to build something up, always trying to figure out a way to beat the game. One big deal, one big thing to set him up for good. Yeah, well, I think he made it this time. Let's go. The story you just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Samuel G. Bailey and Inez R. Bailey were filed on under the Health and Safety Code, Section 11,500, Possession and Sale of Narcotics, and found guilty on one count. They were found guilty on two counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Violation of Section 11,500 of the Health and Safety Code is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than five years or imprisonment in the county jail. Contributing to the delinquency of a minor is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not more than one year. The boy, Douglas Lambert, was made a ward of the juvenile court. Ladies and gentlemen, where the community chest is at work, Red Feather services like youth programs and clinics, hospitals, and the USO give direct help to two families out of five every year. And indirectly, everybody benefits. 
Because community chest services make America's cities and towns healthier, happier places to live. So give generously to your community chest. Pledge enough for all the community campaigns that are united under the Red Feather banner. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Sam Edwards, Vic Rodman. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Mutual presents Under Arrest, directed by Martin Mogner and starring Joe DeSantis as police captain Jim Scott. Under Arrest. Into your cell. Criminals Behind Bars, Under Arrest, the story of police captain Jim Scott's fight against crime. How did you get in here? Through the door. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Get out. I mean it. I only want to talk to you, and I get up out of your bed. I warn you, I have a gun. I don't want to harm you. You've broken in here. Don't move. Oh, you really do have a gun. But no fear. I think you're afraid. No. Why would a woman like you have a gun unless you were afraid? I tell you, I'm not afraid. That gun says you are. Now give it to me. You're an intruder here. Get out. Please, get out. No. No. <laughs> Operator, please connect me with police headquarters, will you? Before Captain Scott picks up the phone to be connected with murder, may I have a word with you? CARE, the organization of welfare agencies operating on a non-profit basis, guarantees delivery of food and clothing packages to 12 European countries, Japan, Korea, and Okinawa. Care packages are available for as little as $5.50. And to order, you simply address Care, New York. Police headquarters, Captain Jim Scott speaking. Captain Scott, did you say? This is Ruth Cutler. Cutler. Ritz Park Apartments. Ritz Park. Apartment 3D for Daniel or... Delilah, if you prefer. Delilah, definitely. What's your problem, Miss Cutler? Captain, whoever comes, I do hope it's you. Me? Why? You have such a charming telephone voice. I bet you say that to all the policemen. I've never even spoken to a policeman before, Captain Scott. I've never killed a man before. Killed a man? I'm afraid. I'm terribly frightened. Please come. Quickly. I'll be right up. <laughs> Ruth Cutler was our foremost professional authority on society. She wrote a newspaper column about various social events of the upper crust. She was a mighty handsome lady, tall with big dark eyes and smoky hair worn like a Madonna. Say she was 33 and very calm looking. However... Captain Scott, it was horrible. Horrible. Easy, Miss Cutler. I woke up. He was coming toward me. He'd gotten in somehow. How? Through that door, I suppose. From the kitchenette? And the back door. I warned him, but he kept coming closer. Finally, I had to... His face twisted all up. His hands clawed at the air. And his eyes suddenly... Easy, easy. Are you sure he... I mean... What if he's still alive in there? I looked. Oh. Ever see him before? What? Hanging around the building, casing the job, as it were. Oh, no. Think he came to burgle? Obviously. Why, obviously, Miss Cutler. What other reason could he have had? You're a prominent lady in our town. You mingle in society and could have enemies. 
social battles are fought with parties, Captain Scott. Mm. By the way, Captain, just what do I face with the law? If you kill a man in defense of yourself, of your home... What do you mean, if... It's not murder, but only manslaughter, and probably a suspended sentence. Just the same, I'll have to book you at headquarters as soon as my boys get here. Your attorney can easily arrange bail. You know, I was right about you, Captain. You're every bit as charming and sympathetic as your telephone voice. You think that fellow came in the back door? Yes. Then I wonder how his hat got, uh, here. On this little table in the foyer besides your front door. Hat? Good heavens, I... I thought he came in the back door, but... I'm so upset and confused that I... How could I have made such a mistake? I don't know, Miss Cutler. <laughs> Booking Ruth Cutler at headquarters for manslaughter didn't take long. She was out on bail inside an hour. I went down to the morgue to see about identifying the dead man. Unfortunately, he had no papers on him. We were beginning to prepare a police bulletin when I was called out to face a visitor. Small, very neat girl of about 25. Her eyes were icy with dread, and in one hand she clutched a copy of the early edition of the Morning Post News. I want to see him, Captain Scott. Who? It's in the papers. The man Ruth Cutler... Shot. The morgue's not a pleasant place. Please! Things like that are part of my job. In a minute, we were standing under the blazing light with a green glass shade, looking down at what was under it. I flipped back the sheet. <laughs> you know him? We came here yesterday from Boston for a visit. We? David and I. David Ashburn. You Mrs. Ashburn? He runs a... He ran a small dress shop in Boston for six, seven years. I worked for him. We're in... We were very much in love. We were going to be married. We don't have to stand right here, Miss... Uh... Allison. Betty Allison. Miss Allison... What made you think it was David Ashburn when you read about it in the paper? He... David told me he happened to meet Ruth Cutler on a mountain road, and she promised to help him professionally. On a mountain road, Miss Allison? Only a few weeks ago. David was driving from Boston to somewhere in Pennsylvania. Her car had broken down, and he stopped to help. And they got talk. And you said she promised to help him professionally? She's an authority on society, on, on good clothes for women. Huh? David was ambitious. He wanted to see her again. And so you came along? As his secretary. You never suspected he might have inclinations to burglary? He never did, Captain. I, I can't understand his being shot as an intruder. It, it's... Oh. Uh -huh. <coughs> ah. Hey, uh, somebody, send a matron down here to take care of this girl. She's fainted. Betty Allison's statement threw some new light on the intruder Ruth Cutler had shot. And only Ruth Cutler could focus that new light for me. But it was lunchtime the next day before I located her in one of the city's smartest restaurants, the Silver Pheasant, where they start by charging you a quarter of a rolls and butter. Captain Scott. I'm sorry to interrupt this luncheon, Miss Cutler, but I need another little chat with you. Uh, may I present Mr. Oliver? Big Bill Oliver, isn't it? Uh, so called, Captain. Well, it's a privilege to meet the next commissioner of parks and buildings if I'm elected. Oh, Bill, darling, you know you will be. Uh, <clears throat> Ruth, I'd better wait out in the cocktail lounge while you and Nonsense, Captain Scott. Nonsense, darling, not at all. I have no secrets from you. Captain, you don't mind if he stays? Uh, I understand, Miss Cutler, that you did meet that intruder. Prior to last night. What? It was while you were driving through Pennsylvania. The date was the 7th of July, last month. 7th of July? Does that make you uh, remember his name? No. 
David Ashburn, owner of a small but smart dress salon in Boston. Ring a bell yet? Uh, it's quite impossible, Captain Scott. That he ran a dress shop? That I could have met him in Pennsylvania on the uh, 7th of July. Impossible? Yes, I was some 400 miles from Pennsylvania. I don't suppose there were any witnesses to that uh, uh, meeting of myself. And uh, whom did you say, uh, uh, David Ashburn? No witnesses. No, I should think not. Hmm. If you weren't in Pennsylvania that day, where were you? Oh, must I answer that? No, but I should think you'd want to convince me you never saw Ashburn before. It's one thing to kill a stranger. But if you knew David Ashburn before last night, then he might not have been an intruder, but an invited guest. And that's not manslaughter. That's murder. Bill, darling, I'm afraid I'll have to tell the truth. Uh, well, of course. Captain Scott, I spent the entire day of uh, July 7th until 11 in the evening with Mr. Bill Oliver. Oh. We both took the day off, drove into the country, had a picnic dinner, and drove back. Well, uh, that's quite different, isn't it? Uh, you can see, Scott, uh, we're uh, very fond of each other. Okay, Miss Cutler, Mr. Oliver, thanks. Goodbye, Mr. Scott. I'll see you around, Scott. I hope so. Goodbye. Ruth, darling, that was quite a lie to tell you. You weren't with me that day. Bill, dear, the truth is that I never met that David, you know, what's his name, or that day or any other day. Then... Well, actually, that day I was out at my own little country place, my cottage. But I'm afraid no one saw me there, and of course I had to tell Scott I was with you, and that settled it. Now, darling, do get me another martini, and let's talk about something else. <laughs> Another visitor. And with a gun. You're rather late coming home, Miss Cutler. I wasn't anxious to come here for purely personal reasons. Now let's talk about you. My name's Betty Allison. I was going to marry David Ashburn. How did you get into my apartment? The handyman's usual price of admission to other people's apartments here is five dollars. But he doesn't like you, Miss Cutler. He charged me only three. I won't charge you anything to leave. Now, I've come to kill you, Miss Cutler. Oh, my poor dear girl. I'm all smashed up, really, over this tragedy last night. But I was only defending myself. I didn't know that you Stop even... Stop it. Knew... What? Stop pretending. You and David were seeing each other in secret. Seeing each other? Yes, and he came here to break off with you, and you killed him. You lied to the police when you told them that he was a burglar, a... an intruder you never saw before. But you're wrong. I didn't even know it. Then how did David happen to have this? Where did you find that? One of his bags happened to be put in my hotel room by the bellhop. Oh? I opened it and struck gold, Miss Cutler. This solid gold cigarette case with the initials R for Ruth, C for Cutler. You know, I'm sorry for what I'm going to have to say. Another lie. You loved him very much, I can tell. You looked up to him, admired him. Belief in him is perhaps the one thing that you have left. I'm sorry to have to destroy You're that. You're forgetting my gun, Miss This Cutler. cigarette case, I paid $480 for it, was, uh, was one installment of the blackmail that I was paying David. Blackmail? What could David have blackmailed you about? A little thing, but David was clever. He knew how to make a little thing loom large and black. What a rotten, nasty lie. With David dead... Betty, listen to me. Really, I feel horrible about this, but there's no reason for any of this to, to become known. David is a chapter in both our lives that we can both put behind us. It's easier for me, of course. I'm well-known, successful. I have a great deal to look forward to. And you... Uh, will you let me help you? You can't. You worked with David in the shop, didn't you? How do you know? Just a guess. You'll want to continue the shop, and for that, of course, you will need money. Of course, but I can... Let me give you a check now. A check? For $5,000. You rotten, contemptible... You think you can buy no, me? No, I want to help you. I owe you that help. Please take it. All right. If you put it that way. My dear, I'm glad you're facing reality. Yes. Every woman has a sharp eye for the real things in life. 
Maybe mine's sharper than even I thought. You wait just a moment and I'll get you that check now. Miss Allison! What? Captain Scott! What did she say to you, Miss Allison? Captain, would you believe me if I said I'm very glad to see you? Look at this. Huh? Pay to Betty Allison $5,000. Ruth Cutler. She paid you this so you'd keep quiet about the fact that she knew David Ashman before she shot him, right? I was going to kill her. But when she offered me this, I, I knew she was scared, hiding something. I took the check to help you find out what. Smart girl. Here's what's to be found out. What was Ruth's real connection with David Ashburn? And if he had something on her, why didn't she pay him off instead of killing him? I have no proof yet that this isn't manslaughter. But I'm sure of one thing. She didn't shoot a stranger in self-defense. She murdered a man she knew. We'll continue our drama in just a moment. CARE's new 550 food package contains many of the essentials now lacking in European diets. For while post-war recovery is widespread in Europe and crop prospects are good, malnutrition has not been ended and inadequate diets demand all the aid you can give. For 550, CARE sends to the person you name in any of 11 European countries an assortment including two pounds of ham, a pound each of rice, cheese, peanut butter, and coffee, 14 ounces of condensed milk, a half pound of chocolate, and six ounces of soap, plus six assorted spices. CARE's regular $10 food package contains meat and sugar, shortening, flour, preserves, rice, dried milk, chocolate, coffee, and other commodities, totaling a net weight of 22 and a half pounds. A $10 package for infants contains food for the first three months of life, another a complete baby layette. And there's a clothing package with all the supplies and materials to make a man's wool suit. Orders placed with CARE in New York are airmailed to a CARE warehouse overseas, nearest to the recipient. This economical operation, together with CARE's enormous buying power, result in savings for you and in the delivery of more food to the friend or relative you name. To order, send names and addresses of recipients together with your name and address and check or money order to CARE, New York. That's CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. Now, we return to Under Arrest. Yes, Ruth Cutler had committed murder. But why? What was the connection between her and the dead David Ashburn? I put shadows on Ruth herself, on Betty Allison, and on Big Bill Oliver, who was Ruth Cutler's key man. That's how I knew that an hour or so later that same evening, Big Bill's smart gray and silver coupe carried him to the Ritz Park Apartments. I watched him go upstairs. And the plain fact of the matter is, Ruth, if I want to be a success in politics... And you do. I've got to clean up my personal life. And what does cleaning up your personal life mean? The way the boss put it to me, this was some weeks ago, of course, he said, um, Commissioner of Parks and Buildings first. Two years more, Congress from this district. After that, the Senate. And it's all in the bag. The big boss still talking. Yes. Yeah. It's all in the bag if there's nothing in my private life that the blue noses might object to. Very well, Bill. Good night. And goodbye. What? Goodbye. <laughs> you might wait until you get outside to laugh at me. <laughs> Ruth, darling, sweetheart. I'm not cutting off from you. I want to marry you. <laughs> I want you to be Mrs. Bill, then Mrs. Commissioner, and finally, Mrs. Senator. You're contradicting yourself, darling. Me? How can you clean up your life by marrying a woman facing a charge of manslaughter? Oh, you're going to get off. Everybody we know is sorry for you on your side. Yes, still... Besides, a man like me needs a woman like you. Charm, brains, quick wits... Beauty. And a newspaper column in which to write about her prominent husband. Oh, nonsense. You accept? No. What? I'm only 33, Bill, and I'm still very attractive, even without a newspaper column. Ruth, for heaven's sake. I think you need me more than I need you. What do you mean? Bill, my hand. Oh. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to hurt you. 
But what do you mean? I need you more than you need me. I simply mean that I haven't heard you say I love you. I could kill any woman who bargains over feelings. I hope you're just kidding. I have some pride. We can take care of that right now. and It'll prove how much I want you. You're going to marry me or I'll smash that alibi of yours. Alibi? You told Scott you were with me the day he said you met Ashburn on a road in Pennsylvania. You wouldn't force me to marry you. I want you as my wife. Is it a deal? I dare say you and I were meant for each other. Very well, Senator. It's a deal. <laughs> That's a girl. Now let's have a drink to celebrate. No, you go home. Anyway, get out of here. I'm driving out to my cottage for the rest of the night. I need some quiet and some time to think. <laughs> I saw Big Bill leave, grinning happily to himself. He drove off, followed by Lieutenant Larry Gavin. I was about to go upstairs to see Ruth Cutler when she came down, got into her car, and drove away. I tailed her all the way to her cottage about 15 miles out. I gave her a few minutes to put on the lights and open the windows, and then I went in. I came here for a few quiet hours to myself, Captain Scott. Am I to be hounded this way? Apparently, yes. I need a drink. Will you join me? Never when I'm working. Well? I'm working. We'll work away. I'm going to drink alone. What was David Ashburn blackmailing you about? Now, you forced that girl to tell you what I said, didn't you? I asked the first question. Well, it's not quite true that that man was blackmailing me. But you did know him before. No. Mind if I have my drink? I felt terrible over killing that man, Captain Scott. When that poor girl came, I felt I wanted to do something for her. But she hated me, even wanted to kill me. I knew she wouldn't accept a gift, but if I led her to think that she was getting something out of me... You invented that blackmail story. Yes, to get Betty Allison to accept my help. Wow. What? Wow. I can't put it any other way. You expect me to believe that? She took the check, didn't she? <laughs> okay, here's another hot one for you to handle. How did this gold cigarette case of yours come to be in David Ashburn's possession? Give it to me. Easy, easy. The last time you saw it, Betty Allison had it in your apartment. But you let her walk out with it. You forgot it. That's a dangerous sign. Forgetting. You know, you're making too much out of nothing, Captain. How? Well, David Ashburn must have been in my apartment once before last night and stolen this. Sure you won't have a drink? Okay, Miss Cutler. Good. Bourbon and... Uh... But plain water. Mm-hmm. What do you think of my little place here, Captain? Charming. Come here often? Whenever I need a rest. Here's your drink. Thanks. I lead a very frazzled sort of life, Captain Scott. Parties, balls, social events of all sorts, contending with society people. Then why do it? Looking at me, Captain, would you think that I was born in a poverty-stricken family of seven children in the slums of Chicago? Were you? Not quite. Almost. And there's one thing I've always wanted. You might call it... recognition. As what? Hmm, a leader of society, maybe. Do you enjoy having power, Captain Scott? I don't know. I don't have very much. Power is the only thing worth having, Captain. It can bring you anything you want. How you doing? <laughs> Honestly, not very well. Something always turns up like this present tragedy in my life. Uh, speaking of things turning up, you'd better get yourself another alibi for that day you were supposed to have met David Ashburn on the road in Pennsylvania. I don't understand. An alibi is going to be very important when you face court, Miss Cutler. 
You said get in another alibi. What? Yes, uh, something always turns up. What turned up this time is murder. Murder? For about two years, Big Bill Oliver went around with a notorious girl named Honey Cashmore. Oh. Got so bad his political superiors told him to clean up his life. Honey Cashmore was murdered on July 7th. Yeah, the day you say you spent with him. And it's quite probable that... <laughs> that he, he killed her? Coincidence. Mm. <laughs> the day you need him as an alibi, he needs you. Uh, what um, evidence is there against him? It happened in the next county, and the police there tell me they may have a good case. They may. If the court breaks you down, that would finish Big Bill. And your own alibi would go at the same time. And on top of that, you'd uh, face a charge of perjury. Things always do turn up, don't they? I... Obviously, Captain, I'll stick by Mr. Oliver. I've promised to marry him. Well, <laughs> I'll be on my way back to town. And uh, here's my drink. You thought I'd stop working when I took it. Sorry. It's untouched. Hello, Bill. Yes, yes, Ruth, well, what is it? You stay in your apartment. I'm driving as fast as I can get there. I've got to see you. I followed Ruth Cutler back to town. She drove straight to the building Big Bill Oliver lived in and went upstairs. She certainly had murder in her heart because Big Bill had trapped her on that alibi, but she was walking in on a man who was also capable of murder. I wanted Ruth Cutler alive. I was only 30 seconds behind her going up to Oliver's apartment. Oliver, I... Uh, Captain Scott, I... I'm glad you... Uh, What's the matter? What's wrong? Come in and... Uh... Shot. Dead. Stop where you are, Captain Scott. Drop your gun. Uh, I see I'd better, Miss Cutler. Get out of my way, Captain. I'm not moving out of your way. I'll kill you. Like Ashburn and Bill Oliver? This gun is power, and I'm not afraid to use it. It's the only power you've got left. The only friend you've got left. Everybody is against me. You're sick, Ruth. Only sick people think everybody's against them. What you mean is you're against everybody. Yes. Yes, I am. And you're against truth. The truth is, you were married eight years ago to David Ashburn in those slums of Chicago you told me about. Later, you left him and you told him you'd gotten a Mexican divorce. And when he found out that was a lie, he came to see you and you killed him. That's ridiculous. It isn't true, any of it. Look, I've been in touch with the Chicago police. All right, it is true. I was ashamed of him. Ashamed I ever married him. He was a dead weight on me, a dead weight like everything. The real dead weight was lies, Ruth. You lied to Ashburn, then to me that he was a prowler. Stop then that. you lied that you were with Big Bill Oliver when you were not. Stop it, and I said. And then the stories to Betty about blackmail and to me about wanting stop to poke Always a spur of the woman's Stop it, I'll stop you. You can stop me, but not the truth. Truth wears seven faces, but you can't hide the truth. Give me that gun. There. Give me. Everything. Everybody's always against me. Not everybody, Ruth. Just you. <laughs> Because most of all, you lied to yourself. And now you've got to answer for two deliberate murders. You're under arrest. Captain Jim Scott will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's case. Meantime, let me remind you that regular care packages are delivered to 12 European countries, including France, Great Britain, Poland, the western zones of Germany, Greece, Belgium, and the Netherlands. They also go to Japan, Korea, and the island of Okinawa. Care special 550 thrift food packages can be sent to any of these countries with the exception of Poland and Japan. Wherever your friend or relative lives in these areas, care guarantees delivery and returns a signed receipt as proof. Endorsed by President Truman, Herbert Hoover, and General Eisenhower, Care operates to serve, not to profit. That's why you get top value when you order overseas food packages through Care New York. Either Care's 550 thrift package or a regular 22 and a half pound $10 package will be welcomed by your friends and relatives overseas who may still suffer from inadequate diets. <laughs> Thank you. 
Captain Jim Scott speaking. Next week, I'm taking you on a roping, a term used to break a counterfeiting gang. I call it the case of queer money. You'll find it unusual, daring, and dangerous in my fight against crime. You have just heard Under Arrest, presented by Mutual and starring Joe DeSantis as Police Captain Jim Scott. Today's case was especially dramatized for Under Arrest by Paul Milton. Original music was composed and played by Milton Cade. Heard in today's cast were Joan Alexander, Joan Tompkins, and Louis Van Ruten. All names of persons used in Under Arrest are fictitious. Any resemblance to the names of actual persons, living or dead, is coincidental. This is Jack Farron speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. First row, he's right over there. Oh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, how are you, Leonard? Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Uh, how do you feel? Pretty good, I guess. A little uncomfortable keeping my arm up like this. Yeah, well, how long will you have to keep the cast on? About four months, the doctor said. Hmm. Bullet shattered the bone, and they had to put a new piece in. Oh, that's tough, fun. You think you got the guy? Well, if it's the same one you picked out of the month, file. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call up a number, then name and charge. If you have any questions or identification, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. <coughs> the officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, keep it moving right over here to the end of the stage. That's it. Now turn and face front, hands to your side. Now when I call your number, step out and talk up so the people in the back of the room can hear you. All right. Number one, Elliot Pusher, it's tough. Where do you live, Elliot? Out in 54 West 108th yep. Street. That Number apartment? three. Yeah, an apartment. The small the guy. Apartment. That's the guy. You work? sure? I'm a yeah, commercial I fisherman. I He's the one that was driving. Oh, wait till he well, comes up. Yeah, I, I want you to be really. positive. Okay. What started the fight? The guy made a remark. What did you hit him with? A gaff. That's the sharp hook, isn't it? Yeah, I use it to haul in fish. You gaff him. Who was the man you used it on? The guy who works for you me. You found any of the other men, Lieutenant? No, I don't even know who they are yet. Well, that third guy up there would know. Uh, yeah, if he's the one. So he is. I was a cop for a long time, too, you know. I got Number memory. Two, he drove that Robert. car. Where do you live, Pete? 433 and a half North Lincoln, Sergeant. Where do you work? I ain't been. Where did you work? Friday. Right, used to be a fighter. Lightweight. A little heavy now. Any weapons? Huh? Any weapons on you when you were arrested? No, I just climbed into the place. I didn't want to hurt nobody. Where are you from, Pete? Detroit. I've been here a couple of months, I guess. I couldn't find nothing to do. Can't fight no more. Got blind in this eye. Did you have a car? No. Where am I going to get a car? Okay, Pete. Step back. Yeah, okay. Number three. Cully Price. Armed robbery. Where do you live, Cully? Lexington Avenue. 774 North Lexington Hotel. That's him. What's your business, Cully? 
No, sir. Come on, talk up, Collie. I'm not working. You have any weapons on you? Yeah, 38. 38 what? Revolver, automatic? Automatic. And you people out there hear him? Oh, no. no, no. Now you heard what I said, Collie. Yeah. All right, talk up. It's a long way to the back of the room. Sure, okay. You own a car, Collie? No. You were driving one at the time of the robbery? I wasn't in no robbery. You sure that's him? Where are you Absolutely. from, Collie? I was closer than this when he drove away. Sergeant Graham? Yes, Lieutenant. Call number three for interrogation. You uh, want to play squash tonight? Sure. Just you and me? Well, Quine and Asher are on duty. Maybe we can pick up a couple of others at the club. You're going to lose. <laughs> like the last time? Oh, I was tired. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, hello, Kelly. Oh, how are you? Would like to make this short? Okay. It's up to you. I didn't do nothing. Now, you just listen. Okay. The Spartan payroll was struck up. So what? Just listen. Four men wearing masks walked in and walked out with $100,000. A guard was shot, but he got a good look at the driver of the getaway car. Mm. Can I smoke? Nope. Okay. The guard says you were driving the car. Yeah, he's blind. You don't want to make it short. I want to make it plenty short. Just take my word and let me go. That's short. He picked you out of the mug pile before we hauled you off that bus. And so we made a mistake. Okay, Cully. Now, look, I'm telling you the truth. I wasn't You're in no rap. You're a time loser. Yeah. One more rap, you get life. Oh, you're going to work, huh? You've been here before. You know the routine. Yeah, and it don't scare me. Where'd you get the $5,000 you had on you? I won it. Where? On a horse. What horse? Uh, sound off. What race? I, uh, what race? What track? Fifth. What track? I don't know. I bet them all. Look it up. What were you doing the day before yesterday? Stayed home. Who was in on the robbery with you? I wasn't in no robbery. Who were you driving the car for? I wasn't driving no car. How much did you bet on that horse? Huh? How much did you bet on that horse? Enough to win me 5000 What were the odds? I don't remember. I bet every day. What day did you bet this horse? Uh, yesterday. We picked you up getting on the bus at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, No. No, no, it wasn't yesterday. The day before? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Where did you bet it? Out of, uh, out of books. I thought you said you stayed home. Well, I went out. A guy can't stay in all the time. Who were the other four men in on the stick-up? I don't know what you're talking about. You read the papers, don't you? I didn't read about no robbery. You must have bet a lot of money to win 5000 Yeah. Where'd you get it? I had it. Won it. I do pretty good on the race. What was the name of the book? Look, I don't want to get in no trouble. You were identified as the man driving the getaway car. I tell you, I didn't drive no car. Where were you going on the bus? Out of town. Where? New York. No, no, I, I, I wasn't driving no car. I was, I wasn't in sure no you were. No. Who were the other four men? I don't know. Look. Can I have a drink of water? No. You were in your apartment that day? Uh, yeah. And you went out to the bookmaker? Uh, yeah, yeah. What else did you do? I, I, I stayed in all day. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was tired. I, I listened to the race. Didn't you go out for food? Yeah, no, no. Who were they, Cully? Who were the other men? There, 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 there wasn't any other men. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You'll get life, Cully. For what? For what I didn't do? We've got enough to convict you right now. All right, then do it. Do it. Go ahead. We want the other four men. Uh, Give us their names. Nuts! Tell me some more about that horse you won 5000 The race is all the time, huh, Tony? Yeah. Yeah, all, all the time. You want one, Ben? Yeah. Uh, look, can I... Can I please have a drink, huh? Uh, yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, 
How come you only got five thousand out of a hundred thousand dollar job? I, uh, I didn't get the try from a job. I got it better. Come me. on, Cully. Okay. Who were the other four men? Uh, Lou Holstetter, Jack Fascio, David James, and Martin Fleischman. Fleischman. Yeah, yeah. He just got out two months ago. He, yeah, he, he, he figured the job. He would. I got a flat five grand, and they split the take. All I did was drive. Now, now, give me a drink of water. I'm, I'm losing my voice. We'd be up here. You get out on APB? Yeah, yeah. Descriptions on all of them. I hope we get Flashman first. He's so smart he never argues. <laughs> He'd just tell us who the rest were. You ready to get beat? I'm ready to find out if you can. <laughs> okay, serve it up. All right. What do you mean, Lucky? Sure was. Uh-oh. Yeah. In here, Quine. Oh, I'm just getting started. Well, you're lucky, boy. I felt it tonight. Yeah, you can't even get out of your own way. Oh. Hello, athletes. <laughs> What's up? Uh, the patrolman thinks he's got fascio spotted. I got the building stake out. You, you want to come along, or should I take it? We'll come. We got time for a fast shower? You can take it after you get fascio. If it is him, he's in a steam bath. Oh, well, we might even stick around for a rub down. Booth on the end. Okay. You go on back to the front. Hey, uh, there's customers near the booth. Ain't gonna be no shooting. He's getting a rub down, isn't he? Yeah. Where's his clothes? In the other room. Well, I don't think he's got a gun with him. Quine, go check his clothes. Okay. Show me. Yeah, sure. Get up, Fascio. Hey, look, you guys. Relax. You ain't relax. got no business. Let's go, Fascio. I sure these guys got one, Mr. Fascio. Police. Huh? Oh. Come on, Fascio. Yeah. Sure. What? Hey, who's going to pay for this mess? If I had known I was going to get this kind of a workout, I wouldn't have suggested squash. <laughs> Teamed with the phrase household word is the name of Bing Crosby. For years, Bing has set the styles in American music. You and your entire family are invited to join Bing every Wednesday evening over most of these same CBS stations. That's Wednesday night, Bing's night on the air. The Bing Crosby Show, an American listening tradition. We have uh, been puttering in your garden, Fascio. You sure have a green thumb. Huh? Eighteen thousand dollars we dug up, Fascio. In an old empty grapefruit can. <laughs> Imagine our surprise. Uh, I don't trust banks. Well, your circle of friends, I don't blame you. You've never been such a smooth operator, Fascio. How come your end was so much more than Cully's? Who's Cully? Oh, look, let's not play hide and seek anymore. I already got a blister digging in your devil grass. We've got a signed confession from Cully. It's only a matter of time until we get your playmates. Martin Fleischman, Lou Holstetter, and David James. Right, Fascio? Now, do you still want to waste time? And I recommended Cully for the job. Five grand he got. He ain't made that in two years. Why, when I run into him, he was tending bar in some sloppy saloon. 
I took him to see Marty, got him a suit of clothes, loaned him a hundred and let him sleep on my couch. Had to get her clean, too. Crummy bum got hair oil all over the upholstery. <laughs> Ouch! You'll have to stop talking through your nose for a while, Fascio. But don't stop talking. Where do we find the rest of the boys? I don't know. I don't get hasty. I just don't know. Holstetter was leaving the state. James, I never knew before. He was Marty's idea. What about Marty? Marty's smart. You'll have trouble finding Marty. Where'd you see him last? Look, Lieutenant, I'm not trying to be difficult. I know when to play it cozy. It's just my nose hurts. Well, I'll have the doc look at it again, Fascio. After you tell us all you know. Teletype from Illinois, Ben. They picked up Halstetter. Good. See, I told you he left the state. Pick a couple of men. Send them up on extradition. Right. Well, three down, two to go. Where's Fleischman, Fashion? I mean it, fellas. If I was you, I wouldn't know where to start looking for Marty. He's covered up good if I know Marty. Only he doesn't know we're looking for him yet. What are his habits? What does he do with his spare time? Well, he reads a lot. Ancient history he likes. I used to meet him at the library once in a while and drive him home. He never learned to drive. Which library? Big one in Central. But he wouldn't go there now. Marty's too smart to go anywhere for a while. Matt, put a stake out on every library in town. Right. It's uh, worth a try. Ah, you're wasting your time. Marty's too smart. I'd sure like a smoke, Lieutenant. Wonder if it'd hurt my nose. Oh, yeah. Try it and find out. <laughs> Using a different brand of coffee? Well, it was that instant stuff. I thought I'd try it. Says emptying the grounds. You like it? Well, it's not bad. Did I tell you Molly's going away for a week? Yeah, where? Oh, visit her mother. It'll do her good to get away for a while. Well, what are you going to do? Well, I thought we might. Uh... I got a whole setter out here, Ben. I'll oh, bring him in. Come on, whole setter. Lieutenant Last Gabriel. time she went away, you were like a lost puppy. Yeah. Hello, whole setter. Sit down. Thanks. Glad to have you back. You should let us know when you leave town. Look, I'm not in the mood. Get to it, huh? All right, Holstetter. We want a full confession on the spot and hold up. Do we get it now or later? Huh. We've got Cully and Fascio signed and sealed. Your name is very prominent in the statements. So? So don't be a fool, Holstetter. We don't need your confession. You just do yourself a favor. Huh. Yeah, you're a lucky boy. That guard's still alive, fella. Not the way you planned it. I didn't shoot a... Go ahead, Holstetter. You were saying... Guthrie. Yeah? Are you sure? Then don't take him unless he comes out before I get there. Yeah. Come on, Matt. We may have Fleischman. You'll excuse us, won't you, Holstetter? This is Fleischman. You boys will have a fourth for bridge. Sergeant Quine will entertain you while you're gone. Huh. <laughs> Sure, it's Flashman, all right. Trollman on the beat spotted him. I went up and took a look. He's in the ancient history section. What's the setup? Well, it's not very crowded in there. I was afraid to send too many boys up. Get suspicious. I've got two men in there with him now. One man in the hall. Two men up there at the entrance. Anybody with him? Didn't spot any. Just sitting there reading. Let's take him. Room at the end. You at the play squash? Oh, some. Same? Yeah. Yeah, that's Fleischman. Is there something I can do for you? Please. Stay here, Asher. Fleischman? Keep it quiet, Fleischman. I certainly. I was just reading the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. You know, Lieutenant? Read it in school. Should read it again. Very interesting. Let's go. I'm surprised to see you boys. Very frankly, didn't expect it. Let's go. Is this an arrest? A spot and payroll. We've got everybody but David James. Oh, sorry, miss. 
All right, boys. Oh, uh, I'll have to return this book. Okay. Thank you, Miss. Oh, why, yes, certainly. I'd like to check it out, but I'm afraid I couldn't afford the overtime. Good day. Good day, sir. I'd like to find David James. Would it help me? Might. I'm quite sure you can find him on his boat. His boat? He lives on it. David is a sort of a seagoing hermit. Doesn't care much for people. Where's the boat? The end of River Street, South Landing. It's registered under Smith. All right, let's have your right wrist. Certainly. Uh, it rose and fell. Rome? Fleischmann. Which one is it? Catch one right down there. End of the slip. On the left? Yeah. Okay. You better get off the dock. Might be some trouble. Trouble? Police. Take him with you, Asher. Let's go, Pop. Hey, you want Smith? I'll tell you all about it, Pop. Let's go. Okay. Pretty open. I will just call him out. If he doesn't like the idea, give it to him. Uh, maybe if we got on that other boat across the slip. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. all over me. God, God. Now keep your head down. David James! James! You're boxed in. Come on out with your hands up. He doesn't want to cooperate. James! All area surrounded. You haven't got... Everybody okay? Yeah. I got a face full of wood. Give me that Thompson. You'll throw slugs all over the bay. I'll aim low. James! We'll give you one more chance. Come out with your hands up. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Put that thing away. Throw your gun out. There he comes. Both hands up, James. I can't. You hit the other one. Walk over this way. Okay. Okay. You guys sure ain't got no consideration. My boat is full of holes. All right. Give me your wrist. That's a six thousand dollar catch. You ruined it. Be at the bottom of a couple of hours. Look, friend, we did you a favor. After you do your twenty years, you just get seasick anyway. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb. Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, then even charge. If you have any questions or identification, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identification, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure the suspect have his help, the officer will put your name on the The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, is written by Blake Edwards and Dick Quine, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Jim Nusser, Harry Lang, Eddie Marr, Junius Matthews, Ray Hartman, Dave Young, and Mary Shipp. 
The lineup is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Gregory Peck is your star on Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills this Thursday night. Mr. Peck will star in a suspense drama as up-to-date as tonight's radio news, a story that deals with narcotics and sales to teenagers. Be listening for Gregory Peck when suspense is heard this Thursday on most of these same CBS stations. Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Tonight's Gangbusters presents the case of the Chicago Tunnel Gang who dug their way to thousands in stolen currency until their ringleader's passion for saving a dollar put them in the hole. Gangbusters has asked Lieutenant Thomas J. McGrath, retired of the Chicago Police Department, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Thank you, Don Gardner. But first, I'd like to mention that one of your Gangbusters listeners, a Missouri sheriff, just last Sunday apprehended a murder suspect from Ohio whose description he had first heard on Gangbusters. I think that the sheriff and gangbusters deserve a lot of credit for this latest assist to law enforcement. Well, thank you, Lieutenant McGrath. As a matter of fact, we hope to have the sheriff himself tell the story of this capture to our gangbusters listeners on a later program. But now, how about tonight's case? Well, Don, this case had its beginnings in the city of Chicago just about a year ago on a cold, windy morning. Inside the candy store she ran, Bella Mama, as she was known... Straighten the magazines left poured over by the kids who dropped in on the way to school to spend their nickels playing her punch boards. She heard a bell on the front door tinkle and looked up to see a slightly built red-haired man come in out of the cold. Hello, Bella Mama. Oh. Lean out. If you expect warm, go to Florida. Uh, it's coming, don't worry, it's coming. You got a scratch sheet yet? You know 11 o'clock comes the scratch sheets. Hey, hey, I, I just straightened out the magazines. Keep your hands off, huh? Okay, okay. Got to do something waiting for Nick. Nick's here in the back. He told me he's going to get a haircut. He's getting a haircut in the back. You're kidding. In Joliet, they teach Harry the trade to be a barber. So Nick lets him practice and saves a few cents. Yeah. Don't make any difference. Let Harry butcher him. Save a few cents. That's important, huh? Sure, oh, it's important. Yeah, I know. In back, huh? I just tell you, no? Yeah, bring me a scratch sheet when I get here, will you, Bella Mama? I bring, I bring. Hello, Nick. Come in, Red. Hold your head still, will you, Nick? Yeah, through, Harry. I'm getting nervous. Okay. You're next, Red. No, thanks. What's the matter? I'm doing a beautiful job on Nick. Just get through and keep the hair from running down the back of my neck. So you'll take a bath. Uh, be careful about them baths, Nick. They run up the water bills. You got some objection to saving money? I make big, I spend big. A ten-cent tip to a barber, I think nothing about it. Okay, you don't have to get wise. Is everything sent? Set as it'll ever be. Okay. I want a clean job. Hold still, Nick. Yeah. Well, spell it, Red. The works. It's an easy mark, Nick. Fifteen or twenty thousand. No less. How much? Cut the hair. Okay, but after that haul, I'll throw the scissors right down the sewer. Let's have it, Red. The money wagon gets there about eleven o'clock in the morning. Maybe a few minutes sooner, a few minutes later. And the burglar alarm? Two cashier's cages. Foot button in each of them. Foot button? Hey, that's not good. Cut the hair, will you? The guy can't even have an opinion around here. What about the gift shop next door? Yeah. That's the ticket, all right, Nick. It's a one-man outfit. The guy opens up for business about nine in the morning. Okay. We do it that way. Will we have any trouble getting in the gift shop? None that I can see, Nick. There's a window in the alley. Two minutes with a Jimmy, and we're inside. Hey, what's the gift shop got to do with this? We're taking the check cash and outfit. What do we want with the gift shop? Finish the haircut, will well, you? Tell Harry? me what the gift shop has got to do with it, and I'll finish the haircut. 
You think that's the only thing I got to do with this is, is, is cut your hair? You know, I got a stake in this thing, too, you know. We got a burglar alarm to worry about. We can't walk into the joint and heist it just like that. One of those cashiers will step on the button. Well, what do you need the gift shop for? You tell him, Red. Tell him yourself. Well, somebody tell me. Look, we break in the gift shop the night before. So? We go to work on the wall. What war? What war do you think? The war between the gift shop and the check cashing joint. Oh. We cut it down to a thin layer of plaster. The truck delivers the money bags, the truck goes. We take a sledgehammer, knock out the plaster, and we're in the joint. Well, what's the matter? Walking in the front door is too simple for us? We gotta make it a big production? Look, we knock out the wall, we're in back of the cashier's cage. We can see that they don't put their foot on the button. We make a cleaner getaway. Well, I don't know. Hey. What about the guy that runs the gift? Oh, he won't shoot. That was neat, Nick. Neat. Shut up on the names. If I come back and get him tied. Yeah, come on, Red. Go on, do it yourself. He won't give you any trouble. But he's heavy. He's do it big... yourself, will you? We gotta work this thing out. All right. Come on, you jerk. Gotta get the sign up. Okay, right away. Wait a minute. What? The money truck pulls up at 11 o'clock. About then, yeah. You go outside and wait for it. Uh, it's almost two hours. Go outside and wait in the street. And give me the high sign when the money truck pulls away. Okay, boss. Going no place. Okay, grab one of them sledges. All right, I got mine. Now stand back. Hey, get easy, will you? Get on that side. Here, you mean? Yeah, there. Okay. You all set, Red? I'm set. Okay. Now, when I give the word, both of you knock out the wall. I'll jump through with the gun, and you come right after me. Yeah, yeah, come on. Come on, give the word. Get set, Harry. I'm set. Okay, knock it through. <laughs> there she goes. I says I'm coming through. Come on, get him up, all of you. Lady, keep your foot away from that button. Go on, keep him covered. There's the door in the back. Get it. You bet your boss. Okay, Ollie, move to the back. Go on, move. Come on, come on. All right, in the closet. All of you. Get in there with him. Go on, you. Shut it. All right, lock it. Yeah. You got the door? Yeah, come on. Come on, let's go. Well, what does it come to, Nick? Let me add it, will you, Red? Two, uh, yeah, 14,332 and some change. Who needs a change? Come on, cut it up. Why don't you wait for Harry to get back from dumping the car? He'll get his. You take it and you cut it three ways. <laughs> Just a second. Where are you going? Just a second. Bella Mama. Yeah, Nick? Come here a minute, will you? Sure, Nick. What's the matter? Come in, come in. What's the idea, Nick? Tell him, Mama, how would you like to make a fair scene out? This is a real morning? What do you think it is, jelly beans? Listen, Bella Mama, when Harry gets back here, tell him things got awfully hot. A couple of cops were around. Uh -huh. Red and me, we flew to the hotel. And that he should wait until tomorrow morning and give me a ring on the telephone. Okay? Why, Nick? You want your scene out? Sure. Then never mind why. Give her a hundred, Red. Okay. 20, 40. 60. You take the 100 and tell Harry, huh? 80. Okay, Nick, if you say. 100. Here you are. 20, 40. That's all there. Go on, Bella Mama. Get out front. Sure. You want a spot sheet, Red? Yeah, bring one in, will you? He ain't got time for horses today. Go on, Bella Mama. Yeah, I'm going. What's the pitch, Nick? Well, Harry's good for cutting hair, but he wouldn't know what to do with this kind of dough. He worked, didn't he? He's got his slice coming. Don't seven grand sound better to you than four and a half? A little better. Harry won't be so pleased. Well, start him along. I got another job just like this one. It's all set. We could use his help. Then, the kiss off. Hey, look, uh, you do this to Harry, maybe you got me in mind. Now, Red. Don't give me that now, Red business. I know how you are with a buck. We'll cut it half and two right now. There's plenty of time. We'll cut it half and two right now. Okay, if you want it that way. Yeah, I want it that way. 
What happens about Harry when he wises up? What's the matter? You don't think there's enough water in the lake? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I guess there's plenty. But we need him on the other job, so we stall. Okay, Ben? Yeah, okay. Come on. Let's split it half and two. So, Don, within an hour after this sensational robbery, the ringleaders were already planning to dispose of the weakest member of the gang and share the money between themselves. But what criminals consider a weak link often proves the strongest wedge for investigating authorities. Lieutenant McGrath, you were telling us that a gang of bandits led by Nick Lococo held up a Chicago currency exchange and robbed it of a large sum of money. That's right, Don. And the first move of the police was to thoroughly question the witnesses in the case for information that might lead to an identification of these men. The next morning, Captain Rogers of the Chicago detectives went to the hospital where the gift shop proprietor was taken for treatment as a result of the blow on the head he'd received. While the victim rested, Captain Rogers sat alongside his bed attempting to get facts that would be valuable in the investigation. Now, Mr. Klein, uh, how much of a look did you get at these men? Well, not much at all. I'm afraid they hit me almost as soon as I walked into the store. Would you be able to recognize any of them if you saw them again? Well, the one that dragged me back, I don't think I'd recognize his face, but when he was pulling me, I did notice something. Oh? Well, what? Well, he thought I was unconscious, and I wanted him to think I was, so he wouldn't hit me again. But when he was dragging me, I noticed he had a tattoo on his arm. Uh huh? A which arm? Um, let's see now. He's pulling me backwards. He had... Yes, it was the right arm, between the wrist and the elbow. Do you remember what kind of a tattoo it was, Mr. Klein? It was a girl, I think, a bathing beauty. You sure of that? Well, I'm pretty sure, Captain. Well, I think this will be a lot of help to us, Mr. Klein. If anything turns up, we'll be in touch with you. Hello, Bellamont. Oh. Hello, Harry. Say, it's, it's not safe here. Look, I don't care what's safe anymore. I'm trying to locate Nick. Well, I didn't see him since yesterday, not since the cops was around. You, um, you didn't call him at the hotel? Yeah, I called him, but he ain't there. I, I gotta get in touch with him. He's got something of mine. You know, Harry, I, I like to help you, but I don't know nothing. <sighs> okay. Give me a change for a quarter. I'll try to call him again. Sure. You, uh, ain't seen Red either, huh? No, neither of them. Listen, Harry, the cops was here. You'll get in trouble. Give me the change. Sure. I'll try him once more. How do you like that? I'll get it. Okay, Harry. Hello, Bella Mamas. Let me talk to Bella Mama. Is this Nick? Harry? Yeah, it's Harry. I've been trying to reach you all over. What do you think I've been trying to do? I want my dough. Red and me, we had to fly. We think we're hot. We spent last night in Kankakee. And you had to leave me. Well, listen, I need the dough. Where can I meet you? We decided to pull another job tomorrow in Cedar Grove. We'll pick you up tonight. You know where. Yeah, I know where. But what about now? I want my end. You'll get it. You'll get it. We take what we get tomorrow, add it together, and split up the whole business. But I need it now. Be there tonight. We'll talk about it. What's to talk about? You be there. Oh, come on, Nick. Let's start splitting up the dough right now. This is the second Listen, job. Listen, Harry, right now we got more to think about than splitting up. There's a million cops in the neighborhood. The traffic's pretty bad, eh, Red? It ain't good. Well, look, this is the second job I broke my back over, and I ain't seen a dollar yet. Pull over right quick. Yeah. Well, what's the matter? Listen, Harry, the traffic's heavy. Three guys in the car looks bad. Now, go on. You take the street car to Bella Mama's. I'll call Now, wait Go on. Minute. Make it snappy, will you? Every cop in town is headed this way. Okay. Give me the score. I'll take it to Bella Mama's. Get going, will you? We can't yeah, stand here. Nick, go I... on. I'll phone you in an hour. Okay. But be sure you do. <laughs> You'll phone him all right, Red. You'll never want to talk on the phone again. Cashier made an identification, the guy with the tattoo. Oh? Yep. She nailed one picture immediately, Harry Wagner. This one. Ah, oh, good. Good work, Sergeant. Have you got a line on his present whereabouts? Now, the records show his last address to... Oh, I'll be right with you, Sergeant. Captain Rogers. Oh? Where? Cedar Grove? Cedar Grove. Okay. We'll get going out there. See you. 
Come on, Sergeant. What's up? Another currency exchange stick-up. Same tunnel game. Let's get out there. I'm right with you. Hello? Is this Bella, Mamas? Yeah, is that you, Nick? Yeah, it's me, Harry. Where are you, anyway? Never mind where we are. Well, then listen, where can I meet you? I want my end. What end? What end do you think? The dough from those two children? Hey, what's going on? That's too much money for you, Harry. Now, listen, Nick, I got a right to my cut. I'll give you a right to something else. Now, get your things together and get out of town. Out of town? Yeah, and the farther the better for you. Oh, please, Nick, give me some of it. I got a right. Didn't you just hear me tell you to blow town? I don't leave without my cut. Okay, Harry. I'll send a couple of guys over to see you. What for? What for do you think? You're going to get pushed. No, Nick. Don't send no guys. I'll, I'll get out. Just give me a chance to go home and get my stuff together. I'll give you nothing. Well, Red, you like the way I handle it? Not too well, no. You think you could have done better? He got his cut. Why scare him to death? You might want another free haircut sometime. The more he's scared, the faster he's out of town. Nick, you're a wonder. With Harry. But just think twice before you try something like that on me. Open up, Harry. Open up. Let's push the door in, Sergeant. Looks like that's the only way we'll get in. He's got it bolted in the inside. All right. Together. <clears throat> All right. Once more. It's given. Again. <clears throat> okay, Harry. Don't... Must be around someplace. He... Hey, the closet. Watch him now. Okay, Harry. Come out of that closet. Come out of there or we'll shoot through the door. Come on. Now, listen, Grab guys. <laughs> Let go, guys, please. I'll get out of town. Tell Nick you can keep my cut. I'll get out of Hold town. On, <laughs> no, look. Tell Nick I don't want to get pushed. I'll get out. He can have... He can have my end. Your end of what, Harry? The tunnel jobs? You. Who are you guys? He didn't send you, did he? You're law. Yeah, Harry. We're law. Well, what were you saying about Nick? Nick? Nick, I, I don't know any such guy, Nick. Oh, well, you don't, huh? Well, come on, let's go downtown. We'll see how much you do now. Red. Hello, Nick. How you doing? Sit down, Red. Thanks. Are you buying the drinks? You got plenty of dough. So have you. Listen, for the last time, don't make any more cracks about me being tight with a dollar. Okay, okay, forget it. You hear anything from Harry? No. Did you? He must have left town, okay. So I'd say. Look, Red, I got another guy lined up and another job, prettier than the last two. What do we do with the other guy after job? Dump him like Harry? Maybe. Or is it me this time? Now, oh, Red. Just watch your step, Nick. Harry and me are entirely different guys. In more ways than one. Hey, Buck, on it. Over here. Well, Captain... I'd say Harry don't know any more than he's told us. Nothing doing on that hotel address he gave for Nick, huh? No. Nope. Nick checked out three days ago. And Red? Him, too. Well, I guess Bella Mama's candy store is the only bet, huh? But it's a good bet. Okay. Keep a set up on the place. One of them's bound to show up there sooner or later, from force of habit, if nothing else. When one shows up, he'll lead us to the other. Hello, Bella Red, you don't like Bella Mama no more. Oh, I love you, Bella Mama. I love you like a mother. But I don't see you no more. Eh, you know how things are. I got a fast moving business. Uh huh. How's, uh, how's a Nick? Oh, he's fine, fine. The richer he gets, the more worried he gets about breaking a dollar. <laughs> and, uh, Harry? Well, I don't see Harry much anymore. Mm -hmm. Hey, you got a racing phone? Sure, Red. Help yourself over there. Goodbye. Here's a couple of good ones going tomorrow. Bella Mama, don't play the horses. That's the only thing I don't like about you. 
You remind me too much of Nick. Uh, uh, keep the chain. Hey, Nick. Yeah? What's out in Willamette? The job, Red. What do you think? You sure nothing else? What do you mean? I just want to tell you. I got about 20 bucks in my pocket. And that's all. Well, what's that got to do with it? Plenty. Did I got an idea you're going to get me out there and pull a gun? Now, Red. Don't now, Red, me. You don't think I'm dope enough to cart around that ten grand with me, do you? I told you, this is a job tonight. Okay, partner. This is a job tonight. Take the other bridge, Red. Uh, got... Huh? What's the matter? I think we're being dug. Yeah? Yeah, it's sedan in back. The two guys. Cops, you think? Hold on, we'll find out. They're staying with us. Yes, sir. Give them more, Red. An awful lot of traffic. Here they come. It's cops, all right. Hold on, I'm going to take the turn. Watch it, Red. They're going to crowd us. Let's go. Go on, hurry. Police officers, stay where you are. Come on. Oh. Okay, copper. Okay, don't need to be moved. What's the idea? Shake them down, Sergeant. Yep. You keep your hands up. All right. That's more like it, Nick. Nothing on him, Captain. Except that racing sheet from Bella Mama's. Okay. Go on. Walk over to the sidewalk. Go on. Walk, he said. And that, Don, was the end of this notorious gang of tunnel bandits. The ringleaders are now serving maximum terms of 40 years each in the Illinois State Penitentiary at Statesville. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Thomas J. McGrath, for this most enlightening case history. And gangbusters congratulations to all the members of the Chicago Police Department who participated in the investigation leading to the arrest and conviction of these dangerous criminals. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Soft Touch. It is 11 a.m. on a Sunday in August 1949. A blue sedan comes to a stop in front of a ranch house 30 miles from the town of Salt Flats, Texas. Come on, kids. This is Grandma's house. What? Bill, huh? Bill, let them sleep. We started so early, they're tired. Well, we can't leave them in the car. <laughs> if we wake them up now, they'll never finish their naps. We'll bring them in in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Getting up at 4 a.m. was kind of early, even for them, huh? <laughs> Hey, look. Pa's painted the windmill. Mm. Oh, Bill, I love this place. I wish we didn't live so far away. Yeah. We don't get here often enough. Hey, wonder where the folks are. They usually stand in the middle of the road waiting for us when they know we're bringing the kids for a visit. Mm, the door's open. Your mother's probably in the kitchen cooking enough food for a dozen. Yeah. Don't smell anything cooking. Ma? Pa? You home? Maybe they're still at church, Bill. No, they're always back by 10 o'clock. The garage door was closed, too. Pa always leaves it open when he's got the car out. Oh, then they must be in back someplace. Yeah. Hey, Ma? Pa, where are you? I've never known your mother to be any place but in the kitchen, Bill. Yeah, but she doesn't hear so well anymore. Let's take a look. All right. Ma? Hmm. Nobody here, Judy. Bill... 
Bill, what's that spilled on the floor at the door to the pantry? Huh? Hey, Judy, it looks like blood. Bill. <laughs> Ma! Ma! Oh, good Lord. Ma! Dad! Oh, Bill. Bill, honey, come away. Come away. <laughs> brutal murder of the rancher and his wife was reported. Texas Ranger Jace Pearson was notified by shortwave radio. He reached the ranch house less than one hour after the bodies were discovered. I'm sorry to have to ask questions at a time like this, Mr. Ross. It's all right. My, my kids are asleep in the car, though. Mind if my wife takes them into town? I won't leave you here, Bill. Please, honey, I'll be all right. I don't want the kids to come in here or even know about this. Might be best, ma'am. I'll, I'll meet you at the hotel later. All right, honey. Better tell me anything you know, Mr. Ross. Yeah. Well, we drove out from Fort Worth this morning. That's my home now. I'm a commercial artist. This is the first time we've been here in five months. Hello, Sheriff. Howdy, Ranger. Your wife told us to come right in, Bill. I sure am sorry. Yeah, it's, it's... Might have known something was wrong when I didn't see your folks at services this morning. They never did miss. You better go on with what you were telling me, Mr. Ross. With nothing else to tell. Judy noticed the blood in the kitchen by, by the pantry door. Okay. Better take a look at him, Sheriff. All right. Uh, just one thing more, Mr. Ross. Your parents have any enemies you know of? No. Jed and Martha Ross never made an enemy in their whole lives, Ranger. Say, you don't, you don't want me to go in there with you, do you? No, it won't be necessary. Just take it easy. Kitchen's here. They took a pretty cruel beating, Ranger. Yeah. No sign of a weapon, though. Here, help me move the old man's body a little, will you? Sure. Get easy here. Yeah. Hmm. A lot of heavy welts, but beaten to death and then put in here. Blood comes mostly from hemorrhaging, though, not so much from cuts. You'd think a weapon would have cut him up more than that. Unless it was wrapped in something. Only one other thing I can think of. Bare fists. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's this? Let me see. Well, just a little hunk of paper. Yeah, crumpled, too. Piece of a larger sheet. rest of it must have been torn away. It feels like a good grade of letterhead paper. Mean anything to you? Well, if we find the rest of the paper this came from, no. But if we don't, it could mean plenty. Like what? And the way this is crumpled might have been part of something the old man was hanging on to and somebody tried to get it away from him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send this into our lab at Austin. Looks like this happened sometime last night. That's something we'll know when we get an autopsy report. We called to have the bodies and the piece of paper picked up. Then we checked around the outside of the house. The gravel road wouldn't hold a car track. But behind the house, we found marks where a horse had been tied. I got charcoal out of the trailer, and the sheriff got a horse from the ranch barn. You went right toward the southeast quarter. Ross has 200 acres and cotton down there. Yeah, I see it. Might have ridden over there yesterday on one of his own horses. No, the horse that made this trail wasn't one of Ross's. Pony we're following has a spread hoof. Whoa. Look. See the marks? Mm. There's a bar across the frog on the right forefoot. Mm. Wondered why you were checking the shoes on the horses back there in the barn. Yeah, that's why. Who owns the adjoining place? Other side of the cotton. Big Chuck Whitaker. Now let's get moving. I want to have a talk with this Big Chuck Whitaker. Come on, Chuck. Here, here, boy. Yeah, I was over there yesterday afternoon, but I didn't kill nobody. Well, that's very interesting, Mr. Whitaker. Because we didn't tell you anything about anybody being killed. I know you didn't, Ranger. 
My phone happens to be on the same party line as the Ross Ranch. I heard their son Bill call when he found him this morning. You make a habit of listening in? I had a call to make. I picked up the phone and I heard. Couldn't help it. Now, if you're through asking questions, I'd like to go back to men this haunted. That can wait, Chuck. You're not exactly broken up about losing your neighbors. Ranger, I got troubles enough of my own. Why did you go to Ross's yesterday? And what time were you there? In the evening, just before sundown. Ross was fixing to have some crop dusting done again. I wanted to talk to him about it. How about doing the job for him? No, Ranger, the crop dusting plane comes down from Salt Flats. Oh, well, go ahead, Whitaker. Yeah, the last time Ross dusted a spray he carried over on my place. Some of my cattle watered down near that cotton. Made them sick. Yeah, Ross say he'd watch out for it? Yeah. And that was all? That was all. And I come home. All right, Whitaker. Come on, Sheriff. Uh, all right, Chuck. Yeah. Easy, boy. Yeah. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, Chuck. Hey, yeah, Chuck. Yeah, I just saw to something. When I left Ross's place just before dark, a car drove up as I came around the house. Well, who was in it? Man, that's all I know. You didn't see his face? No. The only thing that makes me think of it was something to notice. car wasn't from around here. Oh, how do you know? Well, it had one of them fancy frames around the license place. You know the things I mean. that got the name of the town stamped on it. Did you notice the stamp? Yeah. car was from San Antone. San Antone, huh? Thanks. Yeah. Let's go, Sheriff. Get up, Charlie. Help, help, help. Good thing he noticed that car and remembered it. Might be a big help. Yeah. Might be a big lie, too. That man's hard. He just acts hard, Ranger. Kind of sour since his wife ran off with one of his cow hands a few years back. But he don't need no harm. Maybe not. He makes a bad impression. He's liable to send more flowers to Ross' funeral than most anybody around. I've known killers to do that before, too. We checked other ranchers in the area, but we didn't get any information until next morning at the sheriff's office. Morning, Jase. Heard anything from your headquarters yet? No, waiting for him to call me now. Now, what's that, the autopsy report? Yeah. Medical examiner seems to agree with your idea. Death might have been caused by a beating with fists. Hmm. Pretty thorough job of beating. You read this? Yeah. Old woman died of a broken neck. Struck right at the base of the brain. Rabbit punch. Yeah. Old man Ross hemorrhaged to death, like you said. Broken jaw, broken nose. Ribs smashed in under the heart. Vessels ruptured from being beaten on the kidneys and in the solar plexus. I'd like to get my hands on anybody who'd do that. If you did get your hands on him, you'd have your hands full. Whoever did it was big, and he could hit. Plenty hard and in just the right spots. You still got Chuck Whitaker on your mind? Only because he fits the bill in a few ways. Never hurt nobody before. No, but he's a bitter man. That kind can... Excuse me. Hello? Yes, he's here. Here. For you, Jace. Captain Stinson calling long distance. Thanks. Hello, Cap. Hello, Jace. Got a report on the scrap of paper you sent in. Special type. The paper stock indicates the original sheet was a letterhead printed in the government printing office in Washington. You know which bureau? No, but we're checking. I try and find out if any department there has had any correspondence with Jed Ross recently. That's what we're doing. But don't expect anything in a hurry. I won't. Bye, Jace. Bye, Captain. You find out where the paper come from? Yeah, some government office in Washington. You been checking on that car from San Antonio? One Whitaker told us about? Hmm. Yeah. Nobody I found saw it. How about you? Nobody. Seems like the only one did see it was Chuck Whitaker. I hate to admit it, Jace, but it's beginning to look that way. Let's get our horses. I want to see Whitaker again. <laughs> When you've known a man all your life, you hate to think he's a murderer. On the other hand, you hate to see a neighbor get killed, too. Whitaker's telling the truth. He's got nothing to worry about. I feel mighty sorry for young Bill Ross. He was all busted up at the funeral parlor. Tough for him to take it alone, but he made his wife and kids go back to Fort Worth. He the only child? Bill? Yeah. 
Only one living, that is. Had a sister, Joan. Nice a girl as you ever see. What happened to her? She was a Navy nurse. Got killed in the Solomon Island during the war. Ross has sure had that share of trouble, all right. Kind of trouble somebody ought to pay for. Hey, look. There's Whitaker now on a pony coming toward us. Just rode out of the gully. Yeah. Get up, Charlie. Hey, boy. Oh, 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 boy. Oh, oh. You're coming back to see me, huh? That's right, Whitaker. You think I've been lying to you, don't you, Ranger? I take it easy, Chuck. Get one thing straight, Whitaker. I got nothing against you or any man, not personally. But I do intend to find the man who killed your neighbors. Well, then you can stop looking around my place. Sheriff, I rode out to meet you because your office call. You both wanted back in town. Why? Because I ain't blind and I ain't lying. One of the sheriff's deputies has found somebody else who saw that car from San Antonio. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. And now we continue with tonight's case, Soft Touch. We went back to town and from there to a roadside cafe about 15 miles out the state highway. Yeah, I sure did see the car, like I told the deputy. It had that thing, my jig, on the license plate. Noticed it when I gave him some gas. Are you sure it was on Saturday, huh? It sure was. About five o'clock, I'd say. I guess there's not much traffic from San Antonio comes through here, does it, Sheriff? Nope, we're off the main U.S. highways. Anybody coming down here on a state road would have to have some business around here someplace. You remember the man in the car? No, I sure do. After I give him the gas, he come in for some coffee. Mm, can you describe him? Oh, well, three days ago, but he's better than six feet, maybe 200 pounds. Then, of course, there was his face. What was wrong with it? Well, Sheriff, his face looked like he tried to bulldog a steer on rocky ground and lost. It sure was scarred up. He bleeding any place? Oh, no, Ranger. I didn't mean fresh scarred. I reckon he looked that way for a long time. And when he left here, he drive on towards Salt Flats? Sure did. Wasn't nobody else in here when he stopped and or when he left, so I didn't have nothing much to do, and I was watching when he drove off. He was going in the direction of the Ross Ranch, all right? Yeah. But who was he? That's what I'm going to find out, if I can. Uh, Bill Ross said he's a commercial artist, didn't he? Yeah, why? Because I want to bring him out here, get a detailed description of that face, and see if Ross can draw something that comes close to it. We sent for Bill Ross, but before he joined us at the sheriff's office, something else turned up. A long-distance call from Captain Stinson. We found out what that letter from Washington might have been, Jase. Good, Captain. Let's have it. Well, it might have been from the Veterans Administration. Answer to a letter Jed Ross wrote asking if they had any record of a United States Marine named Herbert Walsh. What else? Well, for some reason, Ross wanted to know if there really had been a Herbert Walsh in the Corps, and especially if he'd been wounded and hospitalized in the Solomon Islands. The piece of paper you sent in might have come from the answer the Vets Administration sent to Ross. What was the answer? There's no record of a Herbert Walsh, Jace. Does it fit anything? I don't know, Captain. But the Ross has lost a daughter in the Solomons, a Navy nurse. Oh, Bill Ross just came in with the sheriff. I'll get on it. Bye. Bye, Jace. Uh, Ross, hmm? does the name Herbert Walsh ring a bell with you? Why, uh, yes. Yes, Ranger, it does. My father told me about him in a letter two months ago. You know who he is? No, I never saw him. Folks wrote that he stopped by the ranch and told him my sister had taken care of him in Solomon's before she got killed. Is that all? No. According to my father's letter, Walsh gave my folks the idea that, well, that he and my sister had been very close. Had your sister ever mentioned him in letters to your folks when she was overseas? Well, they couldn't remember, but we were awful fond of my kid sister, Ranger. Anybody who'd known her would have found an open door with my folks. Somebody found one, all right. Too open. What do you mean? There isn't any Herbert Walsh. What? But my pa gave him some money. When? Did he write to you about that? No, but I've just been going over my father's affairs. In the past two months, he loaned Walsh several hundred dollars. I have the canceled checks. 
Where are the checks? At the lawyer's office on the corner. I want to see where those checks were cashed. Come on. Jase, you figure this watch is a phony working the old war buddy racket? Of course he is. But with a new angle, a dead girl. What do you mean? I mean that families of servicemen and women open their hearts too easily to strangers they think might have been close to somebody they loved. You mean Walsh killed my family? Your father must have suspected him. He wrote to Washington and found out Walsh had never been in the Solomons or the Marines. And when Walsh came the last time, your father called his hand with a letter he'd gotten from the VA. Here's the building where the lawyer is. Here are the checks, Ranger. Four of them, total of $600. Hmm. Endorsed by Walsh. Cashed for him by merchants in San Antonio. That car came from San Antonio, Jace. That sure fits. It sure does. Let's get out to that cafe and get that sketch drawn up. like that around the eyes. It was, uh, marks around the eyebrows. Uh, she means scar tissue. Oh. See, your eyes deeper set then. Hmm. Like this? Oh. Yeah, sure would. Ah, uh, the nose didn't come out so far. It had a, a kind of a dent in the middle. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like that? Hey, that's fine. It's real good. If somebody knew the man, would they recognize him from that? They sure would. That's almost a spitting image, I'd say. Thanks a lot, ma'am. You're sure welcome. I'll take that, Bill. Thanks again. Uh-huh. Come back. Well, you ain't the prettiest fellow I ever saw. I don't know. My folks said that, too. But Walsh told him he'd been in a Jap prison camp and treated bad. Walsh was lying. If Walsh is his real name... Must have got beat up someplace, Jase. Yeah, and I've got a hunch I know where. Who do you think? In a prize ring. The man who killed your folks was a professional fighter. You figure that just because of his face? And one other thing. Don't forget that autopsy report, Sheriff. That's right. Well, you remarked right then that the fellow who threw those punches knew what he was doing. I'd sure like to get my hands on him. Two old people and getting at him through my kid's sister. Think about your own revenge. The law will take care of that. Yeah. But no law can bring them back to life. Uh, drop you at the office, Bill. You and the sheriff. I, I'll be in touch with you later. Where are you going, Jase? Out of your territory. San Antonio. Right way, Joe. All right, come on, Chris. Throw that one too fast. Faster. Come on, roll with it. That's it. Oh, now, let me see, Ranger. Now, well, I've seen that face before. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, been some time, but he used to train here, all right. Heavyweight. Wait a minute. Hey, Pop, come here. Yeah. Oh, come here, Mike. Pop is the world's oldest fight fan. Knows every fighter in his record for the past 50 years. Maybe he can tell you something. Yeah. You know, what can I do for you? You know a man who looks like this? Yeah, I've seen him before. His name Walsh? Walsh, nothing. That's Eddie Polar. I never did amount to anything. Had a punch like a bull ox, but no science. Wide open for a left hook. Had 31 fights and ended yeah, up... fine, Pop. Hold a hold, hold. Huh? Range, you don't care about all that. Huh. The main thing I want to know is, when did you see him last? Oh, six, seven years ago. Well, that long ago? Oh, ain't long enough to suit me. Bull never should have been allowed in the ring. He wasn't the kind of fighter that loved the sport. He, he liked to hit men to ruin them, that's what. And you have no idea where I might find him? Well, not me, Pop. No. Well... Thanks for your help. Yeah, you're welcome, stranger. Why, sure. Glad to help, Ranger. Hey, hey. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Ranger. Yeah? I, uh, I just remembered. There was a gal Polo used to hang out with. The name was, uh, uh, uh Dolly. Uh, D Dolly Richards. Uh, she might, uh, know where he is. Well, you know where I might find her? Well, she used to work in the box office of the Empire Theater. Uh, that's all I know. Thanks. I'll try it. Uh, you, uh, planning to arrest Eddie Polo? That's my plan, all right. Why? Well, don't surprise me none, you understand, but uh, let me give you some advice. Go ahead. Watch yourself in the clinches if you find him, Ranger. He's tough with nine miles on paved road. He's bad medicine. And he won't be fighting by the rule books if he knows you want him. Thanks, Pop. I'll be careful. Yeah, being careful ain't enough. Get off first. 
Remember, he's a sucker for a left hook. If he gets a chance to hit you good, he won't stop till he kills you. I checked the Empire Theater for Pola's girl, Dolly Richards, but she hadn't been seen for years. I put through a call to headquarters asking them to check auto registration for one in Pola's name. It was late afternoon when Captain Stinson got back to me by phone. The car he was using must have been stolen, Jace. There's nothing registered in that name. You checking for a criminal record on him? Yeah, but there's nothing in this state. We're checking with other states, though. I just sent teletypes off. I'll have to wait a while, then. Nothing else you can do, Jace. So long. Hey, uh, wait a minute, Captain. What? Uh, Take one more crack at the license bureau in Austin. See if they have a car registered to Dolly Richards. Dolly Richards? Who's she, Jace? Paula's girlfriend? She was. Let's hope the torch is still burning. I didn't move from the phone until the captain called back. This time he had something. Here it is, Jace. Car registered to Dolly Richards. Texas license T49753. Her address is RFD number 4 on Farm Highway 73. It's a turnoff north of Tilden. Well, that doesn't sound right to me, Captain. The car I want had San Antonio marked on the license plate frame. That's still all right, Jace. Dolly Richards bought the car six months ago from a San Antonio dealer. Frame might have been on there. That's better. Any out-of-state record on Pola? Not yet. You want to wait another hour or so? No. You can give me word by short wave. I'm heading toward Tilden. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10. Go ahead, KTXA. Report on subject Eddie Pola. Served three years Leavenworth, impersonating Army officer and using mails to defraud. One year Oklahoma State Penitentiary for fraud. One year Louisiana assault. 10-4, 10-4, Unit 10, clear. KDXA, Austin. I took the turnoff north of Tilden, headed for the sprawling country ribbon by Farm Highway 73. It was midnight when my headlights picked out the mailbox and the name D. Richard. I left the car on the road and slipped up to the house. It was dark. I knocked. Eddie, all right. Don't blow your top. What a tired kitty. Ola isn't oh. home, huh? Paula? I don't know anybody with that name. You can save the static, lady. Where was he last Saturday night? He was right here with me. During the late afternoon and evening? You heard her, Ranger. Oh, Eddie, I, I didn't know you was in. He knocked and I thought you'd forgot your key. All again, right, so... Dolly, shut up. Like we said, Ranger, I was here last Saturday. I know somebody who says you weren't. Described you well enough for this to be drawn. Good likeness, too, Pola. I was here. What are you going to prove with a drawing? I'm not going to prove anything with a drawing. But I'm going to have an eyewitness prove that you were near Salt Flat Saturday when Jed and Martha Ross were murdered. Murdered? Shut up, Dolly. Forget to tell her about that part of it, eh, Pola? Maybe you forgot to tell her about the checks to Herbert Walsh, the Marine the VA never heard of. Where's that letter you ripped out of the old man's hand? All right, Ranger, I'll show you. Come in. Yeah, it's over here, and... Ah! The old boy at San Antonio Jim told me you were open for a left hook, Polo. I don't try that again. Get on your feet and turn around. You too, miss. Why me? So I can cuff you together. What are you taking me for? For harboring a murderer. To give you a chance to decide whether you want to stick to your story or tell the truth. All right, move. Dolly Richards turned state's evidence against Eddie Pola. Pola was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death in the electric chair. And now, 
Now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Many years ago, a group of Texas Rangers had a showdown battle with a notorious band of killers. Several days later, the Rangers assigned to the case staggered back to their headquarters, showing the marks of combat, many of them badly wounded. The captain of the company, too impatient to wait for a written report, went to the barracks where the men were cleaning up and tending to their wounds. What happened, the captain asked. There was silence for a moment as the Rangers looked up at him. Finally, one of them said, Oh, nothing much, Cap. We had a little shooting match, and they lost. Good night, folks. See you again same time next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trent. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Fries, Mike Barrett, Tom Tully, Bill Johnstone, Byron Kane, and Virginia Gregg. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 250. At the dollar line docks in Wilmington. See the officer. That's all. Rose and Cliff. This evening, Rio Grande presents Murder on the Left with the well-known feature player of stage and screen, Grant Withers, as Don Colby. The other day, I heard an old-timer say, I tell you that Dad burned automobiles to blame for most of the crime, and the varmints had to make the getaway on horseback. He couldn't get so far. Whether he is right or wrong, friends, this much is true. Law enforcement officers in California use good automobiles and the best gasoline money can buy. More fire engines, ambulances, and police cars are powered with Rio Grande cracked wherever it is sold than any other brand. California state and federal government officials also use Rio Grande crack to power their emergency public serving equipment. Benefit by the split second starting, swift acceleration, the top power and speed, and amazing mileage of this better gasoline. So, friends, if you're getting anything less, if you want real police car performance in your car, Set your compass for the nearest red and white Rio Grande station and get it with Rio Grande Cracked, the most highly recommended public-serving gasoline in the West. Salient facts regarding our program tonight have been taken from records on file in the Los Angeles Police Department. We have therefore asked Chief of Police James E. Davis to open our program. Chief Davis. It is the duty of every police department to furnish to its citizens as much protection as it can. Sometimes the work of a local peace officer will carry him far beyond the limits of his local jurisdiction. In such instances, it is necessary that he cooperate with local officials in whatever political division he may find himself. For after all, crime knows no political boundaries. Needless to say, crime is no more profitable outside the United States than it is in any of our local communities. The story we are to hear tonight took place in a foreign country, one that has always been friendly toward the United States in matters of law enforcement. We are proud, therefore, that one of our own officers could be instrumental in helping bring about the solution to the case. I shall have more to say regarding this at the end of the program. Our scene opens on a bright April morning in 1930 in the office of Captain James Bean of the Los Angeles Homicide Detail. Captain Bean, here's a letter I got with my mail this morning. And frankly, I I don't like it. I see it. Hmm. Unless you leave $5,000 in unmarked bills at the viaduct on La Cienega Boulevard before noon tomorrow, you won't be able to finish that picture of yours. 
Any idea where this came from? No, not the slightest. It was on my desk this morning when I came in. Have you got any enemies? Enemies? <laughs> Do you know the motion picture business? Who hasn't? Did not this come through the mail? Apparently not. Here's the envelope. It didn't have any stamp on it. But it was with the rest of my mail. Anybody in your organization who might have sent it? Well, I, I don't know. I just ran space in the studios where we've been shooting the picture. <laughs> what worries me is this. This is the third note like this that I've had left on my desk in the last three weeks. Well, why didn't you come in here before? Why? Well, I... <laughs> I didn't want any publicity to get out about it. You see, there are several things I wouldn't like to come out right now. And if a lot of publicity breaks, well, uh, there's no telling what might happen. Well, I don't exactly see where we come into the picture, Mr. Fish. Huh? No crime has been committed as far as our department is concerned. So if you'd like, we will assign an officer who can act as sort of a bodyguard. Well, that's fine. <laughs> that's exactly what I wish you'd do. And, uh, by the way, I'll... <laughs> I'll be willing to pay his expenses and pay for his services, Oh, that won't be necessary, Mr. Fish. It's our job to protect people. Well, that's fine. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, Captain, uh, there's one more thing. Uh, my company and I will be leaving in a couple of days for a little place in Lower California. We're going to shoot some scenes down there for our South Sea picture. In Lower California? Sure. We've got a swell location down there. <laughs> down close to La Paz. And what I wanted to ask you was this. Will it be all right if we take this officer along with it? Oh, sure. I've got a young fellow here who would be tickled to death to go. His name is Filkus. Jill Filkus. Silkis? That's fine. I got a radio set by that name. <laughs> hey, you see, we'll only be gone a couple of weeks, but I don't want to take a chance on anything happening. A week later, the producer and his small company are preparing for work in sweltering heat in Lower California. Now, look here. You better go easy on them drinks, Dennis. This ain't Hollywood. You're in the tropics now, and whiskey in the tropics don't mix, you know. Ah, oh, don't worry about me, J.K. I never missed a picture cue in my life yet. That's Colby here. Isn't that right, thou pal? He's right, Mr. Fish. He's never missed. Yet. Sure, sure, but we got an important story conference tonight at my hotel. Carol Gifford's demanding a change in the script. Oh, and... what's the matter with that girl? Go temperamental again down here, huh? Look, J.K., I'm the star of the South Sea picture we're making, see? Not Carol Gifford. That dizzy blonde sure, dame. Doesn't... Sure, sure, Dennis. You're the star. <laughs> but you see, it's too late to make a change in the cast now. We start shooting first thing in the morning. Oh, and I... all right, all right. I'll yeah. be at your story conference tonight. We'll start shooting in the morning. Only go on away now. I'll let a couple of pals drink in peace. Okay, will you? but <laughs> you better show up tonight to La Paz Hotel, room 400. Yeah, 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 yeah. La Paz Hotel. They have their hotel service and bellhops and flunkies even down here. Yeah. Here, have another drink, Dennis. Yeah. Why can't they let their hair down and take a beach cottage like you and me, Don? This is the life. A grass shack, beach at your doorstep. Sure. Finish your drink. Of course, the rocks cut your feet if you're not careful like it did mine this morning. It hurts, too. Still, this is the life, boy. Go on. Finish your drink. Okay. And uh, down the butt, Carol Gifford. I... <laughs> Sorry I blew up about her. Seems how you're kind of stuck on her. I didn't mean to. Oh, skip it, Dennis. Carol doesn't even know I exist. Showed me as much on the boat coming down. Yeah, have another drink. Yeah. What do you mean she doesn't know you exist? Just that. She's got a star complex. Goes out with star players only. Huh? All the others don't count with her. What do you mean, star players only? Well, you're just as much a star player as I am, maybe. Well, you are. But I've never been starred in a picture yet. Second leads only for me, so far. But someday I'm gonna... Look here, Colby. You got this stuff it takes to knock them over at the box office. Well, man, you got everything. Looks, personality... Yeah? <laughs> well, it hasn't gotten me anywhere, Dennis. Anyway, let's forget it. Here, have another drink. A real one this time. Yeah. Mm. What about you? Where's your glass? I just finished mine. Besides, I haven't your constitution. You can take it. I can't. <laughs> you bet I can take it. And you know something, Donald, pal? What? Oh, when we get back to Hollywood, I'm going to see that Sam Goldman gives you a break. Real break. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis, but it's no use. Mm -hmm. No. It's no use. i got to make my own breaks. And it's got to be away from Hollywood. Yeah. Away from Hollywood. <laughs> Sorry to be late for the conference, Mr. Fish, but you see There's I... There's Dennis Clark. Didn't Dennis come with you? Well, that's what made me so late, Mr. Fish. I tried to sober Dennis up, but he was too drunk to come. Too drunk? And after me wanting him to keep sober. 
Of all the nerves. And on my picture, too, or that. I'm sorry, Miss Gifford. I tried my best to keep him from drinking, but he wouldn't listen to me. Kept on fighting for the whiskey. Uh, this is a fine how do you do. 500 miles on location, and he's got to get cockeyed. He'll ruin my picture. That's what he'll do, Sam. Well, if there's anything I can do, Miss Gifford. Oh, no, there's nothing you or... Hey. Sam, I've got an idea. What? Again? Why don't you use this fellow here? This, uh, this, what's your name? Uh, Colby, Don Colby. Oh, yes, Don Colby. Use him in Clark's place, Sam. He's just as tall, he's just as good-looking. Colby? No, 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 not Colby. But why not? He hasn't got a box office name, that's why. He's too risky, Carol. But I'm sure I can turn in a good performance, Mr. Fish. And I know you won't regret giving me the break. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you and Clark were pals. Well, we are, but business is business. And that's what I say also, Sam. You know that. You can't mix social life with a career. Or can you? If Dennis Clark prefers to guzzle yeah, whiskey... Yeah, 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 I know, Carol, but this is no time for experiments. I got a quarter-million-dollar production on my hands. Five hundred dollars my own money. And if I don't use Dennis Clark... Okay, well, have it your own way, darling. You're the producer. But if it was me... Yeah, I'll... yeah, yeah, sure, I know, I know. But look, Carol, and you too, Colby. We got a lot of work ahead of us. Come on, let's go over the script. Clark can get the changes first thing in the morning. You can sober him up by then, can't you, Colby? Yeah. Yeah, I think I can. You think you can? Well, I mean, I know I can. Yeah, that's better. You won't have to worry about Dennis, Mr. Fish. I, I'll i start working on him as soon as I get home tonight. Midnight and still drunk. The famous Dennis Clark stood to the gills. I'll snore on, fella. It won't be long now. Getting you cockeyed didn't work as I hoped it would. Well, there's still another way. Yeah, the sure way. Come on, up on your feet, you drunken fool. Yes, sir, what's going on? Shut up and stand on your feet. Yes, I think. That's you, Donald, Donald. Well, yeah, it's your old pal Don, just back from the story conference at the hotel. And you're going to help me be a star, see? Don, old pal, old pal. Yeah, me. Me and you are going to do things tonight. I have a drink. Oh, well, later. First, I've got to set this clock back an hour and a half, back to 10.45. And then I'll tip this table over, whiskey bottles, glasses, clock and all, and the clock will stop at 10.45. Get it? It looked like you did it in a drunken stagger. <laughs> what are you celebrating, Donald, pal? Let me in. Let's have a drink. Give me a drink. Next, I'll tear down these door drapes, and that'll look as if you tore them on your way out to the beach. <laughs> there. The left drape. I mustn't forget you're left-handed, eh, Clark? How about a little drink? Let's have a drink. I want to celebrate, too. You get your drink, Clark. Here, lift up your foot. <laughs> Hey, what are you taking my shoes off for? Oh, we're going for a little walk, Clark. It's nice and cool outside, and you won't need these rubber sneakers. Oh, yeah, great guy, Don. You're a swell pal. A real pal. Yeah. Real pal. I got your sneakers off. We'll leave them here. Oh, take off mine, too. Uh, okay, let's go. Here, keep off the grass. Don't step on the sand. That's it. Along this lawn. Well, here we are, Dennis, the rocky ledge. There. Watch your step. Easy. Okay. Now get on my back. I'm going to carry you through the shallow water here, all the way back to a spot on the beach just in front of the shack. <laughs> piggyback. <laughs> all right, Don, old pal. Let's go piggybacking. Piggybacking, my old pal. Oh, don't shake so much. I don't want you falling off and getting your feet and your clothes wet. Here we are. Just the spot. Straight in line with the shack's beach door. Wait. Don't get off. I want your feet dry, not wet. What about that drink, Donald, pal? I need a drink. In a few minutes now, Clark. It's too bad you're too drunk to appreciate the details. Else you'd learn what a perfect crime this is going to be. Don't know how drunk I am. You won't be singing along, you fool. Not with your head deep in the water and your legs stretched out on the sand. Well, here you go. Feet first. Ah, that's perfect. Stretched out like a perfect stiff. Say, who hit me? Nobody hit you, Clarky, old pal. Just lie there quietly. You're going to help me to eliminate you. Help me to take your place as the star of the picture you're doing tomorrow. You want to help me, don't you? Sure, you want a drink. 
anything down, boy. Oh, boy, you fool. I'm going to kill you. And after you're stretched out here dead with your head in the water, I'm going back to the shack the same way I came. And I'm going to put on your shoes, your rubber sneakers, and then stagger like a drunk over the sand from the house to here. The last footprints will look as if you actually fell flat on your face, see? Like you fell headfirst in the water and drowned. Because when I'm finished making those prints in the sand, I'm going to stand on your body and lace your rubber sneakers back on your feet. Get it, Clark? The perfect Mm -hmm. murder. I want a drink. Hey, I want a drink. I don't want a whistle. Come on, let, let me have uh, it. Let's go get a little... It's right drink. here, a uh, belly full of ocean. Uh, <laughs> Jay, what, what? <laughs> it's cold. Don, what's going on? Ah, quick, Luke, you there? fool. Come it's too late now. Go. Get your head back under that water. <laughs> Gotta do it, Dennis. It's the only way fish will ever give me the lead in that picture. Yeah, quit your wriggling. <laughs> For God's sake, stop it. Get me. Ah, you've got to die. This sake. time your head goes under the stay. A couple of more minutes and it'll be over. One second. Two. Three. Five, six, seven. A few hours later, just before dawn, Mr. Fish is aroused by violent pounding on his door. Mr. Fish, wake up. Wake up, Mr. Fish. Yeah? Yeah, who is it? Who is it? It's me, Colby. Open the door, Mr. Fish. It's important. Please hurry. All right, all right. Then I get my bathroom on. Oh, what is this, Colby? It's a fine time to... Hey, what's the matter? You look like you see no ghost. It's it's Dennis Clark, Mr. Fish. He's, he's dead. What? Yeah, dead. Drowned. I saw him stretched out on the beach. I tried to revive him, but I couldn't. Uh, but, but, are you sure he's dead? Did you call a doctor? No, I, I came here first. I thought maybe... Well, we better get a doctor right away. Here, come on in. Close the door. I'll get him on the phone right away. <laughs> Hold the rotten brakes. That happened to me. This is... Hello. Hello, operator. Operator, get me a doctor, quick. What? I don't care if he is a French doctor. Any doctor. And I get him quick. Yeah, and rush him out to, uh, say, uh, what's the number out there? It's the only house near the Rock Ledge. Yeah, it's the only house near the Rock Ledge. You can't miss it. And ask him to hurry. There's a man with a quarter of a million dollars to me drowning there. Ask him to hurry, yeah. And operator, call Joe Filkus. I'll meet him there. Hey, uh, yeah, operator, have a taxi waiting downstairs for me. I'll be down in a minute, yeah. Well, Colby, this is a fine mess I'm in now. Here, throw me them pants, will you? Uh, I did what I could. I found him on the beach sure, like that. Sure, I... sure, sure. I know. I'm not blaming you. Only this is a fine time for him to get drowned just when I'm ready to start shooting. <laughs> Well, well, doctor, what's the verdict? You already examined him? Yes, and he's dead, Mr. Fish. Asphyxiation of the lungs. Asphyxiation uh, dead. Well, what's that? Drowned. Suffocation by water. And you mean that, uh, well, being drunk, he staggered out here to the edge of the water, flopped over, and was drowned? Apparently so, Mr. Colby. However, that's for the judge to decide at the inquest. Uh, careful where you step, gentlemen. The police will want to verify those staggering footprint markings in the sand uh, to establish the official cause of death, you know. God, this is terrible. Dennis was such a swell guy. A great pal. Yeah. And now your pal, my star, is stiff like a board. Just a black shadow on a moonlight beach. I'm going to send my driver up to the judge. I should be here any minute now. And the police? Naturally. Mr. Clark is a celebrity. The police won't miss out on this, you can bet. Is there any other member of your company that knows the deceased? Uh, questions to be asked by the authorities, you know. Well, yes, there, there's Carol, Carol Gifford. She was the co-star with Clark. Oh, we better not have Miss Gifford see Dennis like this, Mr. Fish. You know how upset she gets. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking of that. Uh, such being the case, gentlemen, as a doctor, I'd advise getting in touch with the lady before the police do. Oh, what sort of police do they have here? Well, I imagine, gentlemen, you'll find the police here quite an efficient call. Well, and that should be simple enough, a drunk having an accident. What do you think, Doc? Well, so far as my examination is concerned, yes. A simple accidental death. Oh, there's a car pulling up in front. That must be the judge now. Uh, out here, judge. Around the deck. On the beach. Oh, uh, hello, Dr. Farrell. Let me wrench it out to be out on a case, is it not? Two o'clock and just... Oh, hello. You have some friends with you, doctor. Mm, no, no. That is, uh, these gentlemen are friends of the deceased. This is Mr. Fish. How do you do? How and do this do? is Mr. Colby. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, uh, judge Padilla, gentlemen. You, uh, determined the cause of death, no doubt, doctor? Mm, yes. Asphyxiation of the lungs caused by an excess of water. Accidental? Apparently so. There being no head wounds. Of course, a further examination of the body itself might prove otherwise. Mr. Colby here says that the deceased was intoxicated earlier in the evening. Intoxicated? He was just plain drunk. Huh? Seems there is nothing more mystifying here than a very sad case of an unfortunate, if foolish, imbiber of alcohol. Yeah, that's fine. What did you say? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it's fine. There won't be any bad publicity. You see, we have a picture, a uh, moving picture. Of course, I read this much in the local papers. Oh, you did? 
Well, gentlemen, it's a bit chilly out here. If we can go in the cottage. Oh, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, come right in. And oh, Mr. Fish, uh, you'd better get over and get Carol. I mean, I mean Miss Gifford, and prepare for what's coming off. Carol! Carol! Who is it? It's me, honey. J.K. What do you want? I'm sleeping. <laughs> it's very important, Carol. Please, open the door. Oh, all right. Hold the horses. I'll be there in a minute. Well, what's so darn important about waking a girl up at 2.30 in the morning? It's about Dennis Clark. He's dead. What? Say that again. I think he's been murdered. Who? Dennis Clark. Dennis Clark. Dennis Clark? Well, are you sure? Who told you? Have you seen him? Oh, here, come in. Who told you? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, he's dead. Drowned like a rat. Drowned? Say, are you drunk? Clark murdered, then he's drowned. Is this your idea of a joke? No, it's no joke, honey. Get your clothes on. The police want to question all of us, you included. Police? Then you are serious. I'll say I am plenty serious, and you better not... Me? Uh... Say, you're not getting me into any mess, Clark. Clark murdered, and, and you want me, your own girlfriend, to stick a pretty neck right into it. Say, what have I got to do with oh, it? You don't understand, honey. I'm trying to keep you out of any scandal or excitement. That's why I'm here before the police get to you. Fish and Miss Gifford returned to the cottage where Lieutenant Filkus had begun an investigation. <laughs> right here, well, I guess everybody's here now. Uh, well, all right. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long, Lieutenant, but uh, Miss Gifford was quite upset when I went yeah, yeah, for yeah, yeah. That, That's okay, Mr. Fish. I <laughs> thank understand. You, thank you. Anyway, I was doing some private investigation on the beach. Good thing you folks didn't come too soon and disturb my investigation. But I thought all murder mysteries were investigated by the police. For the present, I've got this case. Uh, pardon me, Lieutenant, but I believe I'm no longer required here, so if you will excuse me, I should go home to bed. Oh, no. Uh, don't go to sleep yet, Judge. Wait a while. I think I'm going to need you for something pretty soon. But, Lieutenant, I have completed my examination. As far as I'm concerned, death was caused from asphyxiation of the lungs due to accidental drowning. Yeah, sure, Judge. Uh, looks like plain case of accident. Just the same. Stick around, please. I'm going to need you. Well, Joe, do you mind speeding up the investigation of that? Yeah, please do, Joe. I'm sure Miss Gifford would also want it over as quickly as possible. <laughs> Don't mind me, Lieutenant Turkis. Go right ahead. I'd like to see how you detectives uh, work. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'll... Uh... Show you how a detective works. Uh, well, Colby, uh, uh, go what have you got to say? Uh, go ahead. But I've told you all I know already. Dennis Clark and I were friends, pals. We lived here in the shack together. We've been uh, drinking together ever since we got here. Well, tonight was the same. Excepting that Clark wanted to get drunk. Said he didn't want to sit around listening to the story conference that Mr. Fish had scheduled for the night. Anything else, Colby? Oh, no, I don't think so. If you were pals with Mr. Clark, like you say, why didn't you stay here and get drunk with him? Why should I? I've got my career to think about. Ah, oh, I see. Now we're getting to the bottom of this case. I didn't say that. No, you didn't. That's something I figured out for myself. You were the second lead. So with him dead, you'd get to be the star. Have it your own way. I went to the conference and was there until close to midnight. Mr. Fish can confirm that. <laughs> that's right, Joe. Uh, Colby left close to midnight, all right. I didn't ask the time, gentlemen, but that's a good point. Good for you, Colby. Because when this clock I've got in my hand smashed on the floor, it stopped at 10.45, quarter to 11. So your time alibi is uh, perfect. Well, that's that. Yeah, looks like this is going to be an easy case to solve. Aren't you going to arrest anyone? I don't know. I've got some more questions first. Miss Gifford, was Mr. Clark uh, your friend? I mean, uh, a good friend? <laughs> well, I... Uh, you see, Lieutenant... Uh, what she means, Joe, is that uh, she knew Clark as a business associate. Yeah, business associate. <laughs> yes, <I know. laughs> Nothing personal about it, you understand? Nothing uh, personal uh, at all. <laughs> Just co-stars in the same studio, that's I all. I get it, I <laughs> get it. And, uh, Mr. Colby, Miss Gifford, uh, how about him? He means absolutely nothing to me. Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing, nothing. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jealousy, eh? Uh, what do you mean by that crack? Just this, Colby. You're in love with Miss Gifford. And she was more friendly with Clark. That's a lie. No, that's the truth. I can see it in your face. Every time you look at Miss Gifford, you look like a sick cat. Look here, you flatfoot. Are you accusing me of murdering my pal in order to get Miss Gifford? Oh, then you share my suspicion, Colby. You believe Clark was murdered. You know he was murdered. Joe, sure. I think you're right. I'm almost positive Colby killed Dennis Clark. What? You believe it, too? Of course I do. Yep, Mr. Fish believes it. But I uh, have some proof. All right, let's have it. How could I know Clark was murdered? I uh, have a piece of tape here. It's got a red smear on it. 
I found it near Clark's body on the beach. So what? This piece of adhesive tape slipped off a cut on Clark's foot. The left foot, under the heel. You see what I mean? Yet? No. No, I don't. I can prove uh, that there was a crime committed. Maybe. But what can a piece of adhesive plaster mean to me? It could mean a murder charge for you. You mentioned murder once before. Any proof of it? Plenty of proof, Mr. Colby. You mean you can pin it on Colby, Joe? I think so. Yeah. Well, I'm listening, but you better make it good. Go My ahead. My deduction is very simple. Although I admit that the single track of footprints in the sand had me fooled for a long time. Almost a half hour. They look so perfect, like a real drunk man could make. And the footprints match the dead man's shoe almost like a glove. It did look like a plain case of accidental drowning, like uh, Dr. Sorrell said. Well, go ahead. Well, after, I think some more. I decided the murderer had uh, walked through the water. Then he took off Clark's shoes, then made those perfect footprints. Then he stepped on the body to put the shoes back on. And when he switched the shoes back to Mr. Clark's feet, the piece of adhesive tape, which was inside one of the shoes, fell off in the sand in the dark accidentally. Now, that's impossible. No. No, it isn't. I've got it, Joe. Once you knew about the plaster gauze, you knew someone had unlaced Clark's shoes and put them on again. And after it was over, the murderer must have jumped from the body into the water. Mm-hmm. What the scenario? I'm going to film it right away. That's right. And the killer cut his feet on the sharp rocks in the water. You mind if we uh, examine your feet, Mr. Colby? Well, sure. Why not? No, no. The, the left one, please. Oh, very well. Well, there you are. Sure, I've got a cut on my left foot. Who wouldn't get hurt swimming out here? Well, well, even Clark had a cut, but that doesn't prove anything. Lift your feet some more, please. I want to look at the bottom of them. Oh, is that high enough? Yeah. And now you're under arrest, Colby, for the murder of Dennis Clark. Oh, oh no, you don't. I suspected this, and yeah. I'll kill you first. Same as I killed Clark. Stand back, you fool! <laughs> nice work, Doctor. You winged him nicely. Now I'll tell you why I ask you to wait, Doc. Please examine Colby's foot. No, not the rock cut. Just examine the left heel, Doctor. Isn't that a mercurochrome uh, strain on the uh, skin of the heel? Why, yes, Mr. Fulkers. It is McCurricum. Same as on this piece of adhesive plaster that uh, fell out of Clark's shoes, eh? Mm, Yes, yes, the same. Sure. And when Colby put on Clark's shoes, inside the left shoe was this piece of plaster with McCurricum on it. Colby didn't know that. He used the shoes. Then he switched them again. The plaster fell off. Well, Cinderella, it looks like you stepped into the wrong shoe. In just a moment, Chief Davis will conclude our program. And before Chief Davis closes this case, just a brief reminder that those who drive the most and know the most about gasoline depend on the police car performance of real Grandy Cracked and that the lubricant that can't break down is real lube, the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. You'll find them both at your independent real Grandy dealers tomorrow. And now, Chief Davis. Colby was arrested and turned over to the Mexican authorities. He was tried and given the sentence prescribed by law. Because of his American citizenship, however, his sentence was somewhat lightened. But so far as we know, he has never returned to the United States, nor did he ever reap any profit from his crime. Thank you, Chief Davis. Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 250. Suspect in this case delivered to Mexican authorities for punishment. And that's all. Rose and Quirk. Rio Grande has presented Murder on the Left with Grant Withers featured as Don Colby. This is your narrator, Barry Kroger, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI.
This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. To your FBI, you look for national security and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Big Breakout. criminals suffer from the same organic disorder, enlargement of the ego, and sooner or later it proves fatal to their career of crime. For as an ancient thinker once said, he is most vulnerable who believes himself invincible. For some criminals, one heavy prison sentence is enough to deflate their ego. But in tonight's case, from the files of your FBI... Earl Dixon accepted his first set of prison bars not as a defeat, but as a great opportunity to prove himself smarter than the law. In a Midwestern penitentiary, Dixon, serving a term for hijacking, and two fellow inmates are seated in their cell after the evening meal. Cigarette, gentlemen? Rock? Oh, thanks, Dixie. Louis? Yeah, if that's the best you can do, Dixie. Of course, I'm used to lighting a Corona after a festival. You're dinner, used to but... talking too much, Louis. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep the order chatter alive in our little home. Rock is a man of action rather than words, Louis. Well, you ain't exactly the gabby type yourself, Dixie. I've been interested in only one subject since matriculating here. <laughs> but you uh, ain't talking about it, huh? I never talk on a subject until I'm qualified by research. Mm. When'll that be? No. Oh, yeah? Then what's the title of your subject? Escape. Escape? Shut up, Louis. Are you gentlemen interested? Gee, Dixie, I don't know. I only got three more years here. Just the weekend, huh, Louis? No, no, it's not that, but guys can get shot trying something like that. I wonder what your girl is doing tonight, Louis. Yeah, what do you mean? Just curious. Well, I know what she better not be doing. What's that got to do with it? Three years is a long time to sit and wonder. Maybe it'll be too late after that. Uh, what about you, Rob? Count me in, Dixie. Good. We'll make it a twosome. Day. I don't know. Wait a minute. Yes, Louis. What did you really mean about my dame? I told you. Three years is a long time. Oh, she better not pull no double deal on me. <laughs> I'm in. Splendid. What's the gimmick, Dixie? Well, the doctor is on duty in the hospital until 11 o'clock. Yeah. He lives outside, drives home, and his relief comes. Yeah? Lights out in here at 9. The turnkey makes a round of inspection at 10. Uh-huh. Tonight, when he comes around, you... Hospital ward, Dr. Wilson. Oh, hello, Evelyn. Yes, honey, I'll be on my way home in about ten minutes. As soon as Dr. Blaney comes in to relieve me. Huh? Oh, sure, sure, I'll bring some. Okay. Bye, sugar. Uh, what are you doing in here? Keep a watch that door, Louie. Okay. Doctor's about your size, Rock. His jacket should fit you rather neatly. Just so it helps me drive us through the gate okay. Here you are. And do it quickly now. Yeah. I'll take a look outside. Everything's all right, boys. Come on. Quietly, please. All right. This is his car. Take the wheel, Rock. The way I'll crouch on the floor right behind you. Okay. Uh, 
All right. Make for the gate. Keep your head down. Uh, don't worry. I want to keep it. Okay, Doc. I'll open the gate. Leaving kind of early to... Hey, wait a minute. You're not the Doc. <laughs> Rock's head. I'll grab the wheel. Pull Rock over. Okay. You make it? Yes. Hey, Rock's head bad, Dixie. Really? Yeah, what, what can we do for him? Throw him out. Huh? I said throw him out. But he's still alive. Do as I say. Okay. Sorry, Rock. <clears throat> Gee, I hated to do that. Consider yourself fortunate. It could easily have been you. What do you mean? I had anticipated that whoever drove the car would get killed. After the jailbreak had been accomplished and the convicts had made a successful getaway, the penitentiary warden immediately contacted the nearest office of the FBI just across the state line, where Special Agent Connor took the call. Gray Pontiac, two-door sedan. License number? Seven, five, four, three. All right, I've got it. Which direction was it going when it left the penitentiary? Thanks, Warden. We'll get on it right away. Jailbreak, Fred? Yes, three made the break, but one got killed. Who were the other two? Take the names. Uh-huh. Earl Dixon and Louis Muncie. Louis Muncie. I've got him. While I'm getting out an alarm, you contact Washington and ask them to teletype all information they have on Dixon and Muncie. In Dayton, Ohio, a few hours after the prison break, two men walked quietly along a fog-shrouded street. They stopped in front of a modest apartment building. A minute later, a young girl occupying a ground-floor apartment was aroused by the insistent sound of the door buzzer. Just a minute. Oh. I'm coming. Who is it? Open the door. <gasps> Earl. Hello, sis. Earl, I... Go in, Louis. Okay. What are you... Be quiet. Lower that window shade, please, Louis. All right. Earl, what are you doing here? Okay, Louis. Yeah, all right. What are you doing here? How did you get out of prison? Quite cleverly. I escaped. Oh. It was a very monotonous life. I needed to change. Well, you don't seem very happy to see me. I'm not. Now, I ask you, Louis, is that, isn't that a shocking admission for one's own sister? Yeah. Oh, by the way, Annette, allow me to present my fellow Houdini, Louis Muncy. Pleased to know you. Why did you come here? It seemed a natural thing to do. Earl, you can't stay. Now, Annette. I mean it. You've got to leave here at once. Hey, what is this? I thought she was okay. She will be. Earl, listen to me. In the past, I've always weakened and tried to help you. Always thinking maybe you'd straighten out. But this time it's different. I'm not harboring any criminals. I'm staying, Annette. Oh, no, you're not. Where are you going? I'm calling the police. Hey, now, wait a minute. Hold it, Louis. What are you going to tell them, Annette? That you're turning your brother in? That you want him sent back to prison? Yes. Then I'd better acquaint you with just what that would mean. A man was killed when we escaped. Oh. Now, my dear, could you make us some coffee? Is that teletype from Washington, Fred? Yes, with the dope on Dixon and Muncie. What does it say? It looks like Dixon was the brains behind the break. Yes? College education and always boasting how much smarter he is than the law. What was he in for? Hijacking. Uh -huh. He was sentenced in federal court. Suspected of a killing, too, but there wasn't enough evidence to pin it on him. What about Muncie? They're just finishing up on him now. Here. Here we are. Uh, Muncie seems to be a kind of a stooge in a gang that was mixed up in hijacking, too. He'd probably stick with Dixon, then, for guidance. I wouldn't be surprised. Any reports on the fugitives while I was out? No. Mm, 
they could be clear out of the state by this time. Yes, that makes them our game more than ever. Any leads on Dixon and that stuff from Washington? I was just looking it over. It says Dixon lived with his sister in Cincinnati just before he was sent up. You know, he might make for there again. Mm, Wouldn't that be an obvious move? Well, since Dixon considers himself smarter than the law, he might think the obvious thing to do would be least expected. Let's get Cincinnati on the phone. We'll tell him not to wait until daylight to check up, but go out right now and keep a watch on her address. Right. Remember this piece, Annette? How I used to slave to learn it. As I recall, it was Mother's favorite... Stop, Bill, please. What's the matter? The difference between then and now, I... I don't want to think of it. Dear Annette, always the sentimentalist. Earl. Yes? How long is this going to go on? What? This staying here. Oh. Oddly enough, I was just thinking about that. Police are bound to come here sometime. You saw the morning paper. They're combing three states looking for you. I know. Oh, please, won't you give yourself up? Oh, stop being childish. What else can you do? I have a very definite plan in mind. You're right about their eventually coming here, but when they arrive, we'll be gone. What do you mean? We still have that little houseboat on the Ohio River. Yes. Then I think we should use it. We? Yes. You and I. Oh, no, please. I'll need you, Annette. You'll have to drive. Oh, why can't you leave me alone? It's very pleasant, like a vacation. Vacation with two murderers. Oh, I forgot to mention my good companion, Mr. Muncie, who sleeps so peacefully in your bedroom, will not be with us. Do you intend to leave him here? Not exactly. I don't understand. Well, he has already served his purpose. Where you are see, you, it... folks? Oh. Greetings, Louis. Well, I was just talking about you. Oh, yeah? Yes, I was telling my sister that we are going to take a little trip. Oh, blowing out of here? Yes. Where are we going? Well, unfortunately, Louis, you're not really coming along. What do you mean? I needed you for the getaway just as I needed Rock, but now your usefulness has ended. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, Louis. Oh. 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 Darling. He'll be with us in spirit. We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the FBI file on the big breakout. We'll return to this case in just a moment. Let's look at America through the eyes of a G.I. just back from the Pacific. He's flying cross-continent to his home in the east. Perhaps he's wondering what sort of job he'll land when he takes off his uniform. Well, no matter what route his army transport plane follows, at some time in almost every hour of the flight, he's looking down on places where equitable society investments are helping to provide jobs for ex-servicemen. Whether his plane soars over the cattle-studded plains of Texas or the waving wheatlands of Minnesota, over the cornfields of Iowa or the tobacco plantations of Kentucky, equitable society dollars are right there, soundly invested with progressive American farmers to promote farm prosperity. Or take practically any industrial center in which his plane might land. Take Chicago or Detroit, Cleveland or Pittsburgh. These also are centers for the investment of equitable society funds in steel mills and mines, in railroads and shipyards, in textile mills and industrial plants of all kinds. Yes, with equitable society dollars at work in every section of the country... And with the Equitable Society's three and a quarter million members living in every state in the Union, this great mutual organization is well named the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. For since 1859, Equitable Society dollars have helped make the whole United States the land of opportunity. 
Yes, by serving its members for 86 years, the Equitable Society has served America. And now back to the file on the big breakout. FBI agents make no pretense of infallibility. And although highly trained in their profession of criminal investigation, things happen so fast at times that human judgment is bound to err in one step or another in their investigative procedure. But this they have never failed to do. Readjust. The long hours of the day have dragged past. And now darkness is falling. Earl Dixon sits with his sister in the living room of her apartment. Who's that? How do I know? See who it is. I'll stand just behind the door. And don't let anyone in. Understand? Very well. Good evening. Good evening. You're Miss Annette Dixon, are you not? Yes. I'm Special Agent Connor of the FBI. The FBI? Yes. We just learned that you had moved here from Cincinnati. But, but why are you interested in where I live? The automobile in which your brother escaped from prison last night was found early today, abandoned just outside of town. May I come in? But, but my brother isn't here. Then there's no reason why I shouldn't come in, is there? No, that is, Thank I... Thank you. I have a gun what? here, Mr. Connor. Uh... I've often wanted to match wits with the FBI. Don't reach for yours. I wouldn't have any wits left for you to match if I did. I was sure they trained you to be practical. Yes. That's one of the reasons we usually win, Dixon. Have you always won until now? I wouldn't say that now is exactly over. You fellows travel in pairs. Is your partner outside in the car? No. I came here alone. Where is your partner? I'm afraid you'll have to proceed without that knowledge. He and your office must have known you came here. You think so? Yes. In that event, I think you'd better come along with us. Where to? My sister and I are taking a little trip. You'd be a very welcome companion. Really? Yes. With an FBI agent driving us in an FBI car, we should find it rather a safe journey. At your service, Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Oh, by the way... You wouldn't mind transporting a corpse, too, would you? It would be rather awkward leaving him here. Louis Muncy? That's right. Bring him along. I'd be very glad to have his body as evidence of murder against you. <laughs> what makes you think you'll be able to produce this evidence? This was to be a match of wits, remember? <laughs> When Special Agent Connor did not return to Dayton Police Headquarters within the designated time to rejoin his partner, Special Agent Whitman, Whitman and a police officer drove to Miss Dixon's address. Whitman is now returning to the car. There's something funny about this, Sergeant. I saw you go inside after you got no answer. I found this on the floor in the living room. What is it? Connor's wallet. What? And dresser drawers had been pulled open like somebody had packed and left in a hurry. Well. I'd say Connor ran into Dixon, all right. And possibly Muncie, too. And he dropped his wallet to let you know he'd been here and something was wrong. Yes. With his car gone, that means only one thing. Let's put out an alarm on that car. This is such a pleasure. The rolling fields, the green trees. You know, I've looked at penitentiary walls so long I'd forgotten it's even existed. Isn't it lovely, Annette? Please don't talk to me. <laughs> My sister doesn't approve of me, Mr. Connor. I'd say she has excellent taste. Uh, poor Louis. Poor Louis would have enjoyed this so. Which reminds me, I've decided not to dispose of his body anywhere along the way. Really? The river will be a much better place. Bodies have a disconcerting way of rising to the surface. Not when they're properly weighted, Mr. Connor. Oh. 
And that should offer a cue to your own fate. Thank you. Too bad you won't be able to enjoy a weekend on our little houseboat. You'd like to have his company, wouldn't you, Annette? Please, Earl. Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? Car trouble. Accidental, of course. What other kind is there? That sounds like a flooded carburetor. What have you done to it? The car stalled. Would you like to get out and diagnose the trouble yourself? You'd like that, wouldn't you? You go ahead and fix it, and I'm warning you. If you take too long... I won't, I assure you. Why don't we get some word, Sergeant? Well, we've done everything we can, Mr. Whitman. Something should come in. And that's the toughest thing about this business. I'm waiting. I know. They must have taken Connor along as cover. If they did, Connor's driving the car. We put all that on the alarm. Is there any more background on the Dixon family? Any place he'd be likely to go to? Mm, I'm having that checked now. In the meantime, the clock is running out. They're running out fast. I'll get it. Police headquarters, Sergeant Gillen speaking. Yes? Yes? Where was this? Just a minute, Mr. Whitman. Yes. This is state police. They got something on Connor. Uh, let me talk to the police. Sure, here you are. Hello? This is Special, Special Agent Whitman speaking. What have you got? I see. Uh, will you read it, please? Yes? Thank you very much. Goodbye. Come on, Sergeant. We've got a definite lead on Connor. I just hope we're not too late. Where did my sister go, Connor? Into the houseboat. Oh. I guess you've got Muncie's body weighted sufficiently now. Enough to keep it from drifting. That'll make it easier for us to locate. Us? Mm Mm-hmm. I admire your optimism. Now, if you will just drag the body out onto the deck. There, that will do nicely. And now I'll ask you to hoist it over the side. You're really running up a big score, Dixon. Just remember this gun. Go ahead, Connor. Okay. And now I suggest that we return to the cabin. Go ahead. After you, Mr. Connor. Thanks. Annette. Annette, will you stop that crying? Leave her alone. Well, Sir Galahad. Will you have a drink? No, thanks. Then I guess we'd better pass on to the next item on the program. That turns out to be you, Mr. Connor. Oh, oh, you can't... Hold it, miss. Dixon. Yes? You said this was to be a match of wits. That's right. And it's been rather unbalanced in my favor, wouldn't you say? No, I wouldn't. What do you mean? You had that pistol on me all evening. But it didn't keep me from working. Working? You didn't see me drop my wallet on the floor of your sister's apartment back in Dayton, did you? Now, don't pull that. I saw it. What? Annette, why didn't you... I left it there because I knew my partner would find it very shortly and know something was wrong. Look, Connor... I'm just trying to get my wits on the record. Very well. And you were right in suspecting I caused the car trouble back on the highway. All you gained was time, if you did. No. I left a note under a tool when I was under the car. It must have been picked up by now. And what did the note say? That we were coming here. Well, that makes you almost even. I'd say that puts me a little bit ahead. Annette, I think we're getting out of here. I hate to keep piling up points, Dixon, but the keys to the car are in the river with Muncie's body. Why, you... Now, don't be a bad loser, Dixon. I haven't lost. Oh, no? Look at that car coming along the riverbank. Where? Thank heaven. Is it the police? It isn't even a car. That was an old trick, Miss Dixon. But I won the match. Earl Dixon was returned to the penitentiary and subsequently tried and convicted for the murder of his fellow convict. Like all criminals, 
Dixon had an inflated estimation of his own ability to beat the law. And this was one of the most effective contributing factors to his inevitable downfall. No one is smarter than the law. Sooner or later, this inescapable fact is known to all criminals. You'll hear about next week's case in just a moment. This week, at the Equitable Society, I was shown three checks that were ready to go out in the afternoon mail. One was the biggest check I've ever seen in my life. A six, followed by six zeros. A six million dollar investment of Equitable Society funds in a great industrial concern which will employ several thousand men many of them returning servicemen. The second check was for $16,000, a loan to a farmer in Iowa who came to his equitable society so that he could buy a piece of land he's had his eye on for many years. The third check was for $6,000, and it was going to help an ex-sergeant of the Marines buy that little house he dreamed about while he lay in a hospital recovering from wounds received on Guadalcanal. Now he's going to own that little home with the aid of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. And there you have three of the principal ways in which Equitable Society dollars are put to work. In promoting home ownership. In lending farmers a helping hand. In keeping the wheels of industry turning. And that's why we think this life insurance business we're in is a good business. We collect premium dollars from our members for their good and then invest them in ways that are good for the entire nation. Yes, this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next Friday, December 7th, is the fourth anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Our program that evening will present a thrilling and factual account of the FBI's work on that momentous day. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are accurate records drawn from these files by special permission of Sir Harold Scott, Commissioner of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect, except the names of the participants, which for obvious reasons have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. And the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. New 
Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situate near the embankment on Whitehall, hard by 10 Downing Street and almost in the shadow of Big Ben. Here also is the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, the body of men whose exploits for more than a hundred years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime and unrelenting pursuit of the criminal and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. On the lower ground floor of New Scotland Yard is the famous Black Museum, where whose present custodian is Chief Superintendent James Davidson, a Scotland Yard veteran. Behind this door... Good afternoon. This Black Museum of ours is rather unique. Everything in it was at one time connected with the successful solution of a crime, or was closely involved in the crime itself. We possess an imposing collection of lethal weapons here, each carefully docketed to indicate its origin. Here are half-empty bottles of almost every poison known to man, together with a statement of particulars concerning its use. Here are the blood-stained garments, on which the solution of a crime of violence depended. Among the Black Museum's relics are disguises used by famous criminals, death masks of notorious men and women whose ends Scotland Yard encompassed, and a great many other more gruesome mementos of man's inhumanity to man. Among the exhibits are others seemingly incongruous objects that in their time served well in the undoing of desperate criminals. Such an exhibit is this one, the fragments of a set of teacups. This collection of shards was the first step in the solution of a frightful crime which occurred during the Blitz of July 1940. Yes, sir? Would you please bring me file number 302-MR-651, Constable? 302-MR-651, uh, sir? Yes, sir. One, sir. In July 1940, the Battle of Britain was at its height. The Luftwaffe hits us at all hours. And from advanced defense fields of the RAF, the weary spitfires rose day and night to do battle. Thousands of British people died in Britain as a result of enemy action. But in the midst of the very present war, murder went on as usual. Chief Superintendent Peter Carruth received a telephone call at Scotland Yard on the morning of the 3rd of July, a Wednesday. Part 302 MR 651, sir. Thank you. The call was from Chief Constable at Matfield, a Kentage village near Tunbridge. The chief constable reported the finding of the bodies of three women shot to death and requested the assistance of the CID. The services of Scotland Yard are available to the provincial police at all times if requested. The Home Office, assuming all expenses, if the request is made within 24 hours of the discovery of the crime, at their own expense, if we're called in after that. Chief Superintendent Carruth was gratified that the request came at the very beginning of the case, and he drove to Matfield at once with a medical examiner from the Home Office and Detective Sergeant Small, also Scotland Yard. They were met at the scene of the crime by Matfield Chief Constable Thomas Bennett. It's good of you to come so quickly, all of you. It's all quite beyond us here, sir. What with the blitz and all? I'm sure. I had a bad time. Having it, sir. Yes, I've no doubt. Those hours, Mr. Bennett. Spitfires. Jerry must be up again. Well, here's what happened. In the house, there's Miss Evans, the servant. Uh, is she dead? Two holes in her head. Yeah. Play, place all ransacked. All tore up. Where are the others? Mrs. Ames and her daughter Jessica's lying down there in the orchard. Also shot. Yes, I, I see. Where do you want to start, sir? Um, a house, I think, first. Yeah. Well, come in then, sir. Uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. They've lived here in Matfield a long time, have they, Benner? And Miss Evans, the servant, has always lived here. Mrs. Ames and her daughter moved here a year ago. Mrs. Ames a widow? No. Estranged from her husband, though they're quite friendly. 
He lives at Piddington. Oh, yes, I know. I've been there. Owns a farm. Does he know about this? My station sergeant telephoned him this morning, sir. He was in London, but he'll be home this evening. Shall I uh, go first, sir? She's lying right by the door, and you might trip over her. By all means. You go might try this. Uh, this oh, is no, the no, gentleman no. from Scotland Yard, Constable. Yes, sir. Hey, this is her. Miss Margaret Evans, sir. Age 61. Servant. Living in. Ah. Oh. See what you can find out, Bernard. Right, you are. Small, get started looking for fingerprints. Yes, sir. Place has really been ransacked, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. What's missing? I haven't checked yet, sir. I haven't touched anything. Good. Well, not much chance of finding out if anything is gone, though. Everybody that lived here is dead. I'd like to see the others. Right, sir. If you'll come with me. Oh, uh, what's that over there? Mm-hmm. Tea things? Yes, sir. Looks as if she dropped the tray when she saw the murderer. Have a look at them, too, Small. All right, sir. Uh, down this part, sir. The orchard, uh, that's where they are. Mrs. Ames? And her daughter, Jessica. Mm. They have many visitors? Very few, sir. And the place is back from the road, isn't a bit by the roses. Hard to tell they do, have. Here she is. This is the daughter, I suppose. Right, sir. Her mother's over there, off the path. Daughter was running away toward the house. Mother was facing the other way. Shot in the back, too. Aye. Found anything here in the grass? Cartridge cases, anything? Well, no, sir. Oh, we, we did find this glove, though, sir. Sorry, I had it in my pocket. Almost forgot it. Oh, woman's glove. Size six, I'd say. Hogskin. Shops sell thousands a week. Left hand. Whose is it? Isn't Mrs. Ames, sir, too small? Or Miss Jessica's either. Uh, too large, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, maybe the murderer, sir. We'll see. All you found? All so far, sir. Mm. Where was the glove? Oh, over there, sir. I, I marked the spot with those uh, two sticks. Uh-huh. Alongside the mother's body. Yes, sir. Well... As soon as Bernard's examined the bodies, I think you'd better have all this grass scythed down and see if you can find anything else. Cartridge case or anything. Yeah, right, sir. Shall we walk back to the house? Yes, yeah, sir. Good hunting, lad. Take a part. Talking to the fighter chap up there. Oh, oh, oh. Hope he shoots some Jerry's bloody ears off. He probably will. Got a son in the RAF. Flight sergeant in the Coastal Command. Good man. Nineteen years old. When I was 19, I was a farm man for good old Uncle Tom Cobbley. Hey, I wonder if they found anything yet in there, sir. We'll see. Oh, here's Bernard. Anything yet? Well, I, uh, I want to see the other bodies first. Discovered a little so far. Uh, where are the... Um, uh... Down the path back there, sir. We've touched nothing. Except this glove. Oh, is this one of theirs? Wrong size. All right. Uh, you can remove the bodies as soon as I finish, Chief Constable. Yes, sir. I'll have the van here at once. Uh, see to it, please. Yes, sir. What are you doing, Small? I'm trying to fit these cups together, sir. Well, what about fingerprints? I wanted you... Oh, I found a good many, sir. They all checked with hers. Oh, how did you know they were hers? Oh, I took hers. I wish live people's were as easy to take. No others? Well, I'm not sure yet, sir. As soon as I get the others down there, I'll make a very thorough check. These cups and saucers. She dropped them when she saw the murderer, probably. Yes, quite. But why should there be four cups, sir? Four? One for the mother. One for the daughter. One for the maid. For her. Miss Evans was more a companion than a servant, sir. Here in Matfield, we... Ah, uh, ah. Uh, yes. And one... For the murderer. Why, then, they must have known the murderer. People don't usually offer a cup of tea to a perfect stranger. You could make up a list of their friends, Chief Constable, uh, and then... Very few friends, sir. Kind of standoffish like they was, and the parson, the grocer, postmistress. Not any real close friends, so to speak. Make up a list and check where they all were yesterday. Yes, sir. What about this estranged husband of Mrs. Ames? Would he have a motive? Oh, I don't think so, sir. He used to come visit her, I know, but... Oh, he did, eh? And he's in London now, you said? I went down yesterday morning, they said, sir. Where does he live, do you say? 
Piddington, sir, near Oxford. Uh, you take over, Sergeant Small, you and Mr. Bernard. I'll call you from Piddington. Piddington, sir? Do you think... I think I'd like to know whether our friendly ex-husband was really in London yesterday or elsewhere. <laughs> Piddington, that afternoon, 70 miles away from Matfield, Jem Davies, the man of all work, explained to Chief Superintendent Carruth that John Ames had not yet returned from London. Miss Viola Masterson, the manager of the Ames farm, however, was at home, recovering from an accident. Carruth spoke to her in her sitting room. Her left arm was in bandages, and she was obviously in slight pain. Carruth sympathized with her. I'm so sorry to disturb you, Miss Masterson. It's quite all right. I'll be up and about in a day or so. It pains a little, though, now. I suppose you've heard about the former Mrs. Ames and her daughter. I'm so dreadfully sorry. I knew them slightly, you know. Oh, did you? I'd have gone over to Matfield if I hadn't been so stupid as to fall off my bicycle and injure my arm. I'm afraid I'm not a very good cyclist. Oh, do you have any clues as to the... the... Murderer? And very few at the moment. Very few, I'm afraid. Oh, what a pity. Mr. Ames went to London yesterday. Hmm? Yes. He was probably in London while his former wife and daughter were murdered. He often stops in to see them on his way. If he'd stopped there yesterday, he might have prevented it. Yes, yes. I suppose he can account for his movements yesterday. I'm quite sure he can, Superintendent. I expect him at any moment. You were here at the farm all day. I rode about the farm all day in my bicycle until I had the accident. Ah. I'm sure Jemmy Davis can confirm that. And the bicycle is still where I left it, where I fell off. Unless Jemmy's brought it back. I see. Uh, by the way, have you ever seen this glove before? Oh, let me see it. No, I'm afraid not. Did it belong to... We're not quite sure. Well, it's not mine. Much too big for me, I'm sure, Superintendent. You've never seen it before? Never. Thank you, Miss Masterson. Is that all you wanted? Aren't you going to wait for Mr. Ames? Oh, I don't like to disturb you, Miss Masterson. I'll wait out there with Jemmy. It is Jemmy, isn't it? Uh, by all means, talk to Jemmy. I'm sure he'll confirm everything I've said. Good day, Miss Masterson. You know where to find Jemmy. <laughs> he was sitting alongside the stable door cleaning a shotgun when I last saw him. Jemmy Davis was a simple-minded man. He didn't realize that he was talking much too freely to the friendly Scotland Yard man. Well, it'd, it'd be a terrible thing, I expect, but I don't shed no tears for him. I didn't like her nor her daughter neither. Hated them? It'd be none of my business, sir. But now, Mr. Ames, uh, he'd be a real fine man. And she, uh, she treated him awful bad. How? Dug in the manger. Kicks him out, she does. And then when he finally meets a woman he loves, and that woman loving him, she won't give him no divorce. You seem to know a lot about Mr. Ames' affairs, Jemmy. Yeah. Him and me, we be just like that. I'd do anything for that man. Her too, for that matter. Who? Miss Masterson. There. Well, that's pretty clean, ain't it? Let's see. <laughs> clean as I'd ever want a gun to be. <laughs> Had it for years. Old-fashioned, like me. <laughs> uh, but she'd be a good shotgun. He uses it all the time for rabbits. Mr. Ames? He buys his own shells, too. Hmm. Well, Miss Masterson, she's scared of it. Tried to teach her how to shoot it. But she was scared. <laughs> now, you couldn't kill a person with this here gun, I says to her. Not unless you got up real close. Funny thing, though. She shot a rabbit with it yesterday. <laughs> you know, it made her so sick at her stomach when she shot the poor little fella. Never again, she says to me. <laughs> Did you see the rabbit, Jemmy? <laughs> Well, what were left of it, she were too close. Well, not worth bringing back to cook. <laughs> you know, I think that's why she fell off her bicycle thinking about it. Where did she fall? Well, she was in the meadow yonder. The wheel slipped on the grass. Jimmy, did you ever see this glove before? Huh? No, sir. Oh, can't say as how I have. Sure? No, sir. Whose is it? I found it. Well... 
Pointers, keepers. Uh, that's what they say. So you don't think Mr. Ames and Miss Masterson will be upset by Mrs. Ames' death? Lord bless you, no, sir. Now they can get married. Well, that dog in the manger wife of his. Well, he must have been the last one to see her alive. Oh? How's that? When he stopped us here on the way to London yesterday. Why, I thought you was going to wait for him to come back, sir. Chief Superintendent Carew hurried to the local police station where he put through a trunk telephone call to Matfield. Detective Sergeant Small, the Scotland Yard man, answered the telephone at the murder house. Small here. Small, I want you to check at once on something. Yes, sir. I want you to make the most diligent inquiries. Get that chief constable there to inquire of every person in Matfield, if necessary, at once, to discover if this man Ames was seen in Matfield yesterday. You got that? He was seen, sir. He was? The postman, sir. We've been making inquiries all over the village of Mrs. Ames' known friends, and we've come across several curious things, sir. Well? Well, the, the postman observed Mr. Ames walking toward this house yesterday afternoon. He's sure? He positively identified him, sir. He's known him for years. Spoke to him, called him by name, and Ames replied. What else? He was carrying a shotgun, sir. Oh. I discovered here that he intended to visit them, but the gun... Well, looks as if he's our man, doesn't it? What else did you discover? Well, there's a bicycle belonging to Mrs. Ames is missing. Oh? And the porter at the railway station reports a strange woman carrying a parcel arrived in town yesterday, but so far we have been unable to trace her. Now, the local police have picked up a deserter from an army camp near here. He's being questioned now. Ah. Then a lorry driver for the gas company at Oxford reports picking up a woman on the highway near here yesterday afternoon. She was wearing one glove. Oh? Now, he thinks her bare hand was scratched and bleeding. Yes? She explained she'd fallen off her bicycle and was trying to catch a train. He took it to the railway station. And then... Well, what did you say, sir? I didn't say anything. Oh, I was speaking to Dr. Bernard, sir. I'll put him on. He wants to speak to you. Thank you. You there, Carruth? Yes, Bernard. I've discovered why you didn't find any spent cartridges, Superintendent. Yes? The women were killed with a shotgun, probably a 410 shotgun. Yes, yes, sir. The uh, murderer had to pick the discharged shell out of the breech of the gun by hand. Yes, but... It... And probably carried them away and disposed of them elsewhere. Did you recover any of the shot from the bodies? Yes, quite small pellets, uh, bird shot. Mark it in evidence and hold it for me. I think those little lead pellets are going to hang someone, Bernard. Back at the Piddington farm, Chief Inspector Carew found that Ames had returned in his absence. Jamie, the garrulous man of all work, was just leaving. He was going to fetch Miss Masterson's abandoned bicycle, he I'd said. I'd be going out to fetch Miss Masterson's bicycle, sir. Look here, Jamie. Would you like a half a crown? What for? That rabbit Miss Masterson shot. Is it near where she left the bicycle? Oh, fur longer too, sir. Fetch it back for me. What for, sir? Well, it brings fit to eat. She were too close. Oh, I've a fancy to see how that gun of yours works, Jim. Oh, that old gun of mine? Uh, she be a very good gun, sir. Show me. Here. Well. Good man. Now, is Mr. Ames in the house? All right, sir. Now, I'll, I'll fetch the rabbit and show you. But the poor thing will be all full of birdshot, sir. That'll be all right, Jimmy. I'm very interested in birdshot. Yes. I'm Chief Superintendent Carruth of Scotland Yard. You're John Ames, hmm? Yes. Now, you're the gentleman who was here this afternoon. Yes. May I come in? Do. You've come about the murder of my wife and daughter? Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Carruth, you said? Yes. I cannot pretend any great grief, although I am shocked at the tragic. May I sit down? I, um, I spoke to Miss Masterson, your manager, this afternoon. She said you were here. Perhaps if Miss Masterson is strong enough... Here I am. Oh, sit down, my dear. 
Please, sit down. Don't hurt my hand, John. I'm all right. Well, sir? Am I correct in assuming that uh, with the death of Mr. Ames and strange wife, you and he... Uh... We can be married, yes. Mr. Ames? That is true. My wife has consistently refused to give me a divorce. Although we were on fairly good terms... She and I weren't. I'm glad she's dead. Violet, And that horrid daughter of hers, too. Now we're rid of them once and for all. Violet. Do you share Miss Masterson's views, Mr. Ames? Uh, I'm afraid... Perhaps he's not as ferocious as I am, but he shares my views all right. Don't you, John? Uh, Yes. And what were you doing with a shotgun on the way to our home yesterday, Mr. Ames? John, you didn't... You didn't... Mr. Ames! You, you didn't tell me. Oh, John! John, now you spoiled everything. Your wife and your daughter were murdered with a shotgun, Mr. Ames. I didn't do he it. He didn't, he didn't, I say. What gauge is your shotgun, Mr. Ames? This is absurd, Mr. Ames. Of course it's why absurd. Do you, why do you think it's absurd? My dear sir, my gun, which incidentally is an American-made Remington over and under 12 gauge, has been broken for four weeks. You see? Broken. The sear spring is broken. It's quite impossible to fire the gun. You can examine the gun at your leisure at Henny McGovern's The Gunsmiths on High Horburn in London, where I took it yesterday. We'll check that. Why did you visit your wife yesterday, carrying your broken gun? I dropped off in Matfield on my way to London to have the gun repaired. I begged her again to give me a divorce. She refused? She refused again. <laughs> for the last time. And we're going to be married now at last. You don't expect us to weep for her. Whoever killed her should be given a medal. Viola. Oh, stop it. You're just as glad as I am. Aren't you? Excuse me. The telephone. Yes? Yes, he's here. One moment. It's for you, Mr. Carew. Thank you. Chief Superintendent Carruth here. Small here, sir. We found Mrs. Ames' missing bicycle. Oh. Yes, sir. It was discovered in a ditch close to the place where the lorry driver picked up the woman with one glove. Oh, good. And there are numerous fingerprints on the handlebar, sir, but of the right hand only. Most interesting. And the strange woman whom the railway reporter observed was uh, carrying a parcel, you remember? Yes, yes, of course. It was a long parcel about the length of a gun, he says, wrapped in brown paper. I see. Have you taken the things you spoke about? Things, sir? Yes. Oh, oh, the, the fingerprints on the bicycle? Yes, quite. Yes, sir, I've taken them. How soon could I see them and the people you spoke of? Up there, sir? Yes. Well, there's an up train that we can have stop at Pittington, leaving here in half an hour, sir. I think you'd better come, then, if you can find the others you mentioned. I'll meet you at the Pittington station. Right, sir. Goodbye. I'm very sorry. Could I ask? You have uncovered some other evidence, sir? You're not going to arrest John, then? He won't be charged with murder? I think I can almost assure you that you will not be charged with murder, Mr. Ames. I'm sorry, I, I, I must go and meet my colleagues. This is quite important. Will you be coming back? I probably shall. I, I shall want to be able to assure Mr. Ames that he will not be held. Oh, John. <laughs> Is the Scotland Yard man still here, Mr. Ames? Why, uh... I'm here, Jamie. Well, I, I fetch you the dead rabbit, sir. With your half-crown's worth of birdshot. They met him at the railway station two hours later. Detective Sergeant Small, Chief Constable Bennett, the lorry driver who had picked up the woman with the bloody hand and the one glove, and the railway porter who had observed the woman carrying the brown paper parcel the size of a gun. Leaving Chief Constable Bennett at the station to make a telephone call, the party proceeded to the Ames farm. Oh. Good evening, Mr. Carruth. May we come in, please? Why, this is quite a delegation. May we come in, please? Why, I suppose... <clears throat> Do come in, although... Thank you. Where's Miss Masterson? 
Viola? Yes, dear. Why, what... Uh, Miss Masterson, do you recognize any of these people? Why, why, no, of course not. Patterson, do you recognize this woman? Hey, she's the lady in blue slacks I picked up my lorry on the road to Matfield yesterday. The lady that said she fell off her bike. Her hand was all bloody and she had one glove on. Like this one? Yes, sir. Exactly like that. O'Connor. Yes, sir. Have you ever seen this lady before? I seen her yesterday, sir. Getting off the 1206 train that passes through Piddington before it gets to Batfield. She was wearing blue slacks and carried a brown paper parcel about the size of a gun, sir. Now, look here. What's the meaning of all this? Come in. Well, Bennett. Just like you thought, sir. I telephoned the doctor who treated Miss Masterson, and he informs me that he treated her left hand for multiple lacerations, removing particles of road gravel and stains of tarvia from the palm. Miss Masterson, there is no gravel or tarvia at the meadow. Thank you. Mr. Ames, I'm extremely sorry for you. John... Now, we won't get married. Viola Masterson, I arrest you on the charge of willful I murder. I wanted to get married, and she stood in our And I must John. warn you that anything I... you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence against you. John, what have I done? The evidence adduced by Chief Superintendent Carruth, the identifications by the lorry driver and the railway porter... The shotgun pellets which proved identical with those Miss Masterson had fired into the unfortunate rabbit. The glove which was identified as hers by the store which had sold it to her. The gravel from the road in her wounded hand. And the motive, which was all too plain, proved sufficient evidence to convict Viola Masterson of the murders of Mrs. Ames and her daughter and of the servant Margaret Evans who provided the first cue, the fourth cup. Miss Masterson had determined to murder the servant to eliminate the only witness to the murder of the others. In a trial marked with frequent air raid alarms caused by an enemy whose depredations could not prevent murder from going on as usual, she was found criminally insane and is now imprisoned in the asylum at Broadmoor. John Ames was tried as an accomplice, but acquitted. He joined the 1st Battalion of the Baps and was reported missing in action in the Italian campaign. Constable, you may turn the... File 302 MR651, the Blitz murder case, to the records room. Good afternoon. You've just heard the first case in the series Whitehall 1212, drawn from the official files of Scotland Yard by permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. All names were changed in this story for obvious reasons, but everything else is true. It occurred. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. <laughs> It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, this Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. You walk slowly and you lean your heart against it. Then something explodes in your face and you run and you're one of the crowd. You shop for the kicks, the bargains and the heartbreak. 
And inevitably you find it, one or the other, like I did. On the street of the tired apartment houses, a street leased on the premise that both parents should work so they can come home, smile bravely at each other, beat their children, then snore. It was 7 p.m. when I walked up to the second floor landing of the El Royale Apartments in answer to a call. Detective Mugovan was waiting for me. There he is, Danny, on the floor over by the railing. Uh Uh-huh. Who is he? Hey, why don't you people break it up? Go on, get back to your apartments. You read all about it in the paper. Who is he, Mugovan? His name is Harold Clark. Lives apartment 2C. Married. No children. Dead from 238 slugs in his chest. That's who he is. Who killed him? A tenant named Lloyd Ramey. Had the apartment right here, 2A. Blasted Mr. Clark right through the door. Two shots connected with both. Here, see? Two shots right through the door here and here. Uh-huh. What about Lloyd Ramey? Killer? Nothing. He shot Clark and took a fire escape exit through his own room. What else, Muggerman? What about the rest of the tenants? Do they know anything about Ramey? I asked them. They shake their heads. No. Okay, ask them some more. But you said Clark was married. Yeah, his wife is home. Thanks. Mrs. Clark. It's the police, Ms. Clark. I've got... Please come in. Excuse the way I look. Of course. Mrs. Clark, What uh... do you want me to say to you? Excuse the way I look? Excuse the way the apartment looks? The way my husband looks lying out there in the hall in his undershirt? What else can I say to you? I'm sorry about it. I've got to ask you some questions. I know all about that. Here, see? Right here. Detective. Did you ever own a gun? Suspect. No, sir, I did not. Detective. Did you shoot this man? Suspect. No, sir, I did not. Just like in these true type detective story magazines. I read them all the time. I know all about what you've got to do. All right, then it'll make it a lot easier. If you're going to ask me, did I shoot my husband, I'm going to say, no, sir, I did not. We know you didn't. Don't be too sure. I was in Lloyd Ramey's apartment when it happened. Oh? Tell me about it. I went across the hall to borrow some tea bags from Mr. Ramey because my husband likes tea. I must have stayed more than ten seconds because my husband got panicky and came after me. He knocked on the door. Mr. Ramey didn't even answer. He pulled out a gun and shot. How well did you know, Ramey? For tea bags. With my husband, tea bags means I'm not being true blue. Your husband was wrong, wasn't he? My husband is dead. I guess that's pretty wrong. He knocked on the door and yelled to open it or he'd break it down, and now he's dead. Because he liked tea. Dr. Sinsky, the technical boys are here, Danny. Oh, good. I'm through here. Tell them to go to work. Okay. Now, look, you people. Why don't you break it up? Why don't you go home to your own apartment? They stood there, the tenants of the El Royale apartment, summoned by the violence, drawn by the clamor of the violent dead, drawn by the cold wind that had touched their throats and led them to the warmth of the spectacle. A child's harsh voice ordered his father to hoist him to his shoulder so he could see, could see better. The father slapped him hard across the mouth. The child wailed and scurried down the corridor, and the father looked after him, his eyes filled with pain and confusion. And then emptying of these things, forgetting the child, remembering death. Mugovan had got one thing out of the tenants, the fact that Lloyd Ramey, the murderer, was known to a certain party, the party being the Wilkins Rental Agency on West 58th Street. The forms you had to fill out to get an apartment from them, your life was on a piece of paper in a wooden file box. Go ask Mr. Wilkins about Lloyd Ramey. He'll have it in the box. Mr. Wilkins did. Committed murder, did he? It just goes to show you, Mr. Clover, you never know, you never know. You found it? Mm Mm-hmm, I found it. It's right here to hand. Man tries his best, Mr. Clover. Tries to find a select clientele for his clients. Tries to judge a man by his clothes, his shifting eyes, the woman hanging on his arm. Good risk, bad risk. Man asks himself... Mr. Wilkins. Please, you're eating into my time. Permit me to eat into yours. The things they put on the questionnaire on the form so often lie, sheer lies. All I want is... I know, I know. Information on one of my tenants, a murder. Whenever you feel up to it, Mr. Wilkins. Thank you. According to my files, Lloyd Ramey is a man I never set eyes upon. But you just told me that... I know, I know. But sometimes in my profession, as it must be in yours, there are extenuating circumstances. Like what, Mr. Wilkins? Like this letter from Lloyd Ramey. Let me see it. Patience, patience, Mr. Clover. 
This letter is an extenuating circumstance because with it came the money for a year's lease on apartment 2A, El Royal Apartments. We find questionnaires, personal interviews, unnecessary when a gentleman has the foresight to... What else does it have? A few well-wrought phrases stating that he, Mr. Lloyd Ramey, had seen our ad in the news, had gone to the apartment, found it suitable to his needs, and enclosed find eight uh, uh, years' rent. Dated September 3rd, 1950. From that day forward, we rejected all other applicants. Give it to me. I must, I suppose. He'd part with it. This letterhead. It brought joy into our lives here at the agency. Isn't it joyful? <laughs> yes, Berkey Siegmiller. Tattoos. And the slogan. What you want, where you want it. Joyful, huh? <laughs> I'm back here. Come on back. Hi. Take a chair. I'll be right with you as soon as I finish with this sailor. Now, hold still, sailor boy. My name's Danny Clover. Hi, Danny. You can look at the patterns on the wall. We're having a special this week on Mother. You know, M is for the, O is for I'm the... I'm from the police. I can give you a special on that, too. P is for the, O is for the... What's the matter with you, sailor boy? Be brave. Is your name Berkey Siegmiller? Yeah. Hey, you ain't got that tattoo look in your eye. You don't want to get tattooed, do you? I want some information. Look, sailor boy, if you don't hold still, you're going to have the strangest-looking mermaid on your chest in the Navy. <sighs> the kind of information you want, Danny. A man came in here about four weeks ago and used your stationery here. Stationery from your place. Oh, yeah, I recall the request. Man dropped in for a touch-up job of a coiled rattlesnake. And he asked me for a sheet of paper when I was done. I gave it to him. You got the one he, I gave him in your hand. Had you ever seen the man before? No. What's he done? Murder. That's a new one. Did an admiral once, but never a murderer. Okay, button up your shirt, sailor boy. Have you any idea where I can find this man? There's no use you asking me any more questions, Danny, because I couldn't give you any more answers. Just tattoos. That's all I give. Danny? Danny, it was I. You're ever faithful. Hello, Gino. Likewise, I'm sure. Well? You uh, seem lost, Danny. Lost in some reverie into which perhaps it is implied that I intrude my face? That's all right. You can stay. Thank you. Well? Yeah, sure it's all right. What's eating you? Danny, the rumor is making its way through the nooks and crannies of police headquarters that you have lately visited a tattoo parlor. Rumor is right. Danny, you have not gone and indulged yourself in some mad whim or other. You have not. You don't approve, Gina? Well, it is not for me to approve or not to approve, Danny. It is only that in a like circumstance, Mike Schreck, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia... He's tattooed? You guessed it. In the middle of his forehead, the tattoo of a snow crystal, imprinted there by a high llama hailing from Tibet. And Mike Schreck has regretted this indiscretion all his life. So? So? Well, I don't want the same thing to happen to you, this regret... Danny, I won't breathe a word if you... I know I can trust you, Sergeant. Now, in the matter of Lloyd Ramey, you have something for me? Gino. In the matter of Lloyd Ra... Oh, oh, yeah. In the matter of Lloyd Ramey, the usual standard operating procedure. All points bulletins, terminals watched in relays. Nothing. Hey, you can't just barge in here, lady. You have hey, it's to... it's all right, Gino. You want to see me, Miss Clark? Not particularly. I only thought that if you were cracking your skull over the murder of my husband, maybe I could help. Sit down, Miss Clark. There isn't time to be la di da with me, Mr. Clover. If you want to capture him, you better hurry. He was just beginning the soup course when I spotted him. Lloyd Ramey? Where? Don't panic yourself, Mr. Clover. Not Lloyd Ramey, but a man who was often a caller at the apartment of Lloyd Ramey. Ramey was such a secretive type, I took mental notes on his callers. Where is this man? Beginning a meal at the Hotel Adams. I dropped in there myself for a bite. While waiting for a table, I spotted him. Who could eat? 
I ran quick to you with a hot clue clutched tight in my little hand. You want it? You'll point them out to me, won't you, Mrs. Clark? Why else do you think I missed my dinner? There he is, Mr. Clover. Which one? There, near the back of the room. Man sitting at the small table against the wall. You wait here. Mind if I sit down, mister? Mm -hmm. Oh, sit down. Have a drink, quiet. Sit down, sir. Thanks. I'm from the police. Why don't you bring the lady, too? I see you come with the lady. Go back and get the lady. I'm not feeling so good, but who needs it to talk with a lady? Lady. You're sick. Sick. Drunk. Sick. Drunk. Go, go get the, get the lady. Hey, we'd better get you to. I lifted his head up from the table, and his eyes were open, open and staring, and not reacting to anything in the world. And here's part of it: the maitre d' hurrying over the polite music, the finger bowls, and the demi tasse, and the fillets. None of it registered. He just slumped to the floor. I knelt over him. Felt for a pulse. There wasn't any. He was dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. This Sunday, Frank Sinatra joins Arthur Godfrey and the other fine entertainers and programs to be heard on CBS in the afternoons. His new show is called Meet Frank Sinatra, and you'll hear members of Frank's studio audience being interviewed by The Voice and telling him their favorite songs. At their request, Frank either will sing the song himself or play a famous record. Meet Frank Sinatra will bring you a surefire entertainment for a whole hour, starting this Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Broadway is generous in many ways. It offers you for free its own private set of values, for instance. The essence of a man's life, his worth, measure it in terms of darkness and light. Big man, big Mazda bulb shining bright. So many yards of neon hissing his name into the screaming night. Little man, his proper share of darkness. A spectacular with burned out bulbs sighing into nothing. Harold Clark, the man shot down because he had pounded on a door. That was a little man. The man at a dinner table who hadn't recognized the feel of death, who thought he was only drunk. Also a little man. As witness how discreetly the management tried to hide his dying from the diners. Hardly worth Broadway's notice. Hardly worth interrupting the choice of a pastry. But at police headquarters, he found his importance. Under a microscope, in a test tube, a hooded light bulb shining down on his death, giving it shape, shining down on the white-coated figure who ran it through his fingers, analyzed it. This is it, Danny. This is what did it to him. The cliché of poison. It bores you, huh, Gordon? If you ask me, Danny, I'll tell you. Such an unoriginal poison, cheap, common. It can be boring. How was it administered? I've been waiting for you to ask me. Get off it, Gordon. Well, you surprised me, Danny. I should have thought it was normal routine that you asked questions at the hotel bar. It was slipped into his drink. I have proof positive. You didn't ask questions? To make you any happier, yeah, I did. The bartender couldn't remember him. Couldn't remember anybody. That's why he's worked this so long, he said, because he couldn't remember faces. <laughs> tough. That makes it tough on you, doesn't it, Danny? You think Lloyd Ramey did our fellow in? What else have you got, Gordon? It's all over there in that pile. I'll help you soon. You do it, Gordon. Because you're a lieutenant? Still? All right. I'll do it for you, lieutenant. His clothes tailored, his wallet alligator, his driving license wrapped in cellophane. It says he had brown eyes, was 5'11", age 36. It says he lived at 2354, he's 47th, that his name was Henry Gaynor. You can stop me any time, lieutenant. Nothing else? Nothing, except this package of orange lifesavers. Have one, Danny. <laughs> Come on, have one. I'll analyze them. 
They're harmless. Orangey. Goodbye, Gordon. Not at all. Lloyd Rainey, Lieutenant. <laughs> How are you doing on that one? Oh, you're very welcome, Lieutenant. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. My name's Danny Clover. Well, let's come the... in. Chat inside. There now. Isn't this better? Uh, sit down. Try that chair over there, the flower creton. Thanks. I started to say I was from the police. Well, I don't understand. There's nothing to understand. Police, that's who I work for. But why do you want to see me? By the way, who are you? Tommy Lawrence. You live here with Henry Gaynor? I did live here with Henry Gaynor. He's dead. I read about it in the late editions. Oh. Oh, that's why. Henry's dead, and you're the police, and you've come here. Oh. That's why. That's why. Tell me about Henry. Well, I advertised in the paper for a clean living man to share this apartment. I chose Henry. Uh huh. But I made a mistake. I learned not to like him. That's why I'm not outraged or worried or sorry that Henry's dead. He did nothing but dote on girls. He and his buddy. Buddy? Well, that chaser, Frank Muir. If you want his address, I don't know it. But his phone number's around. You think you can trace it? Frank Muir. I tracked him down where I were you. He's the cause of it all. Poor Henry. I detached him from his Creton grief, made him look for Frank Muir's phone number. He found it on a pad next to the phone. He did that by lifting up a French doll, and there it all was. Surprise. I phoned Muir. He was at home. I told him to stay there. He said he had a date. I tinkled my badge into the receiver. He said he'd break the date. When I got there, he was still doing it. Come on in, Mr. Clover. Mix yourself up a happy, happy at the bar. This lady I'm talking to on the phone, <laughs> she's bitter. She don't believe I got a rendezvous with a policeman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, honey. I swear it's only a cop. A cop? What kind of a cop? I know a cop <sighs> For 20 minutes, you've been holding up the phone, honey. Here. here. Yeah, yeah, I'll prove it to you. Yeah, yeah. Say something to my lady. Prove to her you're only a man cop. Hang up. But, well, look, be a pal. Hang up. <laughs> Between the two of you, she, she'll fracture me. I don't do this sort of thing, Mr. The ladies normally, you understand, Mr. Clover? You had a friend, Henry Gaynor. You can say that again. Head is just a word. I read in the papers how a friend I once had is now gone. When did you see him last? <laughs> you think I killed him? When Henry and me had such snazzy times together on blind dates? On with your eyes open dates? When did you see him last? On the occasion when I turned over Mrs. Ellen Clark to him. What? You heard me. That was three, maybe... Four Saturdays ago. I make it four. Mrs. Clark was one of your lady friends <laughs> like... Don't get me wrong, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Clark was, uh... How do you classify? A smile filled with hidden meanings. Uh, the touch of a knee under a checkered tablecloth. That was all Mrs. Clark was to me. That's why you handed her over to your buddy? Uh -huh. Wrong again. You see that plaster cast up there on the mantelpiece? That's courtesy of irate husband, Mr. Clark. He found me once with his missus waiting to catch a bus. He clobbered me, broke me arm. Care to autograph it, Mr. Clover? All my friends have. No? Oh, you'll excuse me. It's undoubtedly. Hi, Danny. How you feeling? Yeah, there have been better times, Muggerman. There always are. Uh... Seen the papers? Uh-uh. Haven't had the time. You should have looked. What have you got in your mind, Muggerman? You don't have to bite my head off because I suggest you read the papers. It's got a picture of Lloyd Ramey on the front page. What? Yep. Only his name isn't Lloyd Ramey. The name is George Harvey. Something, huh? You want me to invest a nickel in a newspaper or you want to tell me why? We took the two bullets from the body of Harold Clark and checked the rifling to what we got on file. We didn't have anything. So? Sent them to Washington. FBI check. Sent a wire back. They got what the two bullets matched. Two more bullets. Where'd they get them? One of them out of a murdered bank clerk of Vincennes, Indiana. 
the other from a woman shot down during a liquor store robbery in uh, St. Louis. Both shootings done by George Harvey, wanted by Indiana, Missouri police for murder. What does it do to you, Danny? There's a whole lot, Mugovan. May I come in? What are you looking for, mister? I'm Joseph Gribness. May I come in? What's on your mind, Mr. Gribness? Uh, thank you. Who do I see about the reward? Reward? Yeah, it says right here in the paper, reward. And don't you people try to talk your way out of it either. You see? Right here on the front page. Have you seen this man, it says. I've seen this man. What about the reward? If there's a reward, we'll see that you get it. Where did you see him? <laughs> Where'd you see him, yes. Where's the reward? The man in charge of the reward department's just stepped out. Oh, wait. Sure, wait. But if George Harvey escapes while you're waiting, you'll be held for... What'll he be held for, Mugovan? Aiding and abetting a criminal. Aiding and abetting a criminal. Aiding and abetting a criminal. The man whose picture appears in the paper moved in this morning next door to me. Hotel Hobart, into the hall, third floor. No, I'll, I'll just wait. <laughs> Down the end of the hall, the man said. That's what Mr. Griffin has said, Danny. Here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what do you want? Come on, open up, Harvey. Move away from the door, Mugovan. Open the door, I'll break it down. Cops still there? Or are you dead? Shoot the lock off the door, Mugovan. I'll kick it open. Let's go. Harvey. No one's home. Come back later. Danny in that hallway. Yeah. Better call an ambulance, Mugovan. Okay, Danny. And turn the radio on. What? What do you know? There was somebody home. Can you talk, Harvey? I just talked, didn't I? You cuss been chasing me all over the country just to chat with me. Advertised me at post offices, detective magazines, and a radio. Why did you kill Harold Clark? You pounded on my... On my door, you saw what happened. I thought he was a cop. You yell open the door, I'll break it down. Cops talk like that. Did you poison a man named Listen, Henry Gaynor? I'm losing blood, cop. Pity me. Did you poison a man named Henry Gaynor? Poison? <laughs> Never in my life. Henry Gaynor? Never in my life. One more question, Harvey. Was Mrs. Clark in your apartment when you killed her husband? You kidding? That's one of the tough things about running all the time. Never have time for a dame. She wasn't in my apartment. You're sure? I'm confessing a murder, mister. But don't try to book me for a dame in my apartment. Because Mrs. Clark wasn't there. Yes? Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. I know. You've come to tell me you've got my husband's murderer. Did you bring me some good news like that? I'll come in and tell you about it, Mrs. Clark. I was just going to ask you to do that. My apartment looks better now, doesn't it? How does a woman feel when the man she loves is murdered? I felt numb at first, but I'm getting better. Harold, my husband was a jealous man. Harold was always... I'm not talking about your husband. I'm talking about Henry Gaynor. Who? The man you poisoned after he refused to have anything to do with you. You poisoned him and brought me there to watch him die. You're crazy. Before you killed Gaynor, did you tell him how you arranged your husband's murder? You invited yourself in, now invite yourself out. What are you doing? What are you walking around my place for? Place looks nice. Thanks. Get out. Really looks a lot better. Neat. Things in order. Where are all those true type detective story magazines? I gave them away. A man came, offered me a dollar for all those magazines I had. I gave him five bundles wrapped in twine. Did you save one of them? 
What? The one with the picture of George Harvey, alias Lloyd Ramey. What did it say under his picture? That he was armed, that he was wanted for murder, that he was dangerous not to approach him, but to notify the police? Get out of here. You knew your husband was bitterly jealous. You goaded and made him believe you were carrying on with a neighbor across the hall. Get out. You sent him over there knowing that trigger-happy killer would shoot him as soon as he knocked on the door, and Harvey did. I'll kill you. Harvey said you were never in his apartment. You were too frightened of him ever to talk to him. Let's go, Mrs. Clark. Take your hands off me. I said, let's go, Mrs. Clark. I had it all. I had it in the palm of my hand until you, you... Come on, Mrs. Clark. Look. Look, you've got to understand. My husband was jealous. He spoiled everything. Every man I ever looked at. You don't know how it was. He ruined everything. He spoiled everything. It's the street of the hunter, Broadway. The smile that's dropped at the tip of a hat. And the lights are flung from windows, out of doorways. You walk a pavement speckled with a thousand colors. But between the lights, that's where the darkness is. It's Broadway, the gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Kathy Lewis, Vivi Janis, Anthony Barrett, Leo Cleary, Jack Crucian, and Ed Max. Reporter. Police reporter delves into the crime records of the past and from Scotland brings you a famous case that happened over a hundred years ago. The scene of this true murder mystery is Edinburgh, Scotland, the time 1827. It's quite late at night and William Burke and William Hare are standing at the back door of Dr. Knox's house. Dr. Knox is a famous teacher of anatomy and surgery. Dr. Knox. We're Burke and Hare, proprietors of a lodging house in the lower part of the city. Yes? Well, we've come to see you on a little business. I see, and what would your business be with me? We heard Dr. Knox that you're after buying horses. Yes, I am. Uh, I have a surgical school, and I use them in the teaching of anatomy. Well, we got a body we'd like to sell you. Hmm, really? Who is it? The man's name was Donald, and he was one of our lodgers. Oh. Although the law makes it difficult for me to secure anatomical subjects, I'm nevertheless forced to be careful of the bodies I buy. We know it's against the law to sell them, but we're poor men, Doctor, and Donald died owing us over four pounds, so we thought maybe ye could use him. Mm, I understand, and I'm in no position to be overcritical. Well, we thought if we could sell you his body, we might get enough to pay the bill out of it. Well, uh, where is this subject? You've got him right out here in the wheelbarrow, wrapped in a blanket. Can you bring it in the house where it's light, and I'll look at it? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Carry him in, Bill. Aye, he's not very heavy. He was an old man, doctor, without friends or relatives. 
So you see, there'll be no one to bury him. And we can't afford to. Unwrap him, Bill. Aye. He ain't much to look at, sir. But you might be able to use him in your business. That are you, sir. Mm, quite an old man, eh? Died a natural death, I see. Senile decay, probably. Would he be any good to you, sir? Perhaps. This might be an interesting subject. How much do you ask for it? Well, what would he be worth to you? Mm, I'll pay you seven pounds ten shillings. That's very generous of ye, sir. Thank ye, sir. That'll pay the old man's bill and give us a little extra for our trouble. You're uh, satisfied with seven pound ten, then? Oh, yes, sir. Very much, sir. Mm, place the body on that table and I'll give you the money. Take his arms, Bill, and I'll take his legs. Aye. Have you got him? Aye. Here we go. He won't weigh more than eight stone. On this table. Head up that way. Aye, sir. There he is, sir. Thank you. And here are your seven pound ten. Uh, let me see. Five, six, seven, and ten. Correct? Thank you, sir. And if we ever get any more bodies, will you buy them, sir? Yes. But if you can get younger subjects, I'll pay a better price. Yes, sir. We'll see you again, sir. Soon, I hope. Good night, sir. Good night. The selling of poor old Donald's body gave these two men an idea. During the next two years, they induced homeless and penniless people to come to their lodging house. Those who were lucky died a natural death. The others were smothered. Sixteen were helped on their way to Dr. Knox's dissecting rooms. Two years have passed. The time, just before the arrival of their last victim. The scene, a room in the Burke and Hare lodging house. I'll see who it is. Aye. Well, what is it? Could you spare a few pence for a poor old woman? What are you, a beggar? I don't mean to be, but I've had nothing to eat and I've no money to buy lodgings. Well, come in then and rest a while and we'll see what we can do for you. Oh, God bless you, sir. Thank you. Say, Bill, here's a poor old woman with no place to sleep. Well, we have lodgings for travelers. But I have no money, sir. Who said anything about money? Sit ye down, old woman. Thank you, sir. What's your name? I'm the widow Doherty. I can tell by your talk you're Irish. So you're doubly welcome to stay with us. God bless you, gentlemen. We were just about to have a little drop of whiskey. Would you be after joining us, Mrs. Doherty? Oh, I would that. It'll take some of the creek out of me bones. Bring Mrs. Doherty a glass, Bill. Sure, and I will. And fill it for her. And while you're about it, you can fill mine, too. Aye, and me own, too. Tis Hallow Eve, when all good Irishmen should have a draft. Oh, but if it wasn't for you two fine gentlemen, I would have missed mine. Well, here ye are, Mrs. Doherty. Drink hearty. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. And here's good luck to you. As I was saying, Bill, before Mrs. Doherty came in, maybe we can see the doctor tomorrow. Maybe we'll have something for him. It wouldn't surprise me in the least. <coughs> oh, your whiskey is full of fire. <coughs> Just taking a hold with a will. Would you like to lie down, Mrs. Doherty? <coughs> I think maybe I'd better. Put her in the small room in the back, Bill. Why put her in there? Let the old woman have a good room in the front. What difference does it make? I say the old lady's got to have a good room with a soft bed in it. And I say she goes in the little room. That's plenty good enough for paupers. I won't have it. As long as I have something to say about this house, she goes into the good room. Are you looking for a bit of a fight, Bill? Not looking for it. Neither am I avoiding it. You seem to be spiling for one. You think so, do you? I do, but no hare was ever afraid of a bark. Well, then take that <gasps> and see how you like oh, it. Oh, so you've hit me, will ye? I'll break this chair over your head. Oh, gentlemen, Out gentlemen, of the way, sir. old woman. I'll not be letting you fight about me. So oh, you don't it. like us fighting, do you? Well, how do you like this? Uh, oh, Grab her oh, arm, Bill, him. and I'll get her nose and mouth. Oh, oh, Hold on, Bill. Oh, I'll have her out oh, in the... Maybe we'll take a trip to the oh. doctor after all. In less than 15 minutes, Mrs. Doherty was just another anatomical subject. The time is the next afternoon, and the two men are waiting for darkness so they can take their latest victim to Dr. Knox. If you'd had the least bit of sense, you'd never have let that other woman, that gray woman, into the house at a time like this. Why did you do it? 
long as we've got a lodging house, we've got to take in lodgers, don't we? But not while we've got the old woman's corpse hid under that bed. There's no telling. Well, I've been at the woman a room. We've got to make the best of it. And such a woman. A peep and pry an English woman. She peeps and pries too much. She'll take a trip to Dr. Knox along with Mrs. Doherty. Oh, no, she won't. She has relatives who know she's staying here. But what can we do? Somebody must stay in this room until we get rid of the old woman. Don't you leave this room till I come back. Where are you going? Down to get more whiskey. It's that gray woman. Uh, come in. I can't find Miss Stockings. I wonder if it left it under that bed. No, you didn't, Mrs. Gray. Do you mind if I look? Yes, I do. Keep away from that bed. What have you got hidden under there? Nothing that concerns nosy people like you. Now get out of here and stay in your own room. My, what a bear. Boo! I'm going out, Mrs. Gray. And when I come back, I want you out of the house. My, what a terrible person, Mr. Gray. I should think he'd drive all your custom away. Yes, Mum. Have you a few potatoes I could borrow, Mr. Eyre? Sorry, Mum, but I'm after having none. I thought you kept some under that there bed. Will you stop talking about that bed? There's someone at your front door. I hear them. Well, why don't you answer the knock? And why don't you keep your nose out of other people's business? No, right, all right, I'm coming. Now I'll see what they've got hidden under that there bed. Oh, holy mother, it's a dead woman. Darkness had barely set in when Burke and Hare started for the rooms of Dr. Knox with Mrs. Doherty's body securely nailed in a tea chest. Again, they're at the doctor's back door. Oh, it's you two. Hmm. Good evening. We got something for you, Doctor. That's splendid. Bring it in. Grab hold of the box, Bill. Aye, I've got it. Put it on the floor over there. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, let it down, Bill. Aye. It is only an old woman, Doctor. Bodies be hard to get these days. I'm content with whatever I can secure. Shall I open the box, Doctor? If you will, please. I'll get the hammer. He feel better now. Yes, that Mrs. Gray can nose around all she wants to now. Aye. Much she'll be able to find. Here's the hammer. Oh, thank ye, sir. Thank ye. And who would that be? I don't know. I don't want anyone coming in here while you two are in the house with that subject in the box. Open in the name of the law. The police. What will we do? There's nothing we can do but open the door. But if the police find us here in that box right in the middle of the room? If you don't open the door, I shall be compelled to break it down. One moment, officer. Don't open that door, doctor. Please don't. Well, are these the men? Yes, officer, they are. And is that the box? Yes, that there tea chest he's trying to eye. By what right do you come here, officer? I have information that those two men came here with a box. And I have reason to believe the box contains the body of an old woman. I know nothing about it. Well, open the box and I'll look for myself. Very well. Open the box, you two, and let the officer see its contents. Uh, but, doctor... You heard the doctor. Open the box. Aye, sir. And I'm sure when you do open it, you'll find the body of the same old woman I saw under the bed. Then you did give her a chance to look under the bed. I couldn't help it. I had to answer the door. Open that box. Trafficking in dead bodies is a very serious thing, Doctor. I know the law, officer. It's only serious for the cellar. And what does that mean to us? It means that if this box contains a body, you two are in trouble. What for? For unlawful selling of bodies. Is that all? Isn't that enough? Look, officer, look. It is the old woman I told you of. Burke and Hare, in the name of the Crown, I place you under arrest. Even at that, these two reprobates might have escaped with fairly light prison sentences if Hare hadn't weakened and confessed the whole sordid mess. Burke was hanged. But Hare saved his neck by being a witness for the crown. He died a blind beggar in the streets of London. Listen for the next story by the police reporter who brings you the strange murder mysteries of the world. This is a radio release production.
God cars. The story you're about to hear is true. Details are supplied from official case files by the South African police. Only names and places have been changed to protect innocent people involved. Johannesburg, April the 10th, 9.17 p.m. A police patrol car is prowling the Hillbrow area. The occupants are Constables Maber and MacDonald. The hippies are waving to you, Pete. <laughs> yeah. Friends of yours? Oh, they always wave. What do you think of them? Ach, they're a dirty lot. They'd all look a lot better if they took a bath now and again and cut their hair. <laughs> it's funny, yeah. They don't give us much trouble. True. You know, I often look at them and wonder how they'd shape on the farm. Yeah, might do them a lot of good. See that? He's in a hurry. Shut up, Claim Street. Let's go and take a look. You can't go up there. It's a one-way street. No, I should up twist and try and get onto him in Kotsa Street. Hold tight. Been a quiet night so far. It always is midweek. It's Friday and Saturday the fun and games start. Everybody seems to be wanting a party on the weekends. Right. Left it to Claim Street. Can you see him? 67 Delta, wasn't it? Yeah. No, hang on a sec. Yes, he's slowed down for their robot down the bottom there by Caroline Street. Right. Keep a sharp lookout. You drive well, Pitt. Thanks. There he goes, straight down. Still in a hurry, too. I wonder what his case is. Let's pull him over and find out. Straight through that red light. Careful, Pitt. I'm watching it. He used to be heading for Louis Botha Avenue. That should be interesting. You'll think he's on the racetrack. Light screen, you can go. Get around the corner, you should be able to see him. Do you think he knows we're onto him? I don't know yet. There he is, going like a rocket. Right, my beauty. turning. Off to the left. What street's that? Elm Street. Watch it, there's a robot. Where does Elm Street go? Monroe Drive, down to Alton. No chance of cutting him off. You'll just have to sit on his tail. He'll have to slow down for Monroe Drive. It's not a road you can negotiate at speed. There's that hairpin bend halfway down. Yeah, I remember it. He'll write himself off if he doesn't slow down. There he is. I'm gaining on him. Flashing with your lights. There's only one man in the car. Yeah, seems to be. He knows we're following him. Look at him go. Fool. See that? Bunt the curb. He's turning right. So are we. What street's this? Um, uh, St. Patrick Road. We've got him. Why? It's a dead end. Sure. Positive. Yes, he's slowing down. Don't give him a chance to turn around. I won't. He's going up that drive. No, no, he stopped. He thinks he's going to turn around. Okay. We'll park right across his rear bumper. Careful, Pitt. He's reckless. Whew, there, he's all yours. Thanks. What's your hurry? There, there was somebody chasing me. It was us. Where's the fire? I haven't done anything. You'd run true if you saw that somebody was chasing you. If you thought somebody was playing the fool, you could have pulled over and let them pass. I wasn't taking any chances. Not much, you weren't. You're lucky you're still alive the way you've been driving. Is this your car? Yes. Show me the keys. There you are. What's the registration number of this car? Uh, just a minute. Don't fluster me. Uh... Registration number. <laughs> I know it as well as my own name. Yeah. Are you sure you didn't pick it up for a joyride? Uh, no, no. It, it's mine. Where do you live? In the Free State. Whereabouts in the Free State? Uh, Lutzville, near Bloemfontein. What are you doing in Joburg? Well, I came up for the Randy's to show. I've got to keep abreast of developments. 
You don't look like a farmer. You don't look like a policeman. He's drunk. I am not. For your information, I'm slightly inebriated. Been celebrating? No. I've been drowning my sorrows. I've got to go home at the end of the week, and I don't want to go home. Why not? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? Come on, ma'am. Pull yourself together. What's your name? Barrington. First name? David. What's the registration number of this car? OLV394. Well? It's his, all right. I told you! Quiet, man. You'll wake the street. Mm. What are we going to do with him? He's not fit to drive, that's for sure. We're going to take him in? Yes, I think we'd better for his own good. The state is a danger to himself as well as other drivers. Okay. Move over, Mr. Barrington. Uh, 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 uh. I'm driving. Not anymore. Move over. Do you think you can drive this car? Move over and I'll show you. Okay, but Diana's not going to like this, you know. Who's Diana? That's my wife. She gives me a hard time. Hmm. I bet it's nothing compared with the time you give her. Shall we take him to Hospital Hill? Yeah. Okay, I'll see you there. Hey, what's Hospital Hill? It's a local police station. Am I in trouble? A bit. Diana's not going to like this. I promised I'd keep out of trouble. I gave her my word of honor. And that's the only reason she let me come to Joburg. It's automatic. Can you manage it? I think so. What do you farm? Mealies and cattle when the drought will let me. It's hit you hard, has it? Uh, it's hit everybody hard. The Prime Minister said that it was one of the worst catastrophes to hit this country. Very concerned about it. Couldn't have hit you that badly. What are you talking about? All my cattle died, didn't they? You're driving a brand new car. You've got money enough to come up to Joburg for a week. Ah, uh, oh, that's my little hobby. What's that? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know, eh? So you've got another source of income besides farming. I didn't say that. Not in so many words. It so happens that I have a father-in-law who's rather well-to-do. Not short of a bob or two isn't Redford's Llewellyn. <laughs> it was Redford's Llewellyn who set me up, on condition that I looked after Diana properly. And do you? Well, it's a battle, let me tell you. It's a very difficult girl, highly strung, worries about, worries about all of us. Why? Because of my little hobby. <laughs> I think we'd better let your wife know what's happened to you. Oh, no, no, mustn't do that. She'll never let me go off without her again. I had the devil's own job getting away. I, I don't want to ruin everything. You should have thought of that before you got tanked up like this. Yeah, what's going to happen to me? Well, you'll spend the night as our guest, and in the morning you may pay an admission of guilt. Then you can be on your way. Got any money? <laughs> plenty, plenty. Just a minute, let me show you. How about that, eh? See? You're lucky you've still got that. That's the biggest roll of notes I ever saw. How much is there? Hmm? Well, I don't know. I haven't counted it lately. 9.45 p.m. Hillbrow Police Station. Constables Maybach and McDonald are watching the sergeant on duty take charge of David Beddington's things before locking him up for the night. Um, give me your tie. Uh, when will I get it back? You'll get everything back in the morning. Then why can't I keep it? Regulations. Uh, regulations. Um, and your belt, please. <sighs> My belt. And keys. Uh, these are his, sergeant. Uh, keys. Various. Uh, five. Um, any pens? No yeah, one. Uh, pen. Uh, your wallet. Wallet? Mm. And the money in your possession. Hey? Huh? Are you sure I'm going to get all this back? Everything goes into this canvas bag, and you get a receipt for it. Yeah, but who gets the canvas bag? It goes into the station safe. Okay. I've got lots of money. Big roll. Haven't I, Constable? That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, here you are. Hmm. Got it, Constable. Right, Sergeant. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10s. 260 runt. And there's 2 runt. 
about 22, 23, 4, 5, 27 cents. 262 runs and 27 cents. Mm. 262, 27. Yeah, it's a lot of money. It's income from what he calls his hobby. Yeah. Well, what's that? He's not telling. It's probably the horses. No, no, it's not the horses. You're not even warm. Well, I'm not in the mood for games. Frisk him, Constable. All right, Sergeant. Is that the lot? No, Sergeant. Just a minute. Something in the match pocket of his jacket. Now, pull it out. Let's have a look. Hey, hey, you can't have that. That's my good luck. Here we are. Let's see. What is it? It's an uncut diamond, Sergeant. <laughs> it's part of my little hobby. <laughs> April the 11th, 9.05 a.m. Having been called from the Witwatersrand Divisional Headquarters, Lieutenant Anderson of the Diamond and Gold Staff is interviewing David Bevington in an office at the Hillbrow Police Station. Got a hangover? Yes. From all accounts, you deserve one. You're a free stater. Yeah, I am now. How long have you been farming? Ever since I got married. How long's that? Oh, three years. Is it your farm? No, it's my wife's, actually. I'm running the place for her. I see. All right, well, where did you get all this money? It's money for my expenses while I'm in Joburg. I didn't ask you what it was for. I asked you where you got it. I drew it from the bank. Well, we can check on that. This, uh, this diamond... Don't you know it's against the law to have uncut diamonds in your possession? No. Where'd you get it? Found it. Where? In a river on my farm. And where's that? Lutzville. It's near Bloemfontein, isn't it? Yes. But that's not a diamond area. No. You just found the one? Yes. Hmm. It's a big one. You might get three carrots out of it when it's cut. Yes. You realize I must confiscate it? That's the law? Yes. Sorry. I'm sorry, I don't believe your story either. You know what? What? You're going home to Lutzville today. Eh? Yes. And I'm going with you. Lutzville in the Free State, 2.57 p.m. The car in which Lieutenant Anderson and David Bellington have traveled from Johannesburg pulls up outside the house on the farm called Inverdur. A young woman comes out to greet them. Hello? You're back early? Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Uh, Diana, this is Lieutenant Anderson. He's a policeman. Oh. Mrs. Barrington. I told you it would come to this. That's enough. I told you they'd catch you. They always do. I've told him nothing. He knows nothing. He's right, Mrs. Barrington. I'm hoping you'll persuade him to help me. It'll be a pleasure. Are you out of your mind? No. But I shall be if a stop isn't put to this business here and now. Just remember what's at stake. Do you think I've forgotten? He's with me every moment of the day. Now, look. Before you all get so excited that I can't make head or tail of what you're trying to tell me... We're not telling you anything. Quiet, man. I haven't finished. I suggest we sit down and try and keep our heads. Do you want to be inside or out? Ah, it's too nice to sit indoors. Lovely sunny day like this. Yes. It was days like this that started it all. I'm sorry? These aren't nice days for a farmer, Lieutenant. Nice days are when it rains. Oh, I see. Yes, of course. We were doing all right till the rains passed us by. Please, Diana, I beg of you. Listen, my lad. You're in trouble up to your neck. I can see your wife is trying to make things easier for you. Now sit down and keep quiet. Sorry, Mrs. Barrington. We were paying our way, just. We'd got the books into the black... Dave's always wanted to be a farmer for as long as he can remember. Cattle are his life. He loves cattle. We had Herefords. Nice little herd. Bull and everything. They all died. I thought Dave would die too. I've never seen a man so cut up. It's not nice for a wife to see that in her husband. 
We went to my father for credit, and he just couldn't help us. He was in trouble himself. Dave was desperate. Rather foolishly, he blamed himself. He felt he'd failed. But it was the drug. Yes, we needed money desperately. We had to have money, otherwise the place would have been put up for sale. And you can buy a farm cheaply in times like this. Mm. Anyway, Dave started drinking. Took to going to Bloemfontein. First he used to tell me that he went there on farm business. But later when the money appeared, I knew there was something going on. He used to tell me it was money he'd won at poker. I knew he was lying. Then one day I forced the truth out of him. How much did you win this time? Uh, over 200 rod. You never told me you were a gambling man. Well, it's a talent I didn't know I had. Oh, Dave, don't you think you've kidded me long enough? Oh, what do you mean? I'm not a fool, you know. You're just not the poker-playing type. Where do you suppose I get the money, then? Oh, I don't know. All sorts of funny ideas occur to me in the small hours of the morning. When I can't sleep for worrying about you. Oh. I sometimes think you steal it. Oh, come on. Sometimes I think it must be involved in IDB. What do you know about IDB? I know what I've read. I've got no first-hand experience of it at all. Have you? Don't be ridiculous. Dave. Dave, you're blushing. So what? I've hit the nail right on the head, haven't I? No. Yes, I have. Where do you go? What do you do? It's best if you know nothing. Dave, I have a right to know. I'm your wife. I go to Maseru. Masutu? Yes, that's right. What do you do there? I, I meet a man. What man? I don't even know his name. And? Look, if you breathe one word of this, I'm going to be in big trouble. Go on. Well, this man gives me a parcel. A little parcel. Diamonds? And I have to bring them across the border. Where to? All different places. Lady Brand, Vipina, Redisburg. I even went to Zestron once. The time you were away for the weekend. That's right. Haven't you ever stopped to consider what would happen if they caught you? Well, of course I have. What? Oh, look, Diana, IDB's... Well, it's almost a national pastime. Everybody does it. No, they don't. Not decent, honest, law-abiding folks. It's against the law. Oh, well, so's buying a raffle ticket. Oh, please. That's not the same thing at all. You can't equate a sports club raffle with, with trading in diamonds. What happens if you get caught? I pay a fine. And the next time? A bigger fine. Until you finally wind up in prison. Oh, I won't. What's going to happen to me and Nicholas, then? Oh, don't be silly, Diana. I can take care of myself. How is Nicky, by the way? Yes, you have to ask. You're never at home, so you wouldn't know how he is. Anyway, things went on like that for quite a while. I tried to talk to David about how worried I was, but he'd always fob me off. I never got anywhere. Eventually, my nerves couldn't stand it anymore. I was terrified. Every time David left the house, I became convinced I'd never see him again. Finally, there was a showdown. It's time for you to choose. It's either them or me. W what do you mean? Quite simple. Unless you tell your IDB pals that you won't run any more diamonds across the border for them, I'm going, and I'm taking Nicky with me. Did you hear what I said? Yes. Well... Look, I couldn't live without you and Nicky. Dave, I'm begging you. Tell them you won't do it anymore. We, we've made plenty of money, more than enough. Oh, my dad's beginning to ask awkward questions. He's not a fool, you know. Oh, please, Dave. Okay. I'll tell them after the next run. And he did. He was as good as his word. And what happened? I think you'd better tell the lieutenant about that, Dave. Well, I... You know, it was nearly a week later. I came from the lens. The sun had just gone. Darling! Uh, <laughs> darling's here. I'm too, darling. Dave! Oh, Dave, they've been here an hour. Yeah, they're <laughs> waiting for the IDB farmer to come home. Isn't that right, Joey boy? <laughs> what are you doing? What do you want? <laughs> we came to bring you a message. Didn't we, Joey boy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Janssen thinks you've been a very naughty boy. He sent Joey and me to bring you back into life. They threatened to hit me. 
<laughs> oh, tell the lady to keep quiet, <laughs> Joey yeah, boy. Yeah, shut up. You can't talk to my wife like that. <laughs> now, now, don't get excited. Otherwise, you'll make Joey boy nervous. And he might drop the baby. Nicky? <laughs> hey, Joey boy. Accidents will happen. <laughs> what do you want? Mr. Janssen says that things had better stay the way they were. Otherwise? Otherwise, your family might come to harm. <laughs> you wouldn't dare. <laughs> your wife's a pretty woman. You wouldn't want us to change that, would you? What? What's that? It's a razor. <laughs> a cutthroat razor. Very sharp. Sharp and nasty. <laughs> hey, Joey boy. <laughs> oh, they, they mean what they say, then. That's right. Either you do the trips again, or else. Oh, Dad, Dad, promise them anything. Say you'll do it. Just get her to go away and leave us alone. And that's how they got me back into the game. I had no choice. So what were you doing in Johannesburg? Tell him, Dave. Well, Diana had packed her things. She couldn't take any more. She was leaving me. I couldn't face that, so I roared off into Johannesburg with a pocket full of money. I just wanted to forget everything. You... you really want to get out of this game? I'd give anything. As long as Diana and my boy will be all right. Well, if we round up the whole gang, what can they do? And those across the border. The police in Maseru will be only too pleased to hear about them. Yeah, what about me? What do I get out of it all? As a state witness, you'd get off very lightly. And you'll have something money can't buy. And what's that? Peace of mind. Well, what do you say? Okay. What do you want me to do? April the 21st. The border post at Maseru. David Bennington has crossed the border in his car, and he's met by Lieutenant Anderson. Got the stuff? Yes. Good. Switch on the radio we fixed under your dashboard. We've installed a portable radio transmitter just over the border. Okay. Testing. Testing. Are you receiving us? Over. Loud and clear. Over. Good. You're to maintain radio silence to this vehicle from here on. Just listen. Over. Message received and understood. Over and out. What's your destination, David? Tabanchu. Joey's going to meet me there. He'll get into the car and tell me where to go from there. Right. Now, just before we get to Tabanchu, you lock me in the boot. And do what? I'll tell you. 4.17 p.m. Outside a private house on the outskirts of Tabanchu, David Bennington and the man called Joey have taken the parcel of diamonds into the house and handed them over to the man called Janssen. Bennington tells them to come outside to the car. He says he has something to show them in the boot. Is it something you picked up in Lesotho? No, it was just the side of the border, as a matter of fact. Bill Tong, I bet you. Just let me uh, get it open. <sighs> All right, you lot. Hey, I'm a police hey, officer. Oh, stand where you are. are. Here comes the car with Captain Bryant and his men. Come on, Terry, let's get out of here. Yes. Stand where you are. Mr. Janssen! Ah, Mr. Janssen! <laughs> arrested at the house in Tabanchu. Five more were apprehended in Bloemfontein. They constituted a gang of IDB operators which had eluded the police for many months. The manner of their apprehension was praised by the judge in the Supreme Court where the men eventually stood trial. One of the men was discharged and the other eight received sentences ranging from a 500 round fine to 10 years in prison. As a state witness, David Bennington was given a suspended sentence, and he and his wife Diana were reunited. His little hobby had grown till it became a way of life 
it could have had tragic consequences for his family. They prowl the empty streets at night, waiting. In fast cars, on foot, living with crime and violence, these men are on duty 24 hours out of every 24. They face dangers at every turn, expecting nothing less. They protect the people of South Africa. These are the men of Squad Cars. Headquarters. Just a minute, I'll connect you with homicide. Homicide detail, Captain Harris. This is uh, Lawrence French, manager of the Melody Theater. I wish you'd hurry right over here. Uh, what's wrong, Mr. French? Well, uh, we're not sure yet. It uh, looks like a murder. Who is it? One of our performers, a girl. I, I wish you'd hurry right over here and see what you can make of it. All right, I will. And, uh, Captain. Yeah? Uh, come to the stage door with as little noise as possible. The show's still on, and we want to avoid any excitement. All right, sir. Oh, uh, Murphy. Yes, sir. Hey, Weaver. Yes, sir. You two men get your things. Flashlight powder or camera. And Murphy. Yes, sir. Uh, get a fingerprint outfit and meet me in front. Uh, yes, sir. Where to, Captain? To the Melody Theater. Okay. Somebody has a nice little show all arranged for us. Try to cut in on this alley without attracting any attention, Weaver. All right, Captain. Yeah, that's good. Now, I'll turn into the stage entrance here. All right. Now, come on. Don't make any noise. Watch these steps. Here, take this camera, Murphy. Are you the officers? Uh, yes. Uh, where's Mr. French? He's expecting you up front there in the dressing room. Oh, good. Anybody gone out by this door since he called us? No, sir. I've been on this door every minute. Yeah, all right, Pop. You stay on this door. If anyone tries to leave, call me or one of the boys here. You bet I will, sir. Come on, boys. Now, watch his ropes, Tap. You don't want to knock anything down. Yeah, pretty swell joint, isn't it? Yeah, all these lights blind me, though. Yeah, here we are. Hey, where's... Uh, the... You're the officer from headquarters? Yeah. In this dressing room right here. He's uh, lying right over there. Oh. Stabbed. In the back. Anything been moved? No, sir. I saw to that. Uh, who's this fellow? He was caught trying to slip out. His name is, uh, Prince. What's your full name? Tom Prince. Know this girl? Uh, yes. Yes, I know. I I've been quite friendly with her, but I didn't do it. Do you hear? I didn't do it. Well, who says you did? This man here, French. Yeah, what about it, Mr. French? Well, the call boy tried to get this girl to answer for her second number, but there was no response. He opened the door and saw her lying on the floor with that knife on her back. He immediately called me. Now, wait a minute. Who is this girl? Her name is Marsh. Helen Marsh. She works in a knife-throwing act. It's a number two spot right now. She's supposed to make a quick change and stand in on an Oriental number. Did she go through her knife act tonight? Yes. And when the call boy called her for the Oriental number, she was dead, huh? That's right. Uh, how much time is consumed between the knife act and the Oriental number? Oh, about uh, ten minutes. And she could have been killed at any time during that ten minutes, huh? That's right. Well, where does this man fit in? Uh, Mr. Prince has been uh, one of Miss Marsh's admirers. He went with her quite steadily, I believe. Earlier this evening, they had some words, and uh, Miss Marsh told him to leave. How'd you find that out? Well, from the other actors, it's common knowledge. Backstage gossip, you know. I see. Well, what's your story, Prince? What he told you is true. I did go with Helen, Miss Marsh. I've gone with her for a month or so, nearly every evening. Well, earlier tonight, my brother told me that she'd come to him demanding money or she'd involve me in a scandal of some sort. I didn't believe him, and we both came to the theater before the show tonight to see her. I see. Your brother came with you? Yes. He made Miss Marsh admit she was only trying to work me for some money, and we both left just as Jose came in. Jose? Who's he? Jose Gonzalez, her partner in the knife throwing act. Oh. Well, where did you and your brother go after leaving here? I had some passes, so we took in the show. He's still out there, I guess. You were seeing the show with him? Yes. 
Then how do we find you back here, with Mr. French telling us that you were caught trying to leave? Oh, during the show, I got to thinking that maybe Helen had some reason for saying what she did. So I came back through an exit door to give her another chance to explain. I told my brother I was going out for a smoke. I see. And your brother is still sitting out in front? Yes, and unless he got tired of waiting for me and left. Yeah, we'll find out about that. Well, what did you see when you came back here? Well, I knew Miss March was in a dressing room between acts, so I knocked on the door and walked in. Yeah, and then... And Helen Moss was lying just as you see her now, with that knife sticking out of her back. What did you do? I closed the door and tried to get back to the theater, but Mr. French caught me. Yes, the call boy had already notified me. I see. Well, Mr. French, there's only one thing to do. That is, to empty the house, see if this man's brother is in the audience, and bring him back here. Also, I want to see this Jose Gonzalez. If I'm not mistaken, that knife that's sticking in her back looks very much like one he'd used. Uh, as you say, Captain, but... Uh... Can't you wait until later, say, after the last show to make your investigation? I'm sorry, but we'll do it my way. Dismiss the audience and see if this other Mr. Prince is in the theater and tell all the performers to remain in their dressing rooms until I see them. As you wish. I'm sorry to have to do this, Mr. French, but murder is a serious matter. I understand. I'll inform the audience right after this number. All right. Now, don't frighten them. Just make some excuse, refund if necessary. That's up to you. I'll handle it. Yeah, get those pictures now, Weaver. Well, I'm sorry, buddy, but you'll have to stick around. Looks like you're in a spot. Well, I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. Uh, we'll see. Ladies and gentlemen, we are forced to ask your indulgence in view of a tragedy which has just happened backstage. The remainder of tonight's performance will be canceled. Uh, there's no reason for excitement. Uh, those of you who wish may get the price of their seats refunded at the box office. If a Mr. Prince is in the house... Brother of Mr. Tom Prince, he is wanted backstage. A little music, please, Temple. You say you never saw this knife before? No, it is painted like the rest of my knives. But this one is not like the rest. It does not uh, have the balance. And as these other actors say, you were downstairs playing poker from immediately after your act until now, huh? Yes, uh, I did not know this until I am told. Uh, all right, you can go. Uh, dismiss the rest of the cast, too, French. I'm through with them. Yes, Captain. Oh, see who it is. Where's my brother? What has happened to my brother? Now, wait a minute. Who said anything had happened to your brother? Well, it was announced that there had been a tragedy backstage. My brother has not returned to his seat. Oh, you're Tom Prince's brother? Yes. I am Dr. Prince. Uh, did you know that your brother was coming backstage? No. He told me he was going out for a smoke. Where is he? What's happened to him? Eh, nothing has happened to him. He's right in the next room. Dr. Prince, it looks very much like your brother is in a jam. Jam? What sort of a jam? Helen Marsh was found dead in the next room. Dead? Yes. And we suspect your brother of the murder. It's impossible. Ridiculous. Yeah, nevertheless, it looks bad for him. Mr. French here found him trying to sneak out. Who is Mr. French? This gentleman in the tuxedo. He's the manager of the theater. Oh. May I see my brother? Yeah, sure. Yeah, get him, Weaver. Yes, sir. John. John, I'm glad you're here. They've got me in an awful mess. Now, break up, John. I want you to answer just one question. Did you kill Helen Mark? Oh, no, no, for heaven's sake. No, don't you believe me either? Yes, Tom, I believe you. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Prince, but I don't. I'll have to take him down for questioning. Uh, may I see the body? I'm a physician, you know. Uh, I guess it'll be all right. In here. There. Hmm. Stabbed. Yeah. What's more, she was stabbed while facing her killer. How do you know that? By the position of the knife. It was driven into her body by a left-handed man who reached over her right shoulder and drove the knife home. Oh. My brother is right-handed. Yeah, I know, but that doesn't prove anything. It is a point, though. Do you mind if I turn the body over? No. No, I guess not. We have all our pictures. All right, there. Uh, give me a hand here. Yeah, that's it. Ah, she was a good-looking woman, wasn't she? Yes, but terribly unscrupulous. I'm rather inclined to agree with Schopenhauer that women are an unscrupulous race. Schopenhauer? Well, who's he? Well, you probably wouldn't know him. He's an old philosopher. Oh, uh, like Napoleon, huh? Well, hardly. Hmm. Look at this. What'd you find, Doctor? I don't know exactly. Look at this little round bruise in the center of her forehead, about the size of a pea. Birthmark, maybe. Not this. There's coagulation of blood here. It's a bruise. 
Well, from what? Her fall? Mm, no. What caused it then? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to decide. Let me see. Captain, how does this sound? Does it sound reasonable to you? When Helen Marsh started playing around with my brother with the obvious intention of getting all the money she could, she invoked the displeasure of someone else. Yeah, but... Now, that someone had spent a lot of money on this Marsh girl. Done a lot for her. And when he found out that her game was making suckers out of men like my brother, he resented it even more than my brother did. Well, it's a sense that whoever killed her must not have liked her very much. Well, granted. Now, this man finds out what sort of a woman she is, and he gets very angry. He plans to kill her and throw suspicion on Jose, the knife thrower, by using a gilded knife, like the one in the act. Well, maybe. Now, the killer sneaked back here and between acts entered the room. He embraced her with his left arm over her right shoulder and with her face pressed firmly to his chest to suppress the scream. He drove the knife into her body and fled. Well, sounds okay. The murderer left one little clue, Captain. Yeah, what was that? A small bruise on Helen Marsh's forehead. Captain, how tall is this Marsh girl? Oh, five, one or two. Mm, there are five even, I'd say. And how tall is one of us men? Say, French over here. Oh, about six feet. Then Helen Marsh, standing up and facing one of us, would stand with the top of her head just under our chin? Yeah, but... Captain, that mark on Helen Marsh's forehead was made by just one thing. A stud. A tuxedo stud on the front of a man's shirt, such as French is wearing. And Captain... All right, what the... There. What and Frenchy's shirt front of the marks of Helen Marsh's lips, where he pressed a rouged mouth close to his body to keep her from screaming. There's your murderess, the theater manager. Police headquarters. All right, Captain. Hello, Tim. Send a car to the Melody Theater. The manager's just confessed to murder. Police headquarters. to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. An unidentified woman is found murdered in a hotel room. Cause of death, strangulation. There's no lead to the identity of the killer. Your job, find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 27th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 1.35 p.m. when we got to the old central jail building, third floor, the crime lab. How you doing, Link? Hi, Ben. Joe? How's it going? Did you check the stuff yet? Yeah, most of it. Come on back here. Okay. Well, this is all of it. Did you find anything we can get a lead out of? Nothing too good, no. I don't think you could identify it from what we've got here. The morgue post the body yet? Yeah, just this morning. How about fingerprints, Lee? Did they find any in that hotel room? No foreign prints, no. Dead end there. What about the woman's purse? Did she show anything? No chance. You can see the fabric here. Won't take a print. Yeah. Contents of the purse here, usual stuff. Mm -hmm. Comb, lipstick, keychain, one key on it. Half pack of chewing gum, coin purse, a dime, two nickels in it. That's all of it. Yeah. 
According to the room clerk at the hotel, she had a wallet with her when she checked in. There was no sign of that, was there? Nope. No sign of it in the hotel room, either. Checked everything. Is that the only piece of jewelry found on the body, that wedding ring there? Yeah, it's a cheap ring. No markings on it. No way of tracing it. About the only thing I can tell you, she was pretty well dressed. That's an expensive bag there. Yeah. Sure not a cheap dress, either. Same for a coat and shoes. They cost some money, too. How about labels on any of that stuff? One on the coat. Yeah? You can see right here. Ben with Department Store, Los Angeles. Coat's fairly new. They might be able to give you something on it. Yeah, maybe. The people at the hotel, got anything there? Well, it could have been better, Lee. The woman checked in last night around 8 o'clock. She registered as John Ross and wife, L.A. Anyone see the man with her? No, nobody. Room clerk says the woman came in alone. She said her husband was out parking the car, so she registered for both of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Clerk said he left the desk a few minutes after that. Figures the man must have come in sometime while he was gone. Nobody on duty at the desk after midnight. He could have left the hotel any time after that without being seen. She registered at 8 p.m. The coroner says she died about 10.30. You're not even sure there was a man with her, right? Yeah, the woman who was registered next door to the murder room. She told us she heard a man and a woman arguing. It was about 10 o'clock. Said it got pretty loud. Hmm. No idea who the woman really was, huh? I suppose that John Ross and wife business doesn't mean anything. That's pretty doubtful. About all we got to go on is the physical description from the coroner. She was a small woman. Five foot one... Ninety-nine and a quarter pounds, wasn't that it, Ben? Mm, yeah. Brown hair, blue eyes, about 31, 32 years old. We got our prints off to Washington. Got any ideas? We figured maybe it could be a psycho killer. How'd you figure? A coroner's report listed strangulation as the cause of death. Yeah? Whoever did it made sure her neck was broken. At approximately 6 o'clock that morning in a second-floor room of a downtown hotel, the body of an unidentified woman was found murdered. Preliminary investigation failed to reveal the true identity of the victim or the killer. As far as physical evidence was concerned, there wasn't much to go on. The deep bruises on her neck and throat, along with the crushed vertebrae at the base of her skull, indicated a savage attack. 1.55 p.m. Through the label on the dead woman's coat, we traced the garment to a department store where it had been purchased, but they had no record on it. It was a cash purchase, and the sales girl couldn't remember the customer. Investigation during the next two days failed to turn up any leads. We showed a morgue picture of the victim to bartenders, waitresses, parking lot attendants in the vicinity of the hotel. They couldn't identify her. We rechecked tenants and employees at the hotel. That got us nothing. Thursday, 5.48 p.m. One answer I'd sure like to find. Yeah? The victim was a nice-looking woman, well-dressed, nice clothes. How come she'd stay in a cheap hotel down in the neighborhood like that? It doesn't jibe for my money. Well, that's hard to say. Sure got me stopped. Two days leg working with no play. Well, we might be in better shape when we get that kickback from Washington. I sure hope so. Go ahead. Hey, uh, excuse me? Well, yes, sir. Can we help you? Well, no, I don't know. Guess that all depends. I'm waiting for a couple of detectives here. Well, who is it you wanted to see? A couple of detectives. Well, who are they? Well, it's pretty confidential, you know, I have to talk to them. He told me to see Friday and Romero. Ben Friday and Joe Romero, detectives handling the case. Yes, sir. I'm Joe Friday. This is my partner, Ben Romero. Uh, we're handling the case. What do you want to see us about? You said you were working on that murder case? That woman they found in the hotel? Yes, sir. That's right. That's so? I see your badges? Yes, sir. Here's our identification. Mm-hmm. Read about that murder in the paper, you know. You better come over here. Yeah. You're going to thank me for this. I got all you want to know about that murder. You mind telling us your name, sir? I don't mind. Al P. Morgan. I was a good friend of hers, you know. I used to work with her. You mean the dead woman? It's the same one. I never forget a face. Maud McLeod. Saw that picture in the paper and I said to myself, there's old Maud. You're pretty sure of that, are you, Mr. Morgan? Sure, I'm sure. Maud McLeod used to work together in the circus. Maud was a bareback girl, you know, best in the country, real trooper. What makes you so sure it's the same woman, Mr. Morgan? Uh, when was the last time you saw this friend of yours, this Maud McLeod? Well, I used to see her all the time. Worked the old cells photo together. Got a photo of her. You mind if we take a look at it, sir? That's why I came down here. I want to help out. She's got to be identified. Well, let's see. Got it here somewhere. It's old Maud in her circus costume. Yeah. Here it is. Take a look at that. That's Maud, ain't it? Mm, well, I don't know, sir. There doesn't seem to be too much resemblance here. Is that right? Afraid you've made a mistake, Mr. Morgan. Thanks for your cooperation, anyhow. Appreciate you coming in. 
Oh, sure, it was Maud. I get it. Homicide Friday. Oh, yeah, Frank, uh-huh. Is that right? What'd it say? Huh? Yeah. Okay, fine. No, we'll pick it up. Yeah, thanks. Anything? Communications. They got the kickback from Washington on the dead woman's fingerprints. Any luck? They got her identified. She worked at an aircraft plant during the war. Name's Doris Frazier. I can't help but think you fellas are missing a bet. I knew that dead woman. Well, she's already been identified, Mr. Morgan. We know who she is. Her name's Doris Frazier. That's so. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, what do you think of that? Old Maud. She went and changed her name. Thursday, 6.35 p.m. Ben and I went down the hall to communications and got a copy of the kickback from Washington. The murder victim was identified as Doris Eileen Frazier. She applied for a position as a typist at the Eagle Aircraft plant in Burbank in 1942. Next morning, we checked the personnel office at the plant and we found that Doris Frazier had been employed as a typist from 1942 to 1944. And going over her application, we found her last known address listed as 7346 Oakdale Avenue. Her application stated she was single, with no previous employment, with no known relatives. We could uncover no further information on the girl. We drove across town to the Oakdale Avenue address, a large apartment building in a better-than-average neighborhood. The manager told us that Doris Frazier had lived there up to eight months before. He said that a few weeks before she moved, she was married to a tall, dark-haired man, but he was unable to remember his name. The manager also told us that the newly married couple apparently began having trouble from the day that they were married. We checked the next forwarding address, a boarding house for women in the south end of the city. Ben and I interviewed the woman in charge of Mrs. Frances Watson. We talked to her back in the kitchen of the boarding house while she polished a set of silverware. I saw that picture in the paper. I didn't connect it with Doris, though. She was a much prettier girl when she lived here. You say she left here about 18 months ago, Miss Watson? Yes, maybe a little more. Might be closer to two years. I'd have to check my rent receipts to be sure. Did you happen to know anything about the Frazier girl, Miss Watson? I mean, did you know much about her personal life at all? Well, of course, I always insist on references. Any good boarding house does, you know. Doris was a nice girl in many ways. Of course, she had her shortcomings. I suppose we all do. When she first came here, she seemed like such a nice girl, and then she started to go downhill. I just don't know what got into her. Well, how do you mean, ma'am? Was she in some kind of trouble? Well, of course, when she first came here, we didn't know it, but she was married. This is a home for single girls, and we have our rules and regulations just like any other respectable place. Yes, ma'am, we understand. Well, as we came to find out later, Doris wasn't only married, but she was fighting with her husband. I understand he wasn't much at all. She was thinking of getting a divorce, as a matter of fact. Well, did you ever meet her husband, Miss Watson? No, I never did. I suppose it's just as well I didn't. I understand that Doris left him after they'd been married only a few months. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you know what his name is, ma'am? No, I have no idea. Or Doris always used a maiden name when she was with me. Then you never saw this man, Miss Watson? He never came to the house here? No, I didn't say I never saw him. I said I didn't meet him. Yes, there was once when he came to the house to see Doris. And what was the occasion? You mind telling us about it? Oh, it was most unpleasant, I can tell you that. Let me see now. Yes, Doris had been here about six months. Even by that time, I was beginning to see the real side of the girl. No character, Sergeant. No character at all. It shows up every time. Yes, ma'am. What if you'd go on, please? Uh, well, as I was saying, it was... After about six months, when this man brought Doris home late one night, about a quarter till midnight, I'd say, upset the whole house. How was that, ma'am? The two of them, this man and Doris, they stood right out there in the hall, had a terrible quarrel. Language, it was dreadful. The top of their lungs, too. My husband went out to quiet them down, but the man left before he had a chance to call him down. They upset the whole house. Uh-huh. Now, this man that the Frazier woman was arguing with, you're sure that that was her husband? Well, as sure as I can be. That's what Doris told me, anyway, the day after. I called her in and told her I just couldn't tolerate behavior like that. It upset her quite a bit, I remember. She cried, said it wouldn't happen again. That's when she told me she was trying to get a divorce. Is that what the big argument was about? Would you know that? Yes, she said she wanted a divorce and her husband didn't. He wanted her back with him. Certainly is sad the way some people mix up their lives. Yes, ma'am. Uh, by any chance, did you get a good look at this man, uh, husband, I mean? Well, he was tall and had dark hair. That's about all I remember. Uh, he was well-dressed, too. I see. When Doris Frazier left here, Mrs. Watson, did she leave a forwarding address with you? No, she didn't. I haven't any idea where she moved. What kind of work was she doing while she was living here? Do you have any idea where she was employed? Yes, that was one of the references she gave me. Furniture company down on Venice Boulevard, if I remember correctly. I have the address in my record book. Certainly is unfortunate, the whole thing. Yes, ma'am, it is. He even tried to talk to her before she left. Sat her down and talked to her for a whole afternoon. 
I guess it was just a waste of time. How's that, ma'am? Trouble with her husband. Terrible thing. He seemed to treat her so badly, two of them fighting all the time. I believe she was actually afraid of him. She told me he was very jealous. He drank, ran around. That's why I couldn't understand it. You couldn't understand what, ma'am? Doris, when she moved away from here. Yes, ma'am? She said she was going back with her husband. The landlady, Frances Watson, gave us the address of the furniture store where the murder victim had been employed, and we drove down to check with the personnel manager, a Mr. Collins. He said that Doris Frazier had been fired from her job ten months before. He said she'd been let go because she was constantly late for work and that she got into the habit of asking for salary advances too often. Collins also told us that he'd heard about the trouble between the Frazier woman and her husband. He said he'd seen the husband in the store several times when he came to call for his wife. He identified the husband as Stephen Arnold. The description was approximately the same, a tall, well-dressed man, dark hair, heavy build. The personnel manager gave us the last known address they had on the victim. The following morning, we checked it out, an apartment hotel in the East Wilshire area. She was still registered there, together with her husband, Stephen Arnold, but the desk clerk told us that Arnold hadn't been living there for the past three months. He had no idea where Arnold had moved. He didn't know where he worked. While the desk clerk stood by, Ben and I went upstairs and checked the apartment. Anything, Joe? No, nothing. Nothing in the bedroom. Like Lee says, she goes in for nice clothes. About all I can figure. Well, what you got there? I see it lying on the desk here. Looks like she started the letter and didn't get to finish it. Hmm. What's it say there? Well, it's dated October 23rd. That's over a week ago. It says, uh, Dear George, I've been meaning to write to you before, but and that's all. That's as far as she got. Hmm, George. First time we've run into that name on this deal. Makes more than one man in her life. Yeah, there's a couple of more letters here. They're all addressed to her unopened. Let's see. All we can go by are the return addresses. Telephone bill, ad from a woman's store, postcard, another ad. Here's something. Santa Monica postmark. Yeah. Check the name on that return. Yeah. Stephen Arnold. 12.35 p.m. We called the office and checked Stephen Arnold through R&I. He had no criminal record. The return address, which he'd listed on the envelope of the letter to his wife, was 10826 Pacific Front Boulevard. We located it on the beach just below Santa Monica. It was a small hamburger stand owned and operated by the dead woman's husband. No, I haven't seen Doris for a couple months anyway. Why? I understand you had an apartment with your wife in the East Wilson neighborhood. Is that right, Mr. Arnold? Yeah, that's right. Mind telling us why you left? No, I don't mind. Want to move closer to my work, that's all. That place is way too far out. Well, how is it your wife didn't move with you, sir? She wanted to stay close to town. Doesn't care for the beach much. Bad for his sinus, I guess. Well, did you have an argument with your wife, Arnold? Some kind of a disagreement? Is that one of the reasons you moved? Yeah, you might call it that. We're getting a divorce. Is that so? Yeah, it was the best thing all the way around. It's been nothing but fighting and scrapping the last year anyway. We decided to call it quits. Will you excuse me a minute? I got to put some cold drinks in this cooler here. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, would either you care for a cold drink? No, no thanks. Coke, maybe? No thanks. Did you get the divorce from your wife, Mr. Arnold? Yeah, that's right. I'm divorcing her. Why do you want to know? You remember that last time you saw your wife, the exact date, I mean? No, I don't think I remember that. Been at least three months, I'll say that much. You spend most of your time down here at the beach, do you, Mr. Arnold? Yeah, that's right. I get into town once or twice a month. They sure you would like a Coke. No, no, no thanks. thanks. I think I'll have one myself, if you don't mind. Sure, I get a cold one here. Water sure is cold. How about last Tuesday night, sir? You happened to be in town that night? Oh, last time was two, three weeks ago, anyway. Went in to see a show. I was working here last Tuesday night. Work every night except Monday. It's the only night I'm closed up. Uh huh. Is there anyone who can vouch for that? I don't think I get this. Why do you want to know? Well, is there anybody who can vouch for you? Well, sure. Half a dozen people, anyway. A fellow runs a place next door, and the guys in the rest of the stalls up and down the way here, they can all vouch for me. I work till 1 a.m., same as usual. Hey, just a minute. Hey, Vic! Vic! Yeah, Steve! Hop over here for a minute. Something I want to talk to you about. Yeah, just a minute. Okay, Vic, thanks. He'll be right over. Hey, you fellas want a cup of coffee or anything? No, no I wouldn't. wouldn't. like to have a change for that cigarette machine, though, if you don't mind. Oh, sure, okay. There you are. Oh, thanks. Yes, Steve? Hey, uh, these fellows are detectives, Vic. Uh, guess about some kind of jam my wife got into. They want to know where I was last Tuesday night. Yeah? They want somebody to vouch for me. Sure. 
Did you see Mr. Arnold last Tuesday night? I was working next door. Steve was here all night. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Saturday, October 31st, 2 p.m. Ben and I checked with a dozen different concession operators in the neighborhood of Stephen Arnold's eating place. They all corroborated the fact that on the night his wife had met her death in a downtown hotel, Arnold had been working at his stand until 1 a.m. Despite all the previous indications that he might have been responsible for the murder of his wife, we had to eliminate him as a possible suspect. 2.20 p.m. On the way back into town, we stopped by the apartment hotel where Doris Frazier was living at the time of her murder. After checking further with the tenants and with the help in the building, we found out that the victim had been in the habit of eating most of her meals at restaurants in the immediate neighborhood. After some two hours of checking and running into six restaurants, we found a small coffee shop four blocks from the apartment building where one of the waitresses identified Doris Frazier's picture. Yeah, that's her, officer. Terrible picture, though. She looks so much older. About how often would you say Miss Frazier came in here, ma'am? Well, three or four times a week, I'd say. The bus stop's right out there on the corner. She'd usually have breakfast, then grab the bus and go to work. Some nights coming home from work, she'd stop in here for dinner. Nice girl, quiet. Did you get to know her at all, miss? I mean, did you happen to know any of her friends here in the neighborhood? No, as I say, she was a quiet person, not very talkative. Usually read while she was eating, book or magazine. Uh -huh. Did she ever come in here with anyone else, do you know that? Yeah, quite a few times. She seemed to have a boyfriend. Of course, she was attractive, small, you know, but real cute looking. Uh -huh. Do you happen to know any of these men? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Any one of them in particular she came in with very often? Well, let's see... I think there was one, blonde, good dresser, kind of tall, good looking. They usually came in together for breakfast. How long ago was this, miss, do you recall? Oh, say up until a couple of weeks ago. I usually waited on him in the morning, that's how I happen to remember. I see. Did you ever happen to hear this man's name? Let me see. George, I think that was it, yeah. Uh -huh. Would you happen to know if he lives in the neighborhood? No, sorry, I don't. Has this man been in here during the past week, do you know? Yes, he has. He came in for breakfast. What day was that? This morning. <laughs> Before we left the coffee shop, we questioned the cashier who came up with the information that the man known as George usually left his car parked at the service station across the street. We left our card and asked the cashier to call us in case the suspect returned. At the service station, they also remembered the man known as George, but they told us he hadn't been in for the past month. They'd done some work on his car for him in the past, so they had a record of his license number. We called our DMV and found that the car was registered to a Carl Lucy in East Hollywood. 4.45 p.m. We drove out and interviewed Lucy at his home, but he came nowhere near the description of the suspect. He told us that he had purchased the car six weeks before from a man known as George Crane. He described Crane as tall, blonde, and well-dressed. From the bill of sale, we got Crane's address, a motel on East Manchester. The manager there told us that George Crane had moved a week before. He said that Crane had left no forwarding address, but he did remember where he worked. He was a driller in one of the oil fields down in Long Beach. We checked the oil company's personnel office downtown, but they were closed for the day. 6.18 p.m., we went back to the office and pulled a package on George Crane from R&I. Get anything on him? Yeah, he's got a record. Here's the package here. Yeah. Nothing very heavy. Drunk charge two years ago. Another one last year. Disorderly conduct. Resisting arrest. That's about all. Let's see. Yeah. Description checks out all the way. You called the night office of that oil company, did you? Yeah, they couldn't tell us anything. Said call back first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. Want to reach you? I got it, yeah. Homicide, Friday. Who? How oh, that's... Oh, yeah, sure. Yes, sir. No. No, sir, I'm afraid not. Yeah, thanks anyway. You bet. Yeah. Yeah, goodbye. Well, that does it. Who was it? That guy who was in here the other day. You remember that Alfred P. Morgan or whatever it was? Oh, what did he want? Wanted to buy us a drink. He's celebrating. Huh? His old friend Maud. He just found her. the next morning, we checked with the personnel department of the oil company's downtown offices. They told us that George Crane was employed as a driller, that he'd been working for the company for the past five years, and that he had a good employment record. They told us he was on the day shift and that he was scheduled to report for work on Rig 619 at the Long Beach field at 8 o'clock that morning. Ben and I got in the car and drove down to Long Beach where we located the murder suspect, George Crane, at work in the field. Doris Frazier? No, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I don't think I know anybody by that name. How about Doris Arnold, Mr. Crane? Would you know anybody by that name? Arnold? No, no, I'm afraid not. What's it all about? Do you own a car, do you, sir? 
Yeah, that's it right over there, that dark sedan. Yeah. Have you had it long? Oh, I've had it a couple of weeks. Last one I had was giving me a lot of trouble. Did you trade it in? No, I sold it to a private party. Fell out in Hollywood. You mind taking a look at this picture, Mr. Crane? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't look like anybody I know. Why, am I supposed to? We think you should, yes, sir. I don't think I'll follow you. Do you spend any time around the East Wiltshire district, Crane? East Wiltshire, you said? Yeah. No, I've probably been over there a couple of times. Not lately, though. How about the coffee shop on the corner of Gramercy and Marengo? You ever been in there? Not that I remember, no. Well, a waitress in that coffee shop and the cashier, too. They say they've got a pretty regular customer. He fits your description exactly. You sure you've never been in there? Well, I'm not positive. I wouldn't swear I've never been in the place. What's the difference, anyway? Well, how about that service station across the street from the coffee shop? You ever park your car there? They ever do any work on it for you? Oh, say, I bet I know the place you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I've been there quite a few times. Good station. They've done some good jobs in the car for me. I remember it now. Well, then I guess you remember the coffee shop. Crane? Yeah, I think I do now. Right across the street from the station, that is? Yeah, that's right. Well, what do you want to know about it? When's the last time you were in there, Crane? Well, tell you the truth, I couldn't be sure. Well, we talked to a waitress in there yesterday. She said you were in that morning for breakfast. Do you remember that? He's way off the track on that one, I can tell you that. I wasn't near the place yesterday morning. Well, the cashier remembers you, too. She says you were in. How about it, Crane? Look, what difference does it make? What's this thing all about, anyway? You want to take another look at this picture? Well, I told you once, I don't know the woman. I never saw her before in my life. Why don't you give it some thought? Huh? I said, why don't you give it some thought? You remembered East Wilshire. You remembered the service station. You finally remembered the coffee shop. Maybe you can remember her if you I try. I tell you, I don't know her. I never saw her in my... Look, let's go in the shed where we can hear each other, huh? All right. Yeah, that's a little better, huh? Um, the waitress in the place says you were in there quite a few times with a woman. You usually came in for breakfast. You stopped going there about two weeks ago. I don't know her. What's the matter, Crane? You figure you got something to hide? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know her. What do you figure she's got to do with me, anyway? We checked her apartment, mister. We found a letter she was writing to you. You about ready to tell us? What's a letter? That doesn't mean anything. Can't prove anything about a letter. What are you thinking, anyway? We think you're lying, Crane. We think you got a reason for it. What do you say? Doesn't prove anything. Maybe I knew her, and that doesn't mean anything at all. We think it does. Yeah? We think you killed her. That the way it looks to you? That's the way it looks. I don't think you can prove it. We're going to try. Now, how about it? Will it go any easier for me if I admit it? That's not up to us. I don't know why I did it. What am I going to give for a reason? I don't know why I killed her. I wouldn't know, Crane. Didn't really have any reason. That sounds funny, doesn't it? No reason at all. I just killed her. What am I going to tell them? If I don't have a reason, how can I ask them to let me off easy? How can I ask them? I don't know, but they'll have an answer. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 8th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 92, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. George Martin Crane was tried and convicted in Superior Court of murder in the first degree. He is now serving a life term in the state penitentiary. have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, Counter Spy fights international intrigue. Stay tuned to NBC. It's uh, 6.30 p.m., and I'm late getting into the police station. Well, frankly, no one will believe me, but I got stuck behind a freight train. I know. Hi, Al. Is Sergeant Perkins in the office? Yeah, he's in there, and that woman's back again. You mean that's yeah, the third time this week? 
She's in the office with him there now. Oh, okay. Oh, by the way, my name's Don Reed, a police recorder. They're going to join the detective unit tonight and follow them on their investigations. And while you listen, remember, the people you hear are not actors. This is it. This is real. This is what happens on the night watch. Night Watch, the actual on-the-scene report of your police force in action. There are no actors. There is no script. Every voice, every sound is authentic. The investigations are recorded as they actually occur. Night Watch, presented with the cooperation of the Police Department of Culver City, California, W.N. Hildebrand, Chief. We switch you now back to police headquarters and police recorder Don Reed. In that house. Yes, ma'am. Here in the detective bureau, Sergeant Perkins is taking a complaint from a gray-haired woman sitting across the desk. I'm familiar with this case in as much as she has filed several complaints before against the same boy and his family. As I recall, the juvenile bureau has never been able to find sufficient evidence to take any action up till now. Well, let's see what the difficulty is this time. Very few people in Culver City. But when we bought that house, from that day to this, if I hadn't been annoyed by this son of his now, who is a moron and uh, strikes me as being a creature of the, uh, some unusual juvenile depravity, he, he doesn't seem like a normal creature at all. And he has two teeth that stick out like a, a rabbit. And um, he does everything he can think of to annoy me jump up behind the hedge on the sidewalk when I'm in the front yard watering it and whoosh at me uh, and growl at me like a, an animal. And uh, I just drove out of the driveway now to get my daughter. And he sprang across the uh, uh, parking, which is 12 feet wide, and stuck his head in the window and, and shrilled at me in a, well, I, I tell you, I wasn't afraid of the boy, but but the, the shrill was so unexpected in the car there that you have simply got to send word that if his son bothers me once more, that you have instructed me, that is if you're allowed to, to swear out a warrant for his arrest. He's over the ages of seven years, and he is amenable to the law. And if he wants his son to grow up that way, he's got to grow up that way, the way he is, but not around me. I, I just can't take any more. And once I caught that boy committing a nuisance in my front yard, there's nothing as low as they are. I have given up voting. I didn't vote. I didn't vote these, these last six or seven times just because I don't want to come in contact. Well, I, I, it, it just gives me the cold shivers to go into that place at all. I haven't been in there since. That's over a year ago. That was uh, one. That was one time when he came in there in the yard, thinking uh, nobody was there, and he, uh, well, committed to play an ordinary nuisance. And I, I just can't take him. How long, with how long that ago boy. did this happen? Uh, huh? How long ago did this incident just happen? Just now. Just now. You came right up here. Yes, I came right up here. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll have Miss Pinkston in the juvenile bureau take your report, and they'll follow up and take the necessary action. He and can he, he can walk on the sidewalk because uh, the the parkings are practically dead. The way the city don't cut the weeds down, and I can't afford to spend ten dollars a month to a man to, to do it. The city should do it, and uh, I think they're mentally. Uh, there's something wrong. But you don't know this boy's uh, first name, do you? Uh, no, but the only boy no. they have. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk to him. And then if you have any more trouble with him, you let us know. I yeah? certainly will. This is the third time I've been up here about that boy. Oh, okay, well, we'll take care of it. Thank you for coming in. Well, thanks for trying to help me. I know how hard it is. Well, we'll do everything we can for we you. We have the best police department in Culver City or anywhere around here. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I want to know my husband to retire, please, Lieutenant, from New York City. Well, fine. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. Thank you. Well, two sides of every story. Let's go. We should have been in the field an hour ago. How come you were late? 
Uh, would you uh, believe me if I told you I got stuck behind a freight train? No. That's what I figured. suspects and we decided to roll over there incidentally four five nine suspects means burglars through the next signal and we'll be there up ahead a police unit has a car jammed into the curb red lights flashing we're sliding in behind Uniformed officers, Don Ellis coming over. Let's see what it's all about. We're going west on Washington. Saw these two fellows in back of the gas station. They took off. Their car was parked on the side street. They jumped the car. We made a U-turn and chased them to here. In the back end of their car is a car radio and an uh, air cleaner. And they said they stripped it off of a car down here. And uh, you admit, uh, one guy I met, another guy kept on insisting he bought it tonight for ten bucks. They also told us that they stripped some tires off of cars at the same location. They said they were abandoned, so they went ahead and took it. Which is the, which is the one that talks? The one on the left. He's, he's, he's just got back with his wife, and he's scared of getting in trouble. You don't know how much trouble he's in, but he's got enough burglary tools in that there thing. And I don't know what they've done to the gas station. We haven't had time to check the gas station again. But as soon as they saw us, they hit this car. They said they were in there getting water for the car, but yet the car sitting out in the street. It's, uh... Talk to this one fellow. Over to the patrol car. Two suspects in the back, guarded by Officer Chuck Sarlow. Big fellow, calm, handcuffed. Dark burden. What, uh, what were you doing back at the gas station? We just went in to get some water. For what? That's all for the, his car. In the back of the gas station? No, we just came around the back and we were coming out. In the car? Huh? Where was the car? The car was parked right alongside the street. We went to see if the hoses were in. You both of you went in? Why didn't yeah. you drive in? We just parked the car on the outside, that's all. Who's the car belong to? His. It's his? Yeah. Okay. Get back in the car. Second suspect. Medium build. Nervous. Handcuffed. Can I get some water? For what? My car. I uh, need water? Yeah. Where'd you get the radio? Off of the car. Or about? Down by Dirt Road. It was in a ditch. That area in the west end? That open stretch. How come you didn't drive your car in the gas station to get water? I don't know. Park it out in the street and then you walk back in to get the water? See if the pumps were open. Why didn't you pull it in the gas station? Probably because I've already made the corner. Let's see what he got in the car. In the back seat, new car radio, other parts, carburetors, spotlights, new tires. More tools in back and they'll pull back in, but you can see the cutters with the clippers. Oh, I've cut the wires on this radio. That cut off short. I wonder what they have in the trunk. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll uh, hold it up for you, Doc. What's, What's he got back here? Well, there's screwdrivers and a little pry bar, about three of this pry bar. I think you got a couple of good burglary suspects. Book them on burglary. 
Yeah. There was a gas station Sentinel on Worston Place was used with a quarter, a three quarter inch pry bar last night. Take this, keep this as evidence. In fact, book, book all your tools. I, I book them all on uh, suspicion of burglary. Book both these fellows. Okay. Do you want those clippers and the radio out too? Take the yeah, take the radio and, the, and those tools up in front. Now look at there's a tire wrench right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the one that comes with that car. That yeah. one right there is hot. Then. When you got. It. I think that's all you need out of here. Uh, in your report, put down the fact that the, the regular tire wrench is with in the back of the car, plus this one here, which looks new. No. That's a good one. It says Mother gave it to me. Well, that's nice. And we'll sack Mother up, too. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. About 3 o'clock, isn't it, we call? How's that about 3 o'clock? Yeah. Five two will uh, transport the two prisoners back to the station. Don? Yeah. Want to make a bet about this radiator? No, frankly. Look, that's what I figured. Full of water. Yeah, another chair over here. This is the interrogation room. Detective Bureau. Ellis and Sergeant Perkins are going to question suspect number one. Officer Chuck Sarlow bringing him in. Still calm. Unconcerned. Sit down, fellas. Where did you get the car radio? Out of a, uh, it was either a 50 or 51 Ford. It was on a side street, uh, dirt road, in a ditch. Toward the Redondo Beach area? Yeah. It was in the bean field. More or less. It looked like that car was parked there or just ran there. Abandoned. It was abandoned. 51 Ford? Mm-hmm. It was nosed and decked. Or, you, uh, and decked. or if that car would be hot. I don't know. Better go down and check it. Make sure that car is there because if I go down and find it, that car is not there. It's there. It's why. Did you take anything else out of that car? No. Where did you get the air filter? Oh, that was off this car. Excuse Same me. car? About How that. about the tires? No. Now, what about this crowbar you carry? That I carry in my toolbox. Why? Well, if, like, if there's a rusted nut on something, I can pry it off. Or to, to take away grease off of some fitting or something like that. That crowbar fits some of our burglars. You're in trouble. You've got no business being in a gas station that's closed at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that line about wanting water in your car, you'd driven the car in the gas station. You wouldn't have parked it down on the side street. You can cooperate or you don't have to cooperate. It doesn't make any difference to us. Oh, well. The deal is, start from the beginning. He wanted a Ford generator. This generator just went on in his car. And uh, so we went out looking for the generator. We saw this Ford parked down there. And uh, we needed a radio, too, so we stopped and got the radio. And we were looking for a generator. And went by the gas station, stopped, and took off again. And you guys caught us. What were you doing at the gas station? We looked at a Ford convertible. You lifted the hood on it? Mm-hmm. What'd you take off that? Not a darn thing. What were you going to take off? Generator. You didn't have a chance? Is that what it was? It wouldn't fit. Okay, take them on back. Bring the other fellow and move down. You are listening to Night Watch and following the activities of the detective unit on its tour of duty. The people and sounds you are hearing are real, and the investigations are recorded in the field as they actually occur. We'll bring you the final results of tonight's action at the conclusion of Night Watch. We switch you now back to headquarters where a burglary investigation is in progress and to police recorder Don Reed. Sit down, Suspect number two. 
Very nervous. Chewing on a cigar butt. How old are you? 22. Who do you live with? My wife. And son. How old is your son? About three. You know what you've been booked on? No. Suspicion of burglary, which is a felony. The, uh, are the tires and wheels in that car? No. Oh, on the car? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. The door was open. And it was in the day. One of the wheels, I think, was in the day. What's your wife going to say about this? Oh, murder. How well do you know this other fellow? About four months. Has he pulled any jobs? I don't know. I don't run around with him that much. I don't know, just as much money as it was him. How about the radio? Well, I saw it, and I said, no, I mean, we were looking in the car, and I saw a radio, and I said, I could use a radio, and that was my idea. Did you contact him to, about this getting a generator? No. It was, we were asleep already when he came to the house. What did he, what did he want when he came down? No, he just wanted to tell me about his girlfriend or something. I don't know. He said some guys were going to beat him up or something. He wanted me to go with him tomorrow. That was it today or then. That was this this morning early? Or yeah, morning? about 1.30, I guess. How right. about the car in the gas station? No. That was just one of them things, I guess. It was just, just the wrong, wrong better. The wrong time. Yeah. I guess so. wrong Not the price. wrong time, just should have done it, period. <laughs> it's too late now. We have every reason to believe that this friend of yours has committed several burglaries. Right now, you're stuck with him on it. He's got some tools in the car, and one of them's a pry bar, crowbar, that is identical to the to one that's been used on several burglaries. Both ends of it, the round end, like this pen, and the other end, the square blunt end. Twenty-five thousand. Uh, I don't know. Some of those were gas stations too. Now, we feel we have sufficient evidence to book him on burglary, and because you're with him in the back of a gas station, we think we have sufficient to book you too and to get a complaint on it from the district attorney, which is a felony charge. What did your wife say about you leaving tonight? Did she say anything? She was almost asleep. I said, honey, I'll be, I'm going off for a few minutes. She was half asleep. I said, I'll be right back. Looks like your wife's going to get the wrong end of this whole thing. Yeah, I know. We were going to take the kid out to the beach tomorrow, too. Ellis, uh... You want to take the key to his car and his money here down to his wife? While you're there, uh, check the car they stripped and get the license number and what other information you might need. We're going to book them both on suspicion of burglary. Yeah. Right. We're um, working in a uniform car now with Officer Don Ellis. It took us about, oh, 20 minutes to locate the car stripped by the two suspects. We're coming up beside it now. It's on a dirt road just off the highway. Convertible. Front wheel stuck in the ditch. A guy in it. A guy in it, yeah. Brief picture. Man stretched out on the front seat asleep. Radio's been torn out. Dashboard cut up. Three tires missing. Boy, this guy is really asleep in there. Come on, wake up, Paul. Waving that flashlight doesn't do any good. He opened his eyes. Did he? Hey! Hmm. Let's go. Let's wake it up now. Yeah. What do you say? Come on, sit up there, boy. This is a fine thing. <laughs> the guy sound asleep. He's got the car door locked on both sides. Let's open the door. Well, now he's stirring around. No, he isn't. He's turning over and going back to sleep. Now we're going somewhere. Yeah. 
Now, yeah, I'll move around the other side of the car. He's opened the latch on this side. Let's open the door on the other side. This one's all jammed in here. Get around to this side of the car now. Playing games here. Is this your car, Phil? Right. Huh? That's right. Your car. Is that all night? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I drove off last night, so I parked it in stuff tonight. You got your driver's license registration with you? Right. I had it run through last night. And somebody. I'll back out that side. You got your registration for the car? You? My girl. Your girl. Mm-hmm. I took a taxi and she called cat she went home. Mm-hmm. So I just came back here and sacked into Oh, uh, you want to take a look at your car and see if there's anything missing? Well, the radio's gone. Mm-hmm. We got the fellows that stole it. Oh, good for you. No kidding. No. No, uh, would you, uh... Make a report on it. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Other things. I don't know. How about your air cleaner? Well, I doubt if there's anything in there. Right. And right. you notice okay. the motor is blue, Don, the same color as that air cleaner was. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Did you paint that to yourself? Yeah, I put, in there, I put the new, it's a rebuilt motor, and you painted the whole thing in there. Yeah. Well, how'd you get mixed up in this ear hole? Oh, uh, last night, I come down here to the park, and I guess I turned before the street did, and oh, golly, we got a heck of a time, so... Got a mad time the rest of the night. <laughs> yeah, we did the rest of the night, all right. Meanwhile, you went out... These guys come along and start to strip yeah, their car. Yeah, that's right. So I didn't even know it. I, I didn't know a thing about it. I don't know where they came from. I got in the car and ready to go to sleep. And I looked around. Things were missing. Stuff all over. Oh. Well, this is a sort of an odd setup. This man's half asleep, so let me recap. He got his car stuck here a few hours ago and went down to the corner to get a taxi to take his girl home. He returned here to sleep till daylight. Meanwhile, our two suspects stripped his car. So that leaves one more detail. Notifying the wife of one of the suspects that her husband is in jail. It's getting very late now. Over in the east, the first light of dawn. Heading up to the suspect's house. Small bungalow. Modest. A couple of milk bottles on the step. Sign on the door. Absolutely no solicitors. Do not knock. Mm. Police department. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm so 
half asleep mixed up with anything. Um, I don't even know what to say. I've never had this before. I'm, I'm just so shaken up and so... They admit it to take a radio. People hold up stores. They hold up banks. They hold up... Uh, they go rob houses for for money. I, I don't know, a car radio. He'll serve time in jail yet for stealing a car radio. Oh, God. What you have just heard is real. Every voice, every sound, recorded just as it occurred on the Night Watch. And now we return you to police headquarters and Chief W.N. Hildebrand. Tonight we have heard another set of problems facing the police officer of today. In the first case of the woman filing a complaint may seem very unimportant to many people in the overall picture of police work. But to her personally, this represented a major problem in her life. And consequently, an investigation was conducted. However, no evidence was uncovered to warrant action of our Juvenile Bureau. The final investigation involving two men booked on suspicion of car burglary, they confessed their part in tonight's case and also of participating in another similar event of which they were found guilty, the maximum penalty being 1 to 15 years in the state prison. Night Watch is brought to the air through the cooperation of a great many people, including suspects themselves, because many of them realize their mistakes and are willing to allow their stories to be brought into the open in hopes of deterring some other person who may believe he can get away with it. If we can reach just a few of these people and bring home this message, then there is a meaning, a purpose to Night Watch. Thank you, Chief Hildebrand. You have just heard on-the-scene reports of your police force in action. Every voice, every sound has been real. Night Watch, brought to you through the cooperation of your police department of Culver City, California, is produced by Sterling Tracy and Jim Hadlock, with technical advice by Sergeant Ron Perkins, and is described in the field by police recorder Don Reed. <laughs> In the name of the law, we bring you another of the thrilling stories in this exciting series, taken from actual police case files. Our story begins on a pier in Los Angeles, California. Stand by, please. Back of the rail, please. Give the people a chance to get off. Can I take Julie on the boat, officer? His father's returning to China, and I want Sorry, to... Sorry, madam. You can't board and call the passengers to clear the custom. Hey, you! Stand back in the rail there. Stand in line until your baggage is there. Stand in line. Where do I go, officer? I must get to Los Angeles immediately. Let me have your baggage checked first, ma'am. Oh, the red tape. You have to go through here. <laughs> All right, next, please. This is my trunk, officer. It's open. All right. This is strange. May I see your passport, please? Why, certainly. Maria Wynn, Shanghai, China. Is anything wrong? Uh, I don't know, Miss Wynn, but I'll have to ask you to come along to the customs office. Is there a mistake on my passport? No. Your papers appear to be in order, but your trunk is constructed very oddly. I'll have to bring it in. Oh. Brogan. Brogan, bring this trunk into the office. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. And you come with me, please. All right. Sit it down right there, Brogan. Yes, sir. Now get Chief Powers, please. Uh, right, sir. Sit down, miss. We have to wait for Mr. Powers. Mr. Powers? Who is he? Head customs man of this. Oh, there he is now. Hello, Michael. Brogan said you wanted me. Yes. Uh, this is Miss Wendt, Chief. Here's her passport. How do you do? How do you do? It's about her trunk. In regular construction. All the drawers have corners cut off, and I thought you'd want to examine it yourself. Yes, yes. Mm. That's it? Yeah, that's it. Doesn't look unusual. Where'd you get this trunk, Miss Wendt? Where? In a shop in China, Shanghai. 
Is there anything the matter with it? I don't know yet. As soon as I get all these drawers out, I'll see. Well, I'll just reach in here and... Hmm. There is something there. Feel there, Michael. Huh? Yeah. Feels like some cloth tacked onto the back. Shall I pull it off? By all means. Gosh, Chief, look. Bags. Dozens of them. That's just right, Michael. Good heavens, what are those? I see. Those Miss Winter sacks of narcotics, so I don't know my business. Narcotics? Heroin. Worth a hundred thousand dollars if it's worth a penny. How did they get there? I, I can't imagine how it all... That's what we're going to find out, Miss Winter. And until we do, we'll have to... That is, you'll have to. Oh. She's fainted, Chief. Right. Get a doctor. Hurry. Right. Fooling you, is she, Doctor? No, no fear of that. Miss Wind is a very sick woman, and she knows it. Well, on your advice, I assigned her to a hotel instead of keeping her here in our house of detention. How long before she'll be well, Doctor? Well, I can't say. In her condition, well, there's no way of telling when she may be strong enough to leave. Is she strong enough to be questioned? She powers Miss Wind is very ill. She's emotionally upset. If you submit her to a rigid examination, she may faint again. Well, let's go into her room. I want to ask her a few questions. I don't advise it, Chief. Yes, yes, I know, but I've got to solve this smuggling. All right. This is her room, isn't it? Yeah, 921. The ones on either side, 923 and 919, are occupied by Inspectors Riley and Graham. You don't take any chances, do you? Not if we can help it. Come on. How is she? All right, I guess. She's been sleeping. No, I'm not asleep. Oh, Miss Wendt, you're awake. Feeling better? Yes, thank you. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if we may. I... I'll help you all I can. Miss Wentz, you told us earlier that you don't know where those sacks of heaven come from. Is that right? Yes. Are you here on business, Miss Wentz, or a pleasure? I was commissioned to bring a patient back to Shanghai. I'm a nurse at the Paula Hospital in China. What's his name? Who's name? A patient. Where does he live? It's a woman. Mrs. Enders is the name. I, I'm supposed to meet her in this hotel. Now, Michael, call the desk and get Mrs. Enders' room. I want to speak to her now. Okay. You, uh, Hello. bought your trunk abroad, didn't you? In China. You don't know how that batch of narcotics got in there? Absolutely not. Is Mrs. Ennis on the phone? No, Chief. She's not registered here. We have no reservation for her either. Hmm. That makes it a little more confusing, doesn't it? Confusing? What do you mean by that? You see, if you're an innocent dupe of the smuggling ring, we can't let you go until... Well, until we're convinced that you're innocent. But I am innocent, I tell you. I don't know anything about that, that contraband. I don't think you ought to continue, Chief. All right, Doctor. We're leaving now, Miss Wendt, but we'll be back later. Come on, Michael. And Miss Woodcock. Will you come here a moment, please? Certainly. I want to talk to you outside. What is it, Chief Powers? Riley and Graham are in adjoining rooms. If you have to leave the room for even a moment, be sure the door is locked and be sure you tell them that you're leaving. I can't make this woman out. Yet. She's guilty. She's a great actress. And well, I'm going to uncover the ring that she's working with if it's the last thing I do. Come on, Michael. Our work starts now. Where to, Chief? Headquarters. Uh, let's see those receipts again, Michael. <laughs> there, Chief. Hmm. Postal receipts made out to Maria Wendt. For letters from Shanghai mailed to... What is this name, anyhow? Let's see. Looks like... Raffle Holtz Brandstetter. Palace Hotel, Naples, Italy. Hmm. Huh. Where'd you say you found these? In a suitcase. Ever hear of this man, Brandstetter? No. No record either. I just checked that. Well, let's see how our friend Miss Wynn is feeling today. She ought to be able to tell us who he is and what she mailed to him. She ought to, but will she? Well, come on. We'll find that out. Find anything else in her baggage? Oh, just some paper that seemed pretty harmless. Oh, I say, Chief, I did learn something that may be interesting. What's that? Her father is European and her mother's Chinese. Hmm. She does look kind of oriental, doesn't she? Uh, she sure does. You know, I thought she was Chinese, but I couldn't figure out that name. Uh, there's the hotel. Oh, yeah. Going up. Going up. Here's 
the elevator is waiting. Oh, I'm sorry, I had a hip. I saw some doors in the lobby, Chief. Uh, nine, please. What did you see? Two Chinese women over at the desk. Oh, I heard one ask for Mrs. Andrews. Did she? Nine, twelve, please. Going up. We get off here, Chief. Right. Well, uh, tell me. Did she ask for Mrs. Enders? No, it was another name, but it sure sounded like Enders. Hmm. Had me frightened for a minute. I said I thought she said Enders. Wait a minute. Here's the room. 921. That's funny Woodcock doesn't answer. Maybe she forgot the signal. Not her. She's one of the best agents we have. Hmm. This is strange. I'll try it. No? It's locked, all right. Get out your skeleton key. Okay. All right. Here it is. Uh, Miss Woodcock? Oh, Miss Wynn? Say, what's going on here? Hey, somebody's in there, Chief. I hear the shower. Oh, that's why they don't hear me, I guess. Hey, Miss Woodcock! Woodcock! Miss Wynn! Open up there, will you? They must be deaf or something, Chief. Open that door, Michael. I don't care who's in there. Hey, jump with Jehoshaphat. She's gone. What? There's nobody here, Chief. Shower's running, but there's nobody here. Turn it off. Well, where did she get out of here? There are windows in the bathroom. That one there faces the court. Yeah, and what happened to Woodcock? I don't know, but I'm... Wait a minute. Here's some of the door. I'll be quiet. Chief Powers, what are you doing here? Never mind what I'm doing. Where were you? I, I, I just went down to the lobby to see my brother for a moment. Why? Is anything wrong? Where's Miss Wendt? Where is... Well, is she gone? Miss Woodcock, tell us the truth. Where is Miss Wendt? For goodness sake, Chief, I, I don't know, I tell you. I wasn't gone more than five minutes. Maybe Riley knows what happened. Did you tell him you were leaving? Of course I did. Get Riley here immediately, Michael. Yes, sir. You know what this means, don't you? I, I can't make it out, Chief Powers. How did she get away? I locked the door when I left. It was locked when I arrived, too. All right, here's Riley, Chief. What's up, Chief? Plenty. What were you doing next door? Sleeping? But, why, what's that? Sleep? I know. I was watching. You're there. a great help, Riley, both you and Woodcock. All you have to do is watch a sick woman, and what happens? She walks out on you. Right under your nose. What? Well, how in the world? Never is mind you? that stuff. Tell me. Did you know Woodcock was leaving? Sure, I did. About ten minutes ago to see her brother. Then what happened? Miss Wendt called him in and asked if she could take a shower. Uh, how did she know you were next door watching her? I, I don't know. I figured one of you told her. Well, I've seen dumb agents before, but you take the cake, Riley. She asked if she could take a shower. Well, I heard the water running. I figured you... You could... figured you figured you couldn't figure one and one. Come on, Michael. We're going back to the office. You, Riley, and you, Woodcock, get busy and see if you can find out what happened to this Wendt woman. Yes, sir. All right, Chief. Uh, Michael, call the office and have them send someone. Make it Kruger. I want to tail Riley and Woodcock. Taking no chances. When you're through, come back to headquarters and we'll get to work. I've got an idea. Yes, sir. Woman about so tall and Chinese looking leave this hotel? Mister, I ain't had a fair since the Chinese built the Great Wall. Did a young Chinese woman come through here? I can't tell you, ma'am. Thousands of chinks passed here. You said on your railroad tickets to a young woman? Millions of them. What'd she look like and where's she going? I don't know where she's heading, but she's part Chinese. Kind of refined, about five feet two, weighs about 160. How long have you been in front of this hotel? About half an hour, lady. Did you see a Chinese woman leave that hotel? No, lady, I didn't. Hurry, I haven't got all day. What do you ask you? I wanted to know if I saw some lady chink come out of that hotel. I told him I ain't had a bed. Hey, what's the idea running away that way? See that woman? Why not just run away? Yeah, what's your ask? I want to know if a Chinese gal came this way. Oh, thanks. Well, I've seen nuts in my day, but I never... Chinese woman. Pardon me, Mr. Bush. Have you seen a 
U.S. Los Angeles, one eight eight. You. How much longer do you think we'll have to wait, Cunningham? Yeah, not long. Well, I hope they get a line on him. If they do, will you advise a rest? No. I want him tailed until we pick up the trail of Maddie Wimp. Then we'll... Hey, wait, wait. There's the answer. Dallas Hotel. Report. Lawful Hope. Grand Center. Sail for United States. S.S. Elena. August 7th. What is it? Port of call, New York City. No other information at hand. End. Well, there you are, Chief. Looks like Branstetter is heading for New York right in your lap. Come on, we're flying to New York. Thanks, Cunningham. Yeah, not at all. And Michael? Yes, sir? Get Riley and Woodcock to come along. Make it snappy. I'll arrange for a plane. I'll pick you up in about ten minutes. You and I are going to board the Helena before she docks. You, Riley, and you, Woodcock, hang around the pier, mingle with the crowd, and look for Wint. Yes, sir. And if you spot her, don't let her take another shower. Hey, Chief, you ain't ever. Well, there it is, SS Helena. Well, uh, won't Branstead be surprised when he meets this reception committee? Yeah. All right, Captain. Pull up alongside of him, will you? Aye, sir. There she is, sir. Hold on now. Be careful. Oh, we can make it. There we are. Oh, Michael. Uh, right behind you, sir. Right. There we are. Yes, sir. Are you Chief Power? Yes, sir. And you are Captain Archley? Yes, sir. I received your message. Uh, right this way, sir. Does he know where... Uh... I don't think so. His uh, cabin is on this deck. Right there, sir. 31. Is he in there now? I believe so, sir. Thank you, Captain. Will you need any help? I don't think so. I think we can handle him all right. All right, sir. I'll go on deck. We're docking in a few minutes. Brian Stutter? Anybody in here? Here's someone, Michael. Draw your gun. I've got it ready. Open this door. Open this door, Brian Stutter. We'll break it down if you don't. Where's the captain? We'll get his key. He went up. Well, then we'll have to break this door in. Come okay. on. Okay. One, two, three. Come on, let's go. Look out there, Michael. I'm all right, Chief. I didn't... Wait a minute. Stay outside, please. Stay outside, all of you. Well, what do you think? Dead. Stone dead. Shot right through the head. Hmm, I wonder where he shot himself. He'll never tell us. And don't forget, innocent men don't kill themselves this way. Hey, you want me to search this room, Chief? No, not yet. We'll have the door guarded and stand by. It's Wendt we want now. She's ducking now, Chief. I wonder if Riley or Woodcock have had any luck. I hope so. And I'll bet they do, too. Well, the gang thanks down. Yeah. Hey, Chief. What, what is it? There. Look. Through that porthole. I don't see. Wait a minute. It's Maria Wendt there on the pier. You see Riley or Woodcock around? I can't make up. Crowd's moving around, so... Come on. Hey, you. Are you the steward? Yes, sir. Stand in front of this door. And don't let anyone enter until we return. Here's my badge, U.S. Customs Department. Come on, Mike. You behind me, Michael? Uh, keep going, keep going. I'm keeping my eye on her, Chief. Yes, she, was, she was standing over there, wasn't she? Uh, follow me, right there. What? She may say she's gone, Chief. She was standing right there by that pole. Slipped right through our fingers. That's the second time. She must have seen us come down the gangplank. She slipped away, which we could have had her. Hey, Chief, hey, we got a little surprise for you. Here's your friend. Wait. Where'd you find her? Oh, I spotted her the minute you got here. You got anything to say, Miss Wendt? What is there to say? Plenty before we're through with you. Come on. We're going to a nice, quiet place without showers where we can talk. Ah, oh, gee, gee, ain't you ever going? All right, Miss Wendt, sit down over there. Tell us, where'd you get that dough? I guess there's no use now. Absolutely none. Innocent women don't escape from custody. You might as well tell us everything, Miss Wendt. Sure, what's the difference? I'm sick, you know that. The doctors say I won't live another year. I'm sorry you're sick, Miss Wendt, but you will have yes, to... Yes, yes, I'm... I'll have to take the consequences just the same. 
Well, I don't know how I got away with it as long as I did. You've been smuggling dope for a long time? <laughs> a long time, sure, years. I thought I'd never be caught till I met you. Where'd you get that heroin? In Shanghai. It was stolen from a hospital. Which one? What difference does it make? Which hospital, Miss Went? Holland Hospital. Got that, Michael? Mm, yeah, right, Chief. Miss Went, how did you escape from that hotel? <laughs> that, that was easy. I turned on the shower, then I phoned a friend in the hotel who came up and opened my door. That was all. Yeah, well, who was your friend? A Chinese woman that I did, met. Did you stop at the desk on your way out? <laughs> sure, for a moment I thought I'd die. You didn't recognize me in those funny clothes, did you? Oh, so, so that, that was you, huh? Uh, Miss Went, who stole the narcotics from the Fulham Hospital? I don't know. I received my instructions from someone. Who? Some man. Ramstetter? Yes, how did you know? Hmm. But you won't receive any more instructions from him. You you arrested him. Better than that. He's dead. He's dead? You killed him. No, he shot himself. He, he shot himself. He's dead. I won't ever see him again. Oh, no, you killed him. You killed him. U.S. versus Mario Wynn. Remember that case? Remember it? How can I ever forget it? You know, Chief, she was lucky to be deported. Lucky? I don't know about that. She won't live another year. What difference does it make where she's buried? Yeah, I guess you're right. Remember how she passed out when you told her Brant that he killed himself? Why not? Didn't she admit later she was going to marry him? Hmm. She certainly was head over heels in love with him. Yeah, but that sure was a big price to pay for love, all right. Yeah? That love affair with a little smuggling on the side cost two lives, maybe a third. Brian Stedder and the superintendent of that Shanghai hospital killed themselves when they knew they were caught. Now, a shipboard beauty who almost got away with it is probably dead by now. Three lives for smuggling dope. <laughs> Gee. Gives me the shivers to even think of it. Uh, like a cold shower, eh, Chief? <laughs> 